Good morning, everyone. It is 10, 11 a.m. And I'd like to call this September 14th, 2021 meeting of the Harris County Commissioner's Court to order. Commissioner Cagle. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, we were gonna have uh, Officer John Goodman give our invocation this morning, who is a first responder and a chaplain. Um, but uh, we've had some technical difficulties getting him today um, on the line. However, we are also doing a resolution today for the High Holy Days, and Rabbi uh, Brian Strauss with Beth Shishurin was going to receive uh, our resolution, and uh, he is online, and he has agreed to go ahead and, and, and open our invocation. I, I have here, he won't be able to see it because he's not online, but I do have here a, a shofar. Uh, I've been asked not to blow it because they don't trust my skills and probably rightfully so, in honor of the High Holy Days and of uh, our, our Rosh Hashanah, I do have my, uh, my shofar here at the, uh, at the horseshoe. Rabbi, are you on the line, sir? I am. I am. Good morning. Thank you so much for agreeing to do our invocation and, uh, and, and uh, doing uh, double duty today. Well, I'm honored to do it. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll start with some opening words. First, of, of gratitude to all of you for giving me this opportunity. And, and uh, most importantly, we pray, our Father in heaven, we pray this morning, of course, for all those who were harmed last the past evening, this last night from Hurricane Nicholas. We pray and hope that you are okay, that we thank God for our first responders and our city and county officials were able to prepare for this storm and to help all those who are needed this time. And we're thankful that this storm, as devastating as it may have been, wasn't as devastating as it could have been. And God, we ask you for further protection upon all of us, all those who serve you and all those who serve our community. We ask God to give us all peace, security, well-being, health, and continued safety and peace. For many, many years to come. And so say, Amen. 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 Thank you. And and Judge, the rabbi is to receive our proclamation, I mean our, our resolution number seven. And I don't know if since he's already online, if you want to take that out of order or if you want to have him hold for a few minutes until we get to resolution number seven. No, let's go and ahead and take the resolution, Commissioner Cable. Thank you, Your Honor. Rabbi, please stay on stay on the line. Um, sure. Whereas the shofar has been born for Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, and the beginning of the High Holy Days for the Jewish people as the world has now entered into the year 5782. Whereas the Jewish community in Harris County has played an active and significant role in developing, building, and beautifying our neighborhoods here in Southeast Texas. Whereas anti-Semitism has been increasing around the world and places a burden on our own community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Harris County Commissioner's Court hereby stands with our Jewish community in Harris County during the celebration of the Days of All. May it be a good and sweet year, Shana Tava, and is here ordered on this resolution be included on our minutes on this day. And Judge, uh, I move the resolution and the Welcome. rabbi is available to accept it. Thank you, Commissioner Cagle. We have a motion by Commissioner Cagle, second by Commissioner Garcia. Rabbi, would you like to add a few words? Yes, please. First of all, thank you. Thank you, and I'm honored to accept this resolution on behalf of the Jewish community of Houston. The Jewish community of Houston is a strong, growing, vibrant community who, like all communities here in this greater area, are always looking to do what we can to help those in need and to make our homes for all of us a better place to live. And as I remind everyone, our Rosh Hashanah, our New Year, takes us back all the way. We celebrate not the beginning of the Jewish people, but the creation of the world. And it's a reminder to Jews everywhere who gather in synagogues all over the Jewish world that as Jews, our first task is to celebrate God's creation, to help all of God's creatures and all human beings. And so it's quite an honor for me to accept this on behalf of the Jewish community of Houston as we as Jews celebrate a new year and hopefully a better year not only for us but for all people. And thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Shalom. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Shalom. Okay, so we have several other resolutions, but before we get to them, we need to take up the tax items. 
I'm told that um, that will allow Mr. Barry to get materials submitted on time if we start with that. So um, today, in accordance with state law, we need to establish a proposed tax rate for the Harris County General Fund, the Flood Control District, the Hospital District, and the Port of Houston. And we need to set a date for any public hearing that may be needed to uh, and a meeting to adopt the tax rates. As if as part of this process, we set a rate above the so-called no new revenue rate for any of the three entities I mentioned, the first three, Harris County General Fund Flood, Flood Control District or Hospital District, we will need to hold a public hearing to receive feedback from the community before adopting a tax rate. That'll allow us to ensure we're hearing from our residents about the resources we need. I know everyone received the materials in advance. I'll pass it on to Dave Barry to go over his proposals. Dave, are you on the line? We're having problems earlier. Yes, can you uh, can you hear me now? There, yes. There. Great, and um, thank you, Judge. Good morning, uh, uh, Commissioner's Court. If you wouldn't mind pulling up the short presentation I've prepared, uh, I'll just walk through that to get us started. Dave, is that the same one that you sent to us earlier? It is. The next page, please. So uh, I'll orient this for a moment. Uh, this commissioner's court sets uh, tax rates for four different entities, the county itself, the Harris County Flood Control District, the hospital district, and the Port of Houston. And we have an outside deadline to adopt rates of no later than October 15, 2021. And if we adopt any rate uh, above the no new revenue rate, and, and I believe we should, as I'll talk through in a moment, uh, setting rates is a three-step process. There's an initial vote today to propose rates, uh, then we'd need to schedule a subsequent public hearing and then a formal vote to adopt. Uh, our choices are not unlimited. The range of rates that Commissioner's Court can adopt is set by statute, and uh, we cannot exceed what's called the voter approval rate without a special election. So, and where we are right now, uh, uh, that is the, the, the maximum rate for each district that Commissioner's Court could adopt. On the other hand, if commissioner's court fails to adopt the rates, we would revert to what's called the no new revenue rates. And um, I think a very important point about this is that the no new revenue rates are actually not bringing in flat revenue to the county. They're bringing in substantially less revenue to the county. And I'll, I'll walk through that, that map. But that is a difference from uh, the old regime of taxation and uh, even from last year. In terms of our taxable value, um, the overall taxable value that we've received from the appraisal district is about 3% higher than last year's. Um, the great majority of that is from new, new construction. And I would also note that we are seeing an increased amount of litigation and values under dispute. So that may well end up offsetting most of this property appreciation. We've come to court today with a proposal for commissioner's court to consider. Um, we'll go through what it is for each district, but it would be an all-in rate of 58.585 cents for $100 of assessed value. Uh, that would be uh, a little over 2% reduction in the overall tax rate and be in the third year in a row we were able to reduce the rate. Next page, please. So th this is a breakdown of uh, the proposal we've submitted for your consideration. Uh, a few highlights, this reduces the overall tax rate from last year by 2.2%. If you look at um, applying this year's rate to the same property that was taxed last year, which is the way truth and taxation at least is supposed to work, uh, this proposal reduces the overall tax bill on existing property by $35 million. So not only with respect to existing property, is there a rate decrease? There's also an, a decrease in the overall levy and, and the bill. This proposal increases funding for the flood control maintenance, uh, uh, maintenance and operations to the statutory maximum. 
It covers the debt service for all the flood control projects that were approved in the 2018 bond election. Uh, we're proposing to keep the rate for the hospital district uh, the same as the prior year. And uh, this proposal would fund the fiscal year 22 budget that was uh, unanimously approved by court back in February 2021 uh, across all of the districts. Next page, please. This is a comparison of last year's rate uh, that was adopted to this year's proposed rate. So on the left-hand side here, we see how la uh, last year's rate was built up from all four taxing entities. And the changes are a decrease in the county rate, an increase in the flood control rate, and a very small uh, decrease in the Port of Houston rate for that uh, all-in total rate of 58.585%. Next picture. So now we look at the actual levy, not just the rate. And um, starting on the left-hand side, this is the 2020 levy. So this is the total taxable value times the all-in tax rate in Harris County across all four entities. And uh, what we see here is that um, that levy was 2.995 billion in 2020. Due through property appreciation on existing property, the levy would go up by 33 million. But due to the rate decrease we're proposing, uh, the levy would go down on that property by 68 million for a net $35 million decrease in uh, the tax bill for that, that same property. Uh, we do have some property added, which would generate $66 million of uh, additional uh, tax levy. And the total 2021 tax levy there on the right would be 3.026. Next slide, please. So what we have proposed to here is uh, uh, for the county between the no new revenue rate and the voter approval rate. We propose the voter approval rate for the flood control district. We proposed, proposed a rate to keep the hospital district rate the same, which again is between the no new revenue rate and the voter approval rate. We do not recommend going to the no new revenue rates for any of uh, the taxing entities. And uh, there are a number of reasons why. Number one, court can still reduce rates and the overall levy without going to the no new revenue rate. Uh, the no new revenue rates actually bring in a lot less revenue and, and uh, the reason why is that the calculation for those no new revenue rates make us take out of our uh, tax base everything under dispute, uh, which is uh, about 5% of the overall tax base. So when we talk about keeping revenue the same, it's with 5% less tax base. When we talk about increasing revenue over the no new revenue rate, it's with 5% less tax base. So th those words aren't really describing what's going on. And therefore, I think it's important both to look at the rates and the actual revenue. Third point here is that the no new revenue rates uh, aren't consistent with the budgets that court have, has adopted and would necessitate service cuts. Uh, for flood control, the no new revenue rate doesn't include the taxes to pay debt service on the 2018 voter approved uh, bond program. And then over time, uh, going to no new revenue rates uh, are going to be very, very difficult for the county, given what we see in terms of rising health and uh, pension expenses. So again, we're not proposing to increase rates. We're not proposing to increase the tax bill. We're proposing to uh, decrease the rates and decrease the tax bill on existing property. But we do not believe it's fiscally responsible to go to the no new revenue rates for any Next page. And, and this is actually going through the math of what the no new revenue rates are and, and what they're supposed to be, what they were prior to Senate Bill 2, is that uh, the no new revenue rate or the effective rate would keep revenue constant for a local government and allow them growth from new property. Uh, and that's what we've, we've put on the page here. 3.062 billion, 1,062 million would be that number. But when we actually apply the 80 some line calculation in the statute, pick out all the disputed value, what we see is that the no new revenue rates 
would uh, bring in 4% uh, less than the, the actual, you know, what at least I perceive as the intent of the bill. So again, this is just to say, you know, let's not be confused that the no new revenue rates are keeping revenue stable. They, they just, they just aren't. Next page, please. Here we see the no new revenue rates and their effect on the adopted budget. So uh, for the uh, county budget, we would be $20 million under. Um, there would be service reductions required, budget cuts required. Uh, we would have very little flexibility to deal with some of the issues we're seeing this year, some of which we'll talk about today in terms of the jail operations and other public safety investments. And we're setting a new baseline as we see health and pension costs uh, under inflationary pressure. For flood control, uh, going to the no new revenue rate, uh, it would be negative for our credit rating, negative for access to capital, because if we go issue large amounts of debt and don't uh, set the tax rates to pay for them, that uh, doesn't inspire confidence in our bondholders. And we would have the unfortunate choice of reducing uh, vital maintenance on our flood control system or uh, delaying capital projects. And for the hospital district, uh, we would be $37 million under the uh, approved budget and the new revenue rate. Um, this is setting a new baseline in years when we're, uh, we, we're gonna see tremendous need in the hospital system. And, and while there is some potential for this year to cover some of the shortfall with federal reimbursements, um, I think uh, going forward, uh, it, it is going to uh, be, be very difficult to um, be reducing uh, rates or revenue to our hospital district, given the, the needs of our population and also the needs for, for potential capital improvements in there. Next page, please. So in conclusion, uh, we have a proposal for commissioners for consideration. It reduces the tax rate. It reduces the overall levy on existing property. It increases funding to the maximum allowed by statute for flood control maintenance, covers the debt service for the flood control bond projects, holds the rate steady at the hospital district, and funds the uh, fiscal year 22 budget that court approved. And, um, I'm sure there'll be some discussions and, and questions, but um, to reiterate, uh, we, we think that the fiscally responsible thing to do here is to look at the actual revenue uh, provided by rates, look at what the rate's doing, rather than um, uh, go to whether intentionally or unintentionally to the no new revenue rates, which would be um, uh, a bad situation all around for every taxing entity. So I'll stop there, look forward to any questions or feedback. Commissioner Ellison. Judge, yeah, just thank you. But Dave, uh, for you and maybe the legal department wants to try this, I got about um, seven or uh, eight questions. Um, and uh, the first one is, uh, I'd just like to make sure everyone <clears throat> understands what happens if we vote to adopt rates today or whenever, and we don't have a, a quorum. Can you walk us through that? I can take that, and uh, I, I trust that the county is going to correct me if I get wrong. But sure. um, if uh, we vote to propose a rate today, and then uh, the rate's not up ultimately adopted, whether because there's not a quorum or four or otherwise, we would default to the no new revenue rate. Um, and that would mean the budget shortfalls and the consequences I walked through for each of the county, the flood control district, and the hospital. What is that total uh, reduction? Oh, yeah, that's right. The total reduction in value. The total versus the adopted budget? Correct. Get you the exact number here. So uh, $20 million for the county, $11 million for the flood control district, and $37 million for the hospital. So in total, that's $68 million. Say again, 29, 11, and 7? Uh, tw 20, 11, and 7. Okay. This is page 12 of the presentation, which is in the box I did more through. Okay. On, the, on the quorum matter, make sure we clear what is the quorum, whether it's you or uh, our legal department. It looks like Jay up there. Yeah, I, I'm here, uh, Commissioner. Um, yes, very simply, for to actually set the rate the quorum is requires that we require is four members of the court. Uh, so we, if, if only three members of the court are, are there, we cannot set 
um, a rate, and as, as Dave uh, pointed out, it, uh, it defaults to um, it, it defaults to the the, uh, the no new revenue rate. And just walk through the process again, Jay, on when we could do that. When we, we could we do it today? Is it two weeks? Go through the posting process so we all understand it. Yeah, no, you, we can do it at, at the next scheduled meeting or, or any any subsequent scheduled meeting. Um, what we want to do today is discuss the rate, and then at a subsequent meeting, I think we can do that. I, I, I can evaluate if you if, if there's an interest in the court. We did not anticipate voting on it today, but I can take a look and, and get back with you in, in the course of this meeting if we're going to. That's Just if people decide, to. you might let us know in, in the course of this meeting yeah. as a decision. And, and I'm going to interject, Jay. I think it's pertinent to the question Commissioner Ellis is asking. And, and again, I come out of a city experience where we set rates. How can you have a public hearing on the 21st if we don't identify a rate today? I understood today is to identify a rate. Mm -hmm. And then next meeting is to have a public hearing on the rate we've identified. And sure. then we, uh, we, we vote on the 28th. Is that right? That's that's customarily how we do it. I, I just want to be responsive to to the question that was asked by by Commissioner Ellis, which is whether we could do it. And and I'm I, I can evaluate that and tell you right now. You you are right, Commissioner Ramsey. That customarily we have the, the we've set the rate. You know, we have the discussion today, and we at a subsequent meeting we have a public hearing. That's customarily how it's done. And if I may interject on this very narrow point. The notice on 21 today was that we discuss to propose rates right. and it says rates to be adopted at subsequent meetings. So this notice doesn't give us room to actually adopt a proposed rate today. It, it, uh, that, that would be correct, Mr. Cagle. If, if, there's, if the notice doesn't give us that flexibility, then we, we can't do it. You are correct. And, that, and that'll go to the eighth point. I'll make at some point, I want to run through a series of questions and then maybe get a sense of where we are just so we know, so we're not guessing. So uh, I heard you talk about the no new revenue rate, and I can remember we used to call that the effective rate. I just want to have you walk through and make it clear, how is this different now under Senate Bill 2? No new revenue rate and effective rate. Um, I, Dave, do you want to take that? or? Yeah, uh, I, 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 let, let me take that in terms of the practical impact, and if you want to add anything, you can, Jay. Um, the... Uh, the calculation is much more complicated right now. It's gotten to the point that it's 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 actually very challenging to tie what the math we have to do back to the the, the intent, or at least what I believe is the intent of the statute. The biggest change, Commissioner Ellis and, and others, is that we have to take that disputed property value out of our baseline, right? So as we're talking about what is the no new revenue rate that keeps our revenue the the same, we're taking five nearly five percent of our tax base out. Uh, when we talk about the voter approval rate, which is presented as an increase, we're starting with a baseline that's 5% low. So, under the old rules, the effective rate would, in fact, more or less keep revenue constant for a local government. Under the current rules, particularly given what we're seeing now, it doesn't. Okay. What would happen to uh, our flood protection services if we go to the no new revenue rate for flood control. I, I, I spoke with uh, Director Black about this, and I think we would have the very unfortunate choice of cutting vital maintenance for projects or uh, removing uh, staff that's managing capital projects and uh, even postponing some of those projects. Is Alan on? Is there anything he wants to add? I just want to make sure that we get it laid out. Alan, if you if you own. Yes, sir. Uh, Commissioner, Judge, uh, this is Alan Black with uh, Flood Control. Um, you didn't see me grimacing a while ago when we were talking about potential uh, uh, reductions because, you know, just like the three-legged stool of managing a project, if you, you, you lower or shorten one leg, everything else has got to come down to balance out. And so, you know, talking about uh, deferring our maintenance, we're, we've, been, we've been, you know, trying to pick up on deferred maintenance for years now. Uh, so we'd have to reduce that. Uh, or we'd have to reduce our staff augmentation. And re our staff augmentation has been vital in helping us accelerate and move these bond program projects as fast as possible. If we have to reduce our staff augmentation, then the, the pace of those bond projects will slow down. Okay. Just a few more. What about county services, Mr. Berry, in general? 
what would we'd happen? Have a 20, we'd have a $20 million hole in the uh, approved budget. Uh, we would have to make cuts, including potentially staff cuts. Um, I think that would extend across different areas of county services. And we also would have very little flexibility to deal with things that are coming up throughout the course of the year. And I, I one I would in particular note is uh, our jail, which is right now at uh, full, uh, uh, full capacity. So it would be a combination of, of reductions in services and uh, a lot less flexibility to deal with with unbudgeted items going forward. I heard you make reference to a point we, we all know. Taxes fund a budget. Uh, when did we pass the budget? Just in case, you know, lots going on. Casey, when did we pass it? And uh, who voted against it? The, um, well, so each of these three, and the, the port doesn't have its budget approved by Commissioner's Court, but all three other entities do. And it was uh, approved back in February 2021, and uh, it was uh, all three budgets were passed unanimous. Look, from 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 my vantage point, I prefer that the rates stay the same. I think it would let us responsibly invest in our future to protect communities, do the things that we were all elected to do. We are the. Uh, this will be the third straight uh, year that we've had a, a a tax cut to the rate. In, in some form, that's something that's unprecedented, uh, had not happened before. Uh, but hey, I know this is a place where you have to compromise. Uh, and I'm willing to accept the tax cut that you all are proposing, uh, but we need to get some sense of where everybody is, to be honest with you. I think instead of guessing, you know, that was, you know, one thing that I prided myself on all the years I've been in politics, somebody may not like what I say, but I darn sure say it. I mean, usually there's no guessing on where I am on, on most issues. So I just like to hear from my colleagues, all of us, you know, the tables may reverse at some point and I could be on, on, the, uh, on the other side of the equation here. And I think it would be important to say if we're going to show up or not. So I just want to ask my colleagues kind of where are we so we can figure it out if that's appropriate. I don't want to put anybody behind the eight ball with us now or later in the day. Uh, the only time we can talk about it is here, not knowing who talks to who. I just opted not to call anybody uh, in case people uh, forget. Uh, but I just think that's important and would like to ask for folks to kind of lay their cards on the table. I mean, I, I've laid mine. My preference would be, and I would take the heat. I did it, Commissioner Garcia, when you first got here, I was going through this with my with my staff, I think you were saying maybe uh, slightly additional revenue for health, I think, in flooding. Hospital district. Hospital district. And I was saying, look, I prefer to, to do it all. I just want to put that on the record. And you, you, I was sitting there. I think I was sitting here closer to you, right? Yeah, you sit just like this, but a little closer. And you said, no, 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 no. And then I thought I could overhear the judge saying, if you're going to take the heat, you know, just go ahead. Uh, obviously, that did, did not work, but I laid my cards on the table, and I just think that's important, and I, and I would respectfully ask all my colleagues to just say where you are, if, you know, and then try to stick with it to get this beyond us. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Judge. Um, Mr. Berry, <clears throat> can you put up slide 14? What page is that? Because I can't see the slide. It, it's on. It's it's this one here. Okay. There you go. <clears throat> walk walk us through what this slide represents. Mr. Barry, is your microphone on me on unmuted? We lost it. I try your cell phone. So he's going to call in your voice. We can get some more hotspots around here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can call you as well, Dave, if you if that works. That's probably better for on our side. Yeah, I just don't know what would happen with the system. Let me see. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's better for you if you do. She's going to call you, uh, Dave. <laughs> hey, all right, we can hear you. I'll put you right here by the microphone. Okay, great. All right, Mr. Berry, can you uh, walk us through what this slide represents? Sure. Uh, this is uh, a history of the all in tax rate across the Harris County entities uh, for the taxable value. And so what you see here is from 2008 to 2018, the total tax rate remained the same. Now there was some back and forth between the, especially the uh, flood control tax rate and the hospital tax rate, but the overall rate remained the same. Uh, and that was during a period of time when there was uh, nearly $200 billion uh, added to the, to the uh, taxable value base. And then what you see on the right is that um, the last two years, 2019 and 2020, uh, Commissioner's Court has reduced rates. And uh, 2021, the rate is still TBD, but, but we are proposing uh, an additional rate reduction. Good deal. Thank you, uh, Mr. Berry. And, I, and, that's, um, and that's why I wanted to start with that. My, my series of questions, I got several as well. And I, wanted, I wanted to start with the fact that um, for... Um, for about a decade, uh, the tax rate remained unchanged, even though there was an increase uh, in revenue. And then for the last uh, two years, and I hope for a third, uh, my uh, effort will be to uh, prepare a vote for a third uh, overall uh, cut to the tax rate. The, uh, you know, this is <clears throat> also um, important because in spite of providing a tax rate cut over the last two years, uh, we've still been able to fund uh, and increase budgets for law enforcement at uh, 103 million, uh, 200,000 if that's uh, accurate, Mr. Berry. Uh, we've increased the DA's budget by nearly 13 million. Uh, we've added 15 million to public health and nearly doubled the budget for pollution control. So the tax rate that, uh, that we're proposing keeps up the same level of service uh, county residents expect. It's a smaller increase uh, than what we've seen. So we're gonna have to slow the growth of government, but that's a good thing. Let's look at what works and what kind of efficiencies we can find and generally in tight budget years uh, that is uh, that generally uh, moves to the front. And I don't know what, you know, as uh, to Commissioner Ellis's point, I don't know what uh, uh, everyone is thinking. I, I think we know what Mr. Ellis is thinking. So let's talk about what would happen if we did not move forward with, uh, with a tax rate. And so Mr. Barry and, uh, and Jay, th these will be, I think for each of you. And, um, uh, I, Mr. Ellis has, has already touched on this, but if we did attempt to set the tax rate and we lacked the quorum during the regular meetings to set a tax rate, and as a result, uh, rather as a result of failure to set a rate, the rate defaulted to what at the time was called the effective tax rate. At the time that the uh, default rate uh, resulted in a slight increase in the county's revenue, since then, the law has changed. Um, Jay, can you tell us uh, how the statutory changes since, uh, or what the statutory changes have been since 2019? And, uh, sure. and, um, and, and uh, will, the, uh, will the changes, how will the changes impact the failure to set the tax rate uh, this year? And then also along those same lines, since tax rates are set, on the revenue of the prior year, prior year, can you comment on how the total no new revenue uh, rate will impact the, the designated budget? And we've we've talked about that, uh, Mr. Barry, so you don't have to touch on that one. But Jay, uh, can you touch on the 
on the changes uh, to the law and the impacts? Sure, sure. On, on SB2, on the SB2 point um, that you asked, the, the real difference between effective tax rate under the old law and no new revenue rate under the uh, under the current law, uh, SB2, is, is essentially what Dave outlined, which is, at least as it relates to us, and it's this issue of how uh, properties in dispute are, are treated. Um, Harris County has a relatively robust number of properties in dispute, about 5%, I think, on the rolls. Dave, if that's, if that's, please let me know if I'm off on any of those numbers. And then effectively what that does is it reduces our ability to, uh, in the calculation of what is no new revenue. So when Dave, and, and I, when Dave says that the no new revenue rate for us uh, is actually not um, a no new revenue rate, that's really what he's referencing. And it's just, it's a, it's the nature of the way the law is written, um, Certainly, I'm not sure that it was the intent of the author to do that, but it's the that's the result of it. So it's it is a it's a difference in the effective rate. So if we um, to your other question, if you if we if we don't have a um, if we're not able to to adopt a rate other it, it, we can't maintain a quorum or, or or something along those lines, then it defaults to the no new revenue rate, which would trigger that that uh, that reduced number uh, that Dave mentioned. It has a cascading effect, right? Because in subsequent out years, that becomes the baseline number for the county. Um, and so it's calculated off of the previous year. So the same way that we, um, the revenue rate is sort of fixed. So it, it, it essentially allows a, creates sort of a ratcheting down effect um, in, terms, uh, in terms of the amount of revenue the county is able to generate. Um, and, and I think for the last question, Dave's probably in a better position than I am to answer. And, and yeah. One more point on the change in tax law. Another key difference is the treatment of debt service. So under the old truth in taxation, when, uh, for example, voters had approved bonds, the effective rate allowed taxes to be raised to pay the debt service on those bonds. Now the no new revenue rate that would result if we don't adopt another rate does not cover that debt service. So um, we would either default on our bonds, which we, we wouldn't do, or have to divert maintenance and operations revenue to cover that debt service. Uh, Dave, can you repeat that? I'm, I'm not sure I caught it. Sure. Um, we're comparing uh, the old effective rate <laughs> versus what's now the no new revenue rate. And this is... Honestly, probably a no new revenue rate to me is, is just confusing because that's not what it is. But the default rate, what happens if commissioner's court doesn't, doesn't adopt a new rate? Under the old rules, a county could still raise the taxes to pay debt service. Under the new rules, that doesn't automatically flow through. And where that hits home right now is in flood control because the voters approved $2.5 billion and we're putting that money to work. And we have to raise the taxes to pay those bondholders. But that doesn't automatically happen if we go to the no new rate. And so we'd be forced in a situation where we'd either default, which you know we I would keep from happening, we would keep from happening, but then we'd have to divert revenue from operations, right? Mm -hmm. To cover our capital projects, you know, which is not um, which is not uh, something I think would be a good idea and not what the voters intended. So that's another key difference in addition to the one that, that Jay, Jay mentioned. And Mr. Barry, we have given a lot of attention. Uh, uh, Commissioner Ellis touched on it. You just uh, made reference to it again to the flood bond uh, projects. But um, we also got 240 million in road bonds. Would there be any impact to those? And, Mr. Just to make sure. And this is the remaining voted uh, road bond that we just divided among the precincts Correct. maybe a month ago. Correct. Well, that, that hasn't been issued yet, but I think it's, uh, it, if the county can't set tax rates to pay debt service, we're going to have problems issuing road debt as well. Um, it would come home to roost this year on flood control, but um, it'll eventually come home to roost on road, road bonds as well. So that's one of the reasons I think it's vital to um, 
negotiate a rate that we can uh, get a quorum to vote for so that we can continue to issue uh, road debt as well as flood control debt. Good deal. Thank you. Yeah. I know we need a a uh, super quorum. Shall I, shall I call it that? Not, not a majority, but a, we need four people to set the rate. But how many people do we need if we got to make some decisions on what to do or not to do, what to cut, what to centralize? Is that three? Is that four? What is that? No, the, only, the only item that you need uh, four people for a quorum is, is actually setting the rate. Everything else requires only three. And I assume you all, if we get to that point where we've got to make cuts, you all will give us recommendations and wherever you can get the three votes, whether it's centralizing services, you know, we could pay for it out. Of, we, could, we could go to the commissioner's budget as well. We could take some of that road money, but we made a commitment to the voters. We obviously we're not going to default on those bonds. I think it's difficult to cancel projects, or is it? Some most flood control projects. I'm just going, what do we do? Figure it out. It's difficult to cancel them. So that means we'd have to reprogram money at somewhere else. Or we could delay some, I'm assuming. Those are the tools. There's there's no um, there's no easy solution. But you could take at least from my years in the legislature. I always thought it was not very, a very wise thing to do. If you couldn't make tough uh, decisions in terms of prioritizing, you just do across the board. Just go ahead and say everything cut by whatever the amount is, and you come up with the money. Okay. So so um, um, and I and I guess this would probably be for for Alan and uh, Mr. Barry, but, you know, um, if we did, if we, if we could not set the rate um, and, you know, going back to the flood bond project, um, is it accurate, Alan, that uh, the uh, M&O for flood control would be uh, hurt by approximately 10 million? So the, the exact amount I would have to defer to Dave, but that's what I'm aware of. And and again, you know, it would have to come from somewhere, which means we have to cut something. Uh, when you cut something, a service has to get cut as well. And just out of curiosity, in in the uh, uh, presumed aftermath of Tropical Storm Nicholas, are, is your office getting any calls uh, from citizens concerned about uh, making sure that there's that uh, the floodways and your system is working properly uh commissioner of course we are getting calls for requests for debris clearance it's already out there assessing um we don't expect there to be significant damages at this point uh but we're only in the very uh, early stages of, of our assessment and where does that money come from that when you have to send out folks to clear out debris uh, i know i get a ton of it in my district i call you quite a bit where do, what what pocket of money do you pull from uh, that that comes from our O and M, uh, and if we don't have enough, then we uh, we we ask OMB to see if there's opportunities through our auxiliary. But otherwise, uh, you know, absent a, a disaster declaration for public assistance, which we don't expect we'll get uh, right now, at least out of uh, out of this particular event. Um, but we got to pull it from other services in order to get the, the channels open. And um, will the inability to set uh a rate, is that going to impact our ability to build future flood mitigation uh, projects that could put uh, or keep homes in harm's way and or maybe put homes in harm's way? Well, certainly. So the, the, the funding we currently have allows us to keep the bond program moving forward at the pace that it is. Uh, any reduction on that will slow that down. Uh, but also any additional funds that were might originally be targeted towards the Flood Resilience Trust to build more projects after the bond program will be impacted as well. Thank you, Alan. If I might just briefly add on that. Um, Harris County, we have the top credit rating. We have an excellent reputation among bondholders. We regularly issue debt now with under 3% interest rate. Um, I think it's very important that we're viewed to someone when we issue bonds that means we approve the taxes to pay the debt service. And if we um, start to lose that reputation, I think it would be really, really problematic. And, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to add to, to, to what Dave, Dave's point. We've been advised by our bond council and 
um, I'm sure the the county's FA would have 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 an opinion on it as well that it would potentially impact our uh, our bond ratings and our ability to to service our debt um, if there is any sort of in, uh, uh, inability to to adequately pay back uh, or there's any sort of financial stress related to that. At least that's what we've been advised. Thank you. Uh, and that and that bond rating has always been something that we always cherish and respect, no matter whether it's for the county or for uh, Hectra. Those are bond ratings that that are always important to maintain at the best and highest possible levels. Um, Dave, if we if we fail to set the the rate, um, you know we got to plug holes. And having come from city council, where uh, Mayor White walked into a $150 million uh, gap. He, uh, he began to sell uh, some of some city assets. Uh, he, much to my chagrin, he um, took a lease from the, uh, from a nonprofit that was Long Allen Parkway. I'm trying to remember which is a nonprofit, but uh, I think it was for uh, for a nonprofit that served the uh, the uh, cogn cognitively challenged community and sold it to them. Uh, do you foresee that we will have to consider uh, some approaches like like that? that? That's a horrible way to budget because you're basically selling assets for a one-time revenue uh, uh, influx but there's no subsequent uh, revenue thereafter. You have to keep selling off assets if you can, if you go down that trend. Is that, is that a possibility? It's a possibility, but as you mentioned, it's a stopgap measure. It's not something we should get in the habit of doing. And um, Mr. Berry, um, we've enjoyed a great deal of flexibility in past years to respond to public safety concerns such as uh, the very uh, concerning increase in crime over the past year. We even, uh, even if we pass the recommended rate, we will have considerable less flexibility. Um, if we default to no, the no new rate, what will that uh, do to our flexibility that we will have? It, it would greatly diminish it. Uh, if we think about new programs, new investments to make, our ability to, to add anything mid-year would go to uh, would go negative. And uh, you know, we I, I was uh, I think it was at the last meeting when Director Robinson from Public Health was proposing a pandemic division. Um, the uh, I I pushed for the fact, and I'm hearing now the move variant. Um, that uh, that pandemics aren't going to be a thing of the past. And so um, if we, you know, right now we're, we're, we're getting a lot of things done because we got the COVID dollars, the federal dollars rather, that have been helping us deal with this pandemic. But um, uh, if, we, if we can't set the, the rate, what will that do to our ability to uh, provide uh, the level of service that we need to be having out of public health, for example. I think it would it would clearly negatively impact it. We'd be, be in a world of reducing what we can do rather than looking at smart ways to increase it. And so, um, again, Judge and, and my colleagues, <clears throat> you know, uh, slide 14 uh, indicates what this body has done the last two years. I want to stay on that track to per, uh, to uh, uh, move to uh, provide a um, a uh, overall uh, cut to the tax rate. Um, I think it's the responsible thing to do. People uh, are are struggling, but uh, look, my staff work through the night. Uh, they're clearing roads. They're clearing ditches. They're moving trees. That is government. Uh, working on behalf of its constituents, and um, that money comes from somewhere. And so, uh, generally speaking, when people see their government doing the things that they need them to do, 
they'll support it. And so, um, Judge, I, I, I have a motion to make. I, I don't know if you want me to make it at this point. Uh, sure, so we, we could have a motion on the table. Okay. Actually, I, I've got a series of motions. But the first motion is that I move to propose uh, the following ad valorem tax rates mm -hmm. with an overall re reduction uh, that uh, will be published for consideration at a future hearing in accordance with the tax code. First, for Harris County, the rate of 0 0.33500 for maintenance and operations and 0 .4, 0 0.04193 for debt service for, for a total tax rate of 0 0.37693. Secondly, for the Harris County Flood Control District, the rate of 0 0.02599 for maintenance and operations and 0 0.0, I'm sorry, 0 0.00750 for debt service for a total tax rate of 0 0.03349. Thirdly, for the Harris County Hospital District, uh, which by the way, Dr. Porsa has an immense challenge. He's losing staff. Ben Tobb and LBJ have been long neglected. And so, um, although I want to um, give him the full max that, uh, that he wants and, and needs, I think the responsible thing right now is for maintenance and operation, the rate of 0 0.16497 and 0 0.00174 for debt service for a total rate of 0 0.16671. Fourth, for the Port of Houston Authority of Harris County, uh, a debt service rate of 0 0.00872, and lastly, for all Harris County entities, a, a uh, total tax rate of 0 0.58585. And um, that would be my first motion, Judge. Uh, and you can. Uh, I've, got, I've got two other motions if, if you'll if you'll indulge me. My second motion is to direct budget management and the engineer's office to develop a potential contingency capital improvement plan that assumes significant loss in the county's ability to borrow. My third motion is, in the event that we cannot set a tax rate, <clears throat> we need all of our options on the table. I move to direct budget and management and real estate division to develop a list of county properties with a high market value that do not presently serve in functions related to justice and public safety with a focus on properties in areas of current high population growth or presentation on October 12th or determination of which properties will be placed on the market for sale. Those are my three motions. Commissioner, can you have the staff just pop an email sure. around so I can look at it? Sure. Right, right, wait. Just so you guys know, we're also going to have to add motions on the dates for the public hearing. So in theory, we would need a motion for a public hearing on September 21st, 2021 at 1 p.m. for discussion of the proposed rates for Harris County, the Harris County Flood Control District, Harris County Hospital District, and Port of Houston Authority of Harris County. So moved. And a needing to adopt rates for all taxing units on September 28th, 2021 at 10 a.m. So, so you add that to your motion? Commissioner Cable had comments and Commissioner Ramsey. Is this, it, okay, go ahead, Commissioner Cable. I have a uh, <clears throat> initial clarifying question to Jay. 
on the motions that were presented today uh, by thoughtful motions by my colleague. Because the notice on 21 says to discuss, and then it says with rates to be adopted at a subsequent meeting, is it your interpretation that we're allowed to adopt today? Because the notice says it's not going to be adopted today. No, I mean, you're not adopting it today. I mean, essentially what you're doing is you're having a, a discussion on rates that you want to support or don't want to support. Um, but you're, you're not adopting today. As far as the other motions that, uh, and just to be clear, that's that's an absolute, you cannot adopt it today. Uh, Commissioner Cagle is 100% correct on that. Um, that will have to be done at, at a subsequent meeting. Um, to, to, the, to the points related to directing the, the budget office and flood control and engineering, um, those are items that can simply be directed to them um, there's no issue there as far as because it's not actually asking them to do anything. It's asking them to 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 uh, present or at, at a subsequent meeting, which is appropriate. To be clear, though, I guess I, I want to make sure, Commissioner, if it's OK, we're not adopting and we cannot adopt rates right. today. But we are but we are and should propose the rates that we know are those are going to be the rates that the public hearing because someone brought up this point. Commissioner Ramsey, so we would propose the rates so that when folks come for the public hearing, they know what the proposal is. And those are the same rates that we would vote on the day of the of the adopted rates. So whatever we propose today, that is what's going to be on the table. And my understanding in times past is that we would have options that we would propose uh, three different rates. And so this could be one rate, another rate that could be on the table would be the no new revenue rate, and a third rate could be something else that another colleague may propose. Um, and that, and this is my my recollection. I could be uh, with about ninety percent certainty. I, I could, sure. I'm going to give that ten percent wiggle room that I my recollection could be wrong. Uh, Commissioner Ellis was here for some of those things, but it seemed like they had an option A, option B, option C, option D. And when we voted on it, we would vote on whichever option that we wanted to go through. But our public notices were with the four options uh, coming in. So, and, and, and so Commissioner uh, Cagle, if, if on that on that particular question, so the, the tax code 26061 requires the notice for the public hearing has to contain the proposed tax rate, a specific proposed tax rate, the no new revenue tax rate, and then the voter approval tax rate. And it has to be done in dollars and not just not just actual percentages. So um, these are the only rates that can be proposed for consideration. So those three. Now, as it relates to sort of option A, B, C, that would be you're asking about whether or not you can produce multiple proposed tax rates. Is that is that correct? Correct. In other words, if we had the Commissioner Garcia's rate, which is one very similar to what uh, was proposed by Mr. Barry, uh, similar, it's the same as was in the exhibit that was presented to us. And if there was a, another proposed compromised rate that may have been hammered out perhaps between now and our next meeting of Commissioner's Court, could both of those items end up being sufficient for notice or must we at some point say it's going to be one of those three the no new revenue the uh, uh the other one that's statutorily or the uh, uh the suggested by budget management yeah, words, can so we have four go ahead can we have four or must it be three well we, we must have whatever you we must have three by by law right you must by statute you must have the proposed your whatever rate you want to propose the no new revenue rate and the voter approval rate those three what you're really asking for is whether or not you, we can have multiple options for the proposed rate and um i will look right now and confirm my, my recollection is you can have multiple proposed rates at a minimum you must have those other three listed in the notice I think what you're asking is, can you take can you can you take separate votes on multiple proposed rates? Correct. Correct. 
because I believe that's what we have done previously. In fact, I remember Commissioner Raddick and I getting in a little bit of a disagreement sure, sure. once over. Now, now the, the thing to remember is that what, and here's where it becomes a gray area. You can only once you pass a proposed, once you pass a rate, any subsequent rates are 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 sort of immaterial. Um, so, if you want to notice for multiple ones, we, that may be possible, but it, you don't take an. I just want to be clear: you don't actually you take a vote on. on you all. must have a vote on. And I think that that's what we previously had done is, is that we would have four, you know, option A, B, C, D, four proposed rates that would come to court and we would vote on the four proposed rates that we noticed to the public. And so if we noticed the no new revenue and the other one that's required by statute, and if we had uh, a couple of proposed rates for you know, one of them being the uh, no, I, I, I understand what you're saying, uh, Commissioner Cagle, but I just want to be clear about Supreme bureaucrats proposed sure. rate. You know, I want to be clear about one thing. You could you once you vote on a rate and adopt the rate, any subsequent votes taken are, are well. You wouldn't take a subsequent vote. So as soon as you you vote on a rate, if you have four options, once you pick an option, you are not having votes on the other three options. Correct. But that would be after they were all noticed. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. On, on this point, on this point, uh, Tom, I just I want to ask to make sure I get it clear as well procedurally. I'm guessing, but I think what Commissioner Kegel is saying is, Commissioner Garcia has made a proposal, which I'm gonna glance at, but I'll probably second. It's the we won't vote for that. Huh? It's it's Dave. What he read is yeah. Dave. So it'll be Dave's proposal, Dave's and and. Uh, but I think Commissioner Cagle, where he's headed, if I recall from when this came up some time ago, uh, if we're putting cards on the table, clearly there have to be four, hopefully five people here. And in the spirit of full disclosure, if what I think you're asking is, uh, can you come in and can there be a series of proposals? And if you want to vote for something other than this one, you want to be able to vote for or against that first and then vote on this matter. Because if we vote on Commissioner Garcia's proposal, which, I, which I'm going to second, then you don't get a chance to vote to show you would have been for something alternative to that. And so what I'm trying to figure out is make sure that we got to have four people here. Hopefully it'll be five. So I'm just trying to get us to put our cards on the table. I put my cards out. I'll second his motion. My preference would be to have a little more money, but I'll compromise. I'll take a, I'll take three years tax cut in a row and go beat my chest collectively on it. Even if my preference would have been to address more needs out there, I can live with this. It's compromised, but I'll, I'll live with it, and I'm going to show up. So what I'm asking at some point today is for us to decide: Are we going to show up? And if you're saying, "Can you show up? Vote for something else." Question is by showing up when we vote on this one, does that constitute a quorum, Mr. Ayer? Do they have does does that do four people have to be in the room to vote for or against the proposal coming out of the county administrator's office? Are they just yes, have to, yeah, yes they do. Four four people okay. have to be in the room. Okay. I just want to make sure they am, am I hope I'm being helpful. So that means even if you want the option to vote for something else or against it first. I, for one, will concede you that point. But then four people have to be in the room to vote for or against this. It would take three to pass it, but four people have to be in the room. I hope I'm being helpful. I'm trying. You're, you're partially helpful, and it may be that there is a, a compromise between, and in my next questions will probably clarify a little bit more. Uh, there, there may be something that's a little bit uh, more taxpayer friendly than even the proposal that's been brought out by Mr. Barry. And I would like for us to explore that. And that may take a little, a little hammering uh, to do, which we may not be able to do just today. And I may need to do that hammering. You know, we, we each get, I call them the Barney five bullets. Uh, we each get one bullet to discuss an item with another member of court uh, 
for those of you too young to remember Mayberry RFD, Barney Fife was the sidekick. And, and the sheriff wouldn't let him have the, well, for one bullet for his gun because he didn't quite trust him uh, to, to use the gun. And so I, I call it a Barney Fife bullet. I get to talk to one member of court and then we're done. And then that person is also done because they can't then go talk to another member of court. And so well, I'm, not, I'm like Miss B. Was that her name? Yes. He just yeah, had to meet again to lay it out so we don't run that risk. I'm just trying to figure out. I'm a pretty great boy. Yeah. Whatever it is, we got we have to sort it out. And we may need to do a little bit more working and sorting before we're before I'm ready to make a commitment on anything. Um, and let me ask my next set of questions, if I may, Your Honor. Did you have a comment on this topic? Uh, I, yes, I have lots of comments, and I've been real quiet for a long time, so I'll continue to okay. roll up. Um, Mr. Berry, uh, slide 14 also shows that uh, the, the overall revenue that's come in. And so uh, two years ago, it was $505 billion. Last year, I think it was $519 billion, with the B. That was the overall revenue that then got parceled out to be spent amongst all of the differing entities that we have. Um, of that, um, and, I'm, and I know that our budgets for all of those entities are going to be slightly different from the revenues, but as a general rule, would it be fair to say that they're going to be close, that the revenues came were fairly close to the budgets? So, Commissioner Kibble, one, one clarification on that page 14, the $505 billion is actually the taxable value. So you'd multiply that by the rate to approximate the revenue. But um, it, yes, they're very, they're, they're, they're the main driver of the budgets. So it's about 75% of the general uh, fund budget. Um, and uh, the great majority of the uh, flood control budget, and then slightly less for the hospital district. And just so that it's crystal clear to everybody, what was our budget that we approved this year for the general fund and our budget that we approved this year for flood control. So that I'm going to address maintenance and operations revenue here, right? And, and I'll give you the uh, uh, assumption for tax revenue, the budget. Uh, this is this is just so you know, net of refund. So it's slightly different. There are a few adjustments between this and just multiplying the rate times the expense. Um, $1,625.8 million for the county, $117.0 million for flood control, $787.8 million for hospital district. And, and you could see that, for example, on page 12 or 13 of the document. Okay. Um, and so, if I understand, if we go with the um, – I have another question with regard to the budget. Pardon me. I'm still on question series one about the budget. Since our budget was approved in March, um, We've had a number of non-budgeted items that have been approved since that date. And I meant to give you a quick call earlier so you could be pulling those numbers up and you'd have them at your fingertips. My apologies for not doing that. Um, do you have offhand how much we have approved since our budget was approved that were non-budgeted items? What, I'll look up the exact number, but what I can tell you is we actually reserve 1% of our budget for budget items, things that come up during the course of the year. And I know we have not fully gone through that. I will get you the exact number here shortly. Okay. We, we have not exceeded it. So that's to say we have not committed more county general funds than were reflected in the budget. We've used that reserve for unbudgeted items. And so that would be 1% of... Uh... 1,628 million with regard to the general fund. And so we're talking, roughly speaking, um, 16 million? A little higher because we included all the general fund revenue. So about 20. 20 million? Okay. 
Now, with regard to if we go with the no new revenue rate, the flood control budget will be impacted by $11 million, and Commissioner Garcia put out a number earlier of $10 million. Um, does that include both categories, both debt service and the maintenance and operation, the $11 million impact? It's uh, it's 10.5 million, so you're both right. Um, and I'm just trying to make sure that I'm, I'm so it's 10.5, and, and that and would the be answer, the impact. Yes, it does. What would happen is we would effectively divert maintenance and operations revenue to cover the debt service, so we weren't in a position of defaulting on the debt service. Okay. And if we were... And that's 10.5 below the proposed uh, executive directors, whatever your formal title is. Uh, that's uh, that would be 10.5 less than what your proposed rate is, or is that 10.5 below? What's the 10.5 below what? So the budget. So so it's actually. Second. 10.5 million. So low, yeah. That's on the budget. That's right. 10.5 million versus the budget. Difference between, you know, our our recommendation to you, the um, no new revenue rate for flood control would be more like $18 million. $18 million. Okay. That was the delta I was trying to get at. and the no new revenue rate. Dave, say that again. I didn't have you on the mic. That was the difference between what? The, uh, the flood control rate in Commissioner Garcia's motion and the no new revenue rate. That difference is approximately $18 million for flood control. Okay. And to go to a statement made by Commissioner Ellis, is there anything that would prevent us from providing out of other fund sources, the 10.5 million that was budgeted out of say, some of these other programs that we have. On that topic, I think we'd have to identify the funding source. I mean, we have all sorts of restrictions on funds, so I, I wouldn't wanna generalize. If we identified the funding source, barring federal strings and other issues, uh, but unrestricted general funds, is there anything that would prevent us from reallocating 10.5 million from other sources of general fund to flood control? There's no impediment to that, barring a federal string, correct? I, I, I'll let Jay comment on a legal impediment. I mean, it would be a change in practice. We've endeavored for the, self con the flood control district to be self-funding, but, you know, could it be done if we want to change that practice? I, I, I'll, I'll let... Jay, see if he has some response there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's moving from from pre, a previously approved budget, so to from from one line item to another. So you certainly could do that, but it's effectively cutting another department um, or cutting budgets from another area to move over to to flood control. But as to Dave's point, flood control has historically been sort of self sufficient as a consequence, and so this would be um, a, cha a significant change in, in policy and practice for the court. Okay. It is, in fact, something you could do. My, my, and I, thank you. My third uh, question area deals with the... Commissioner, before you move on from the budget, can we have Dave mention what the, if it's it was $10 million less on the flood control budget, 10 what's 5. the, 10.5, what's the equivalent for the hospital district and the... Um, general fund, Dave. So, or like uh, for, for dollars, like Commissioner Ramsey said. That was you. you yeah. see, that's my mind. That was actually my next oh, series sorry. was to go to general fund on. Oh, on okay. That okay. Of okay. Well, I'll there. let it. I'll let it go. I thought you were moving on from the budget. Not, not completely. the The number that you gave that we would be under budget for general fund would be roughly twenty million. Correct. And uh, 
and my colleague to the left here corrected me and said 20.2. Hmm. So it's 20.2 more accurate than 20? 20? 20.2 is, is more precise than 20. More precise. That's the better term. Um, and that, what percentage of the budget would 20.2 be? That would be less than 1% of the budget, presumably, since we were talking earlier about the overall budget that we have about 20 million that we've added that were non-budgeted since the budget was approved in March, and that was less than 1%. So this 20 would be less than 1% of the budget? It's, I think it's fair to say it's approximately 1%. 1% of the budget? And um, with regard to that, if we had a, a reduction of the general fund budget by 1% or less, when the discussion of the bonds came up related to the general fund budget, we don't have to, um, as Commissioner Ellis pointed out earlier, maybe in a direction that was more pointed towards me, but as a general idea of overall budgeting, we don't have to attack the bonds first. We can go to other areas of the budget and protect the bonds, correct? I, I'd say that's generally right. Okay. And that would apply also when we talk about flood control and the 10.5. Now, the 20.2 million under budget if we go with the no new revenue is different from your office's recommendation. And that is um, how much above the no new re revenue would your office's recommendation be with regard to the general uh, fund? Would it be 20 under budget? With no new revenue, how much above budget would we be with your proposal? Just over $2 million, $2.6 million. $2.6 million. And so... And that's intended in, in part due to the um, potential of litigation losses and not receiving all of the revenue. It's, it's just an estimate at this point. With probably more downside than upside. And then with regard to the next area, I want to ask basically the same questions with regard to the hospital district. And that is how much under budget will the hospital district be if we go with new net revenue? 36.8 is what I have here. And I'm, I'm irritating the engineer to my left because lawyers usually ask questions they already have the answers to in front of them. And I'm just asking the question instead of asking you to confirm. Um, and with the proposed revenue, that would actually be 4.6 million with your proposal above the budget for next year. Is that correct? Right. Did that make it easier for you, Commissioner Ramsey? He gets irritated with me asking the open-ended question without having the answer in it. Um, and so, in essence, the, the hospital district uh, with the proposal will be slightly up above last year's budget, or we will be above funding for their district last year. Now, my last comment. Mr. Cagle, sorry to interject, but just one clarification. This is actually this year's budget. This, just so I'm we're sorry. Right. Yeah, this, this year's budget. My last, um, my last series is going to be on perspective, and that is that we we when we do budget hearings and when we do the tax rate hearings, we need to be very very careful um, as the tax spenders that we make sure that we don't keep just the tax spender mindset, but that we keep the mindset of the tax 
payer and the tax payers right now are going through a rough season in their lives coming out of the pandemic um, with the economy in some areas seeming to bounce back, but many businesses are still struggling. Uh, many businesses are hanging on by a, by a thread. And I think that it's very, very important that when we focus on what is going on, that we don't forget the tax payers that are involved. Um, I'm not going to answer the question of Commissioner Ellis just yet as to where I'm going to be uh, on a particular date that may be set in the future. I think that there may be something out there that says that if I announce too soon what I'm going to do, the judge could issue a subpoena from a sheriff and have me picked up and hauled in here. Great. Okay. Good move, idea. I'll move on to that item. <laughs> And so I'm not saying, um, but but I would say um, that I do believe that the, the taxpayers, especially in Precinct 4, would be fully supportive of us providing flood control with the maximum uh, that is allowable under the law in terms of going forward with flood control. But I think that they expect us uh, as those who are spending their tax dollars to make some of the same hard decisions and uh, business decisions as they are making in their own homes, uh, in their own family budgets, and in their own business budgets along the way. And uh, I, will, I will say that I think that there is room for a potential agreement to occur, but I will not be seconding or voting for at this time the budget uh, budget directors, executive directors, whatever it is that you are, uh, Mr. Berry, with all respects, uh, the proposal at this time. Commissioner Ramsey. Thank you, Judge. Uh, I appreciate the the input up to this point. Uh, I think we've been challenged. Uh, I think somebody, I think Mr. Ellis used the word compromise. You know, I, I come to every meeting with that hope. Very rarely have I seen it in action up to this point. Usually it's, uh, it's time to vote, three, two, move on. So some comments I would have, much as uh, Commissioner Cagle was going down the road of expenses, um, I'm going to start with a, a summary of what I would consider wasteful spending. And since we are not allowed to do a line item veto of a budget, <laughs> when they put a budget on there, you have to vote for a budget. So that's, that's part of some conversation we'll have going forward on the budget. But when I think about the monies that we've spent, whether it's on election administrator, whether it's suing textile, whether it's PFM and their uh, faulty reports, Boston Consulting Group, uh, County Administrator, with all due respect, David, I-45 uh, suit, as we said, the economic equity. Uh, do we need that? Of course we do. Do we need it as big as it is? Maybe not. Uh, public health, doing law enforcement, 44 something positions, office of sustainability, the list goes on and on and on and on. And when I look at what could be done, and I think, you know, if, if, uh, if we were to adopt the no new revenue on the general Harris County rate, that would be as, um, Mr. Cagle has gone through much effort to describe. That's 20.2 million. And then the hospital district, were we to adopt the no new revenue there, that would be 36.8 million. And then were we to adopt the rate recommended, which is I think the max on flood control, that's a $7 million to the plus. So you net all that up, 20.2, 36.8, seven plus, then you're gonna end up with roughly 50 million. 
So we're dealing with 50 million. What I've just described here in terms of things that have been brought here that I didn't necessarily agree with, and, and I'm calling wasteful spending. Y'all would, of course, call it something different. But it's a perspective of we are having a budget challenge because of wasteful spending, not because of tax rate. So when we adopt a tax rate, then it should be in the context of certainly uh, what we do. Because many times when I, I sat here through many meetings and a new idea is proposed. Now, if, if it comes from certain folks, well, that's a great idea. And there's always the conversation, well, Mr. Barry, do we have enough money in the, in the, in the budget to cover it? And the answer is always, no problem. Well, now's when we get to talk about, well, it might be a problem. The framing of this conversation that we've somehow uh, gotten ourselves here because we have been very frugal, I don't know that I would necessarily call us that. And then I took a look at the pick fund. Well, the pick fund last year, uh, as I understand, of un unallocated funds was $272 million. Today, it's $51 million. My glory. We are spending money uh, like we had it. So I'm glad everybody's now on a concern for, well, we got to figure out what to do. We we need to compromise. Well, I, I'm, I'm willing to work with anybody, but we got to do it more than once a year. It's got to be done in a sense of budget throughout the year, not just, not just on uh, budget time. So I think I've been pretty transparent in terms of no new revenue on the county side, no new revenue on a hospital district, the, the recommended rate that Mr. Berry put on the table for flood control. And again, uh, that's a $50 million impact. Now, I would tell you that uh, even here's a thought. Again, um, we'll try to bring good ideas to the table, whether anybody uh, chooses to do those. If, if, if we were to just simply replace lost revenue, in other words, we don't have to capture some of the art money, and we said we asked for that art money, replacing fees and other things, that's a big number. I suspect that's even 50 million. But it seems like we use the art money to go after and do different new programs rather than why don't we just pay our current bills? We lost revenue, whether it's whether it's fees or other things, can we use? Of course we can. But if we spend all our money on starting <laughs> programs without any sense of budget, then I think that's a problem. I think I've been pretty transparent. I find it interesting that a motion was made <laughs> and a motion was seconded before hearing from everybody. Sounds like it was pretty well already decided what we were going to uh, Gonna go for. I've been pretty clear on mine. And here's the other thing. <coughs> I, I come out of a municipal world having worked with 50 cities and 20 counties in the state of Texas. But most people have a public hearing on a specific rate. To have a public hearing on door number one, <coughs> door number two, door number three, door number four makes no sense at all. Unless there's certainty, <coughs> unless there's certainty coming out of the public hearing, that's going to be a problem. Got to have certainty. So at the public hearing, we're going to adopt a rate. We know what the rate is. And then we, uh, we, we have the vote, the official vote on the 28th. But there needs to be walking into the room on the 28th certainty of what exactly we're going to be voting for. 
let, let me jump in here um, with a couple of notes. Um, one question is the, the long-term implications, Dave, of this. And I'll say, Commissioner, my sense was, and see, last year <laughs> when we did this, Dave brought forth a thoughtful proposal, and it, the, that was the sense, it was a recommendation, it was well done. <laughs> it seemed like a compromise. That's where I was coming from as well. Looking at this was, it's not certainly the ideal for me, but my sense was he must have spoken with the various members of court and drawn this up based on it. So that's where I was coming from and figured this is what we were going to look at. Um, but Dave, did if if we go to no new revenue for two or or all three entities? We're talking about the, the $50 million here or $43 million. Is there more to that story in terms of the implications? And the reason I think there is more is because we're setting a baseline, right? It's not just this one time thing. Can you spell that out? Yes, Judge. Uh, the way Senate Bill 2 works is. Uh, the legislature has constrained the rates that commissioner's court can set, um, typically between the no new revenue rate and the voter approval rate. Those are calculated based on last year's rate with some adjustments that push the rates down quite a bit, which we've talked about. So I do have the concern of going to the no new revenue rate um, sets a lower baseline for every future year. And as I alluded to in my presentation, we are entering what appears to be an inflationary environment. How much time will tell. We have rising health costs and we have rising pension costs. So certainly this year's budget is a vital way to look at this and a vital frame. But I also have the concern that um, if we go from reducing the rate, which is what's on the table, to reducing the rate as much as we possibly can, we're setting ourselves on a path that is going to be extremely challenging, given all those pressures. We talked about um, <laughs> the taxpayers, right, and giving them some relief. If, if I look at this chart on page 14, it looks to me like taxpayers didn't have any relief in 2008, 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, all the way through 2019. The rate was the same. What am I missing? The financial crisis was in 2008 and 2009, which had repercussions greater than the ones we're facing today. And of course, the rescue package from the federal government, both under both administrations, have been much larger than what came down then. Am I missing something? Was there some relief provided by the court in the past that's not shown in this table? I'm not aware of anything, Judge. So this is, that's why I wonder, I mean, if you're saying that decreasing the revenue, decreasing the tax rate for the third year in a row, which is only the third time in 12 years that that's wasteful spending, then what is what happened between 2008 and 2018 when the tax rate was higher? Look, I think it's easy to, to it, everybody wins when you reduce taxes. It, it's, I mean, it's the best way to go. Everybody loves it. We get, you know, clapping and the public gets decreased tax burden. It's the easiest choice to make, but since the law passed, it's been very clear to me that we need to look at the long term. We can't put ourselves in the type of situation the city of Houston was in, which, by the way, started with the desire to say, look at me, you know, I cut, I cut taxes even more. Because over time, as the population grows and needs grow, when we cut the baseline, we're going to be leading to less revenue per capita and already we're short on services if we were on every service top of the line i understand the point 
but we know that we're woefully inadequate on things from pollution control to public health to, to so many issues. Um, we've seen it with the disasters. I mean, I, I learned during ITC, we didn't have monitoring capabilities. I learned with the, the water park situation with the, the children recently, there was inspections that could have been taking place that weren't taking place. You know, all of that takes revenue. All of that is proposals that the departments are going to have to bring back so we, we can deal with them. So I don't, I mean, if it were for me, I'd love to reduce taxes even more than we're already proposing. But the fact of the matter is this proposal is already a reduction beyond whatever was done before 2018 and it is it is responsible because i i think from what i hear from dave what you tried to balance was how much can we lower the taxes unpress in an unprecedented way while at the same time being responsible i'm afraid that anything lower than this is simply irresponsible by virtue of the long-term trajectory that our revenue will take. And I'm afraid that 10 years from now, whoever's sitting in this chair is gonna say, you know, that's when it all started. Um, just like now we look at the city of Houston and look at when their problems started. But look, to Commissioner Ramsey's point, this is something where we need for the buy-in of four members of court. And if the buy-in's not there, the buy-in's not there. You guys hold the cards. but. I very much am not doing this for any ideological or political reason because there's no winning to wanting to keep things slightly higher. I just think that this is a thoughtful, responsible proposal. Um, but, you know, I think that, that we're, we'll just have to figure out where everyone lands. Yeah, Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Mr. Berry, to, um, to Commissioner Ramsey's point about uh, the state of the PIC fund, um, is that money gone or is that uh, going to be reimbursed? Overall, it's going to be reimbursed. That's to say we we regularly monitor the pit funds with an estimate of FEMA reimbursements. Where we stand now is that with some discount on those reimbursements, we would replenish it to its original uh, value. We've been fortunate in that we've been able to use the contingency fund to cover uh, covid related Cost because it's reimbursed, and that allowed us to avoid having to use stimulus funds for it, which I think is uh, is the right thing to do. You'd hate to use money that can otherwise help people when you could get reimbursed by using. So that's been the main driver of the of the balance. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think the long discussion has been how the governor's been using it to uh, plug gaps in the state budget versus dispersing it um, in a helpful manner. So we're doing just the opposite uh, of that. We're, we're putting our risky dollars to work and we're using our contingency fund as we should. But it is a rainy day. We are using our rainy day fund. Um, in terms of the ARC uh, funds that uh, the Commissioner Ramsey also touched on, and maybe this is a better question for, for Jay, are those uh, really, uh, one, is, that, is it applicable if we intentionally reduce the tax rate uh, or or adopt the no new revenue rate? Um, and, and is that applicable to county government uh, that typically does not use sales tax? Yeah, I mean, so so the, the restriction on use for kind of general funding, and I think Dave can speak to this better, would, would be the only be applicable if you if you actually had a reduction in revenue as a result from your rate, right? So the city of Houston, for example, has been using ARPA money for, uh, for, for, for basic services because they've actually seen a reduction in their rate. So that's not been the case for us. Now, the ARPA dollars that are being used um, are exactly as the statute says, it's to help, at least from the county's purpose, through a specific series of programs that, uh, that that the county has administered to directly assist uh, Harris County residents uh, recover from um, from the various disasters that we have. So they're, they're really targeted towards programmatic responses. The city has done some of that, but they've also used their ARPA dollars 
as, as stop gaps to some of their to deal with their some of their revenue losses. We sure. really couldn't use it under those circumstances. Um, I'll let I'll let Dave respond. I think he may, maybe Leah he or Leah Barton may have a different or maybe quickly. Provide quickly my question was: I don't think it works for us. Hey, right. Dave, Jay, my question yeah. was related to fees already lost, not future fees. Fees we've already lost. Fees that you were shut down, couldn't collect uh, 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 permits. I don't know if it's toll road fee. They're just a, a large numbers of fees we've not been able or we've been been down. Uh, you're saying that is not covered under ARP? Judge, you're about to reclaim my time. Um, the the other question uh, also um, is that, uh, Mr. Barry, if you could put up slide 14 once again. I'll go back. Mr. Barry, there you go. Page 14. Okay, you know, uh, I've lived in Harris County all my life, and I venture to say that uh, we take uh, hits on a regular basis on whether it's the heat, whether it's rain, whether it's a hurricane, a tropical storm, or whether it's a down economy. And in 2008, 9, 10, 11, that was one of the most horrific financial phenomena that we faced. And yet this court at that time uh, chose not to lower the tax rate. They just kept it as it was and didn't change it. That was the year that we laid off deputies. Uh, really back then that was when uh, the commissioners of this court defunded police. Uh, but did not change the tax rate. Um, so I, I so I just want to be clear with where, you know, where the intention of this, at least where I'm at, I I, I think Commissioner Ellis is, is with me on this, but that's that's uh, where I'm at uh, with being responsible and and trying to keep, uh, as you say, Judge, a level of service at appropriate level for a growing. Uh, metropolis uh, like Harris County is we're 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 booming we want to grow more we need to do more precinct two has uh, the worst road conditions in all of Harris County and I need the revenue to fix those roads otherwise businesses won't come uh, residential development won't come businesses will leave uh, freight will get stuck uh, it will uh, adversely impact our entire economy and so, uh, but the only way to do that is to help put the people's money to work in the right way. Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner Ellis and then Commissioner Ramsey. So, Judge, uh, Commissioner Gorsuch, I've not seconded your motion yet, but, but, but I will. Thank I you. want to make sure it was what the uh, county administrator came up with. I spent a lot of time uh, talking to the county administrator. I made calls. He did brief me on it. I think it was thoughtful, as I stated earlier. I would prefer it would take the heat to keep the rates where they are. But I'll be more than happy to thump my chest on what will be a third in a row for a tax cut. But, you know, there's an old phrase. I, I kind of stole it. Somebody else had it. I was in the legislature. Somebody, I have an old Carl Parker back in the old days. Remember that name said, any idiot to pass a tax, a tax cut. So I, did, I, I had a big one. So I figured I'm that idiot. I passed it, and at the time, it was about the second largest one in the this history. This meeting is being of the state recorded. Governor Bush uh, was was in. I just started with a simple back to school sales tax holiday, but his bills couldn't get out of the house, so he he loaded them all in my bill, and that's why they ended up how they ended up passing. But the bill was the Ellis bill. I would take the heat if some people were going to throw me out of office by trying to do more to fund flood control, to help us make our port more competitive. At some point, even if we couldn't get the federal support to do it, I'm for deepening and widening. I'll take the heat on the general fund. I'll take the heat for Harris Health. 
even if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic, if we got the money from our friends with the federal government for the Affordable Health Care Act, it would be a tremendous windfall. But for political posturing, not at this court, I think this court in the past, at least unanimously advocated to the state to take the money. We got a big hole we're going to have to fill, even if we get the $750 million from the federal government. Look, everybody has bright ideas and they come to the table and they push them. We ended up doing a, a major uh, acquisition, uh, adding to the flood control projects out in Precinct 4. We're not a lot of money. I didn't like it. I held it up as long as I could. But when I saw it had the votes, I let it go. Commissioner Ramsey, the vegetation project, bright idea. That was not, that was not in the vetted through the process. It was an idea you had, you came up with, uh, and we did it. I understand the art of compromise. The only reason we have the MWBE program is because I was threatening to kill that $2.5 billion bond package. If we need to do a disparity study, which led to the program. Turned out I was right. Could have been wrong. I had no idea what the numbers would show, but they were pretty embarrassing in terms of, of what they show. The equity guidelines, which we fought up, but in the past, <clears throat> Those flood control projects here chase federal money. That means the wealthier parts of the community, even the ones that I represent, were the ones who got funded. We got to make up for the disparities that we have historically let exist. I do want to ask legal. Commissioner Cagle, you made some reference to some legal impediment. If you said where you are, thinking the judge could haul you in. Jay, any way anybody could be hauled in here? I only came today. I thought I was needed today. I would have come in virtually. I don't want to sit in this mask on. But any legal impediment, any power to judge or anybody has to compel somebody to come in here, if they say where they are, if they show their cards. I, I, I'm not aware of any, uh, Commissioner, but I can, I can certainly... I think it was a yes, but I just didn't know when, when you said it. I'm just trying to figure out Cactus, uh, one may not like me, but I'm pretty clear cut. I mean, you knew that if this, if that $2.5 billion, if they cut that down to a billion dollars, I was going to try to kill it because I knew on the cost benefit ratio, it would do nothing in particular for halls and greens. That's what helped me pull your predecessor. He was supportive. You made reference to the 10. You remember that? Say, didn't make the motion. I wish, you, I look back, I wish I'd made the motion for you. But so I'm saying, at some point, we just need to know where we are. And if we can't get there, it's okay. With my leverage, I'm going to make it clear on this board you want to do Ike Dyke. They're going to have a program for minority women-owned businesses. I'm going to try to kill it. They didn't put it in the law, but that's going to be the largest public works project in the history of Texas. People who've been left out are going to participate. And if not, I, for one, am going to do as much as I can to stir it up. I may not win, but I'm going to make the case, and I'm going to think I'm right when I do it. I just think we ought to lay out where we are, and if we can't get there, it's clear four of us got to be here when the proposal from the county administrator's office is voted on. If we don't get it, well, we're going to make cuts. And the, whatever, the, whatever the three votes are, to find out what we can cut, we'll do it. But look, it's easy to bump one's chest. Judge, I hope on your comment. Yeah, it's always good to give taxpayers relief. Then we got to come back and we can't fund the stuff they want. That's the other part you, you alluded to. Because everybody's happy. They'll just say, take it from somebody else's bucket. But just don't take it from mine. But look, nobody ever said we got to sit in these seats forever. Still be an interesting person, Tom. It'd be all right. Hatred, judge, actors, will still be all right. Probably have more time. So at some point, you just make tough decisions. Hey, I've had to vote uh, from time to time on issues that would make people angry, maybe take me out. That's all right. We'll be the end of the world. So I would, I've laid my cards on the table. Is there, is there any way, Jay, short of us laying it out? How much talking can we do? I don't want anybody to run afoul of open meetings. I think it's just better to lay it out. Well, we need to make a proposal, don't we? Yeah, I know so Commissioner Ramsey has, sure. a, has a note, but the, but the point is, 
There has to be a proposal today. Now, Jay would let us know if it's possible to make multiple proposals, but we do need to move move out of today with a proposal. And what I'm I hearing believe. is you got to have it. So if there's something else you all want, you got to say that so that's posted. And I'm just suggesting if what you want is to get your power flesh, to go vote for something else so you can say you did it. I get that. And then be in the room to vote for this proposal. That's all I'm suggesting. Maybe I just come from a different school, but in the legislature, sometimes I tell people, I'm going to vote against your deal, then you guys should vote you pass it. Or I'll say, put it on the consent calendar so we won't show that I voted for it. And that's all I'm asking. Okay, I, I, I talked real slow, so I don't know how much more clear I can be. Uh, I have said what I thought made sense. And, you know, it's not about thumping someone's chest on tax cut. This isn't, y'all, I've never, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about wasteful spending. And to use your phrase, Commissioner Ellis, you said any idiot can vote for a tax cut. Well, I think any idiot can vote for wasteful spending. And there's a lot of it going on. And right now, there's very little concern about the budget related to items, new ideas, uh, creative thinking, those sorts of things that are brought here. So I'm just trying to be uh, crystal clear on where I'm at. I think I have been, haven't I? That it's no new revenue on the Harris County rate, no new revenue on the hospital district. And the recommended rate, the day very recommended rate on plug control. That is 20 million, 50, 36 million, seven. It's a net 50 million uh, savings that I'm saying if we would just do a better job on wasteful spending, we'll more than, than make up for it. So that that was my comment. And on the fees, just to clarify. You know, in fire marshal inspectors, tow road, property sales, court fees, cl clerk revenues, parking fees, vehicle registration, all that's down. And I suspect, Jay, with all due respect, some of that's eligible for funding through uh, <coughs> through through the uh, feds. But anyway, that's just a thought. Yeah, Commissioner. Judge? Oh, yeah. Yes, uh, Judge, I just wanted to respond. Uh, the Commissioner Ramsey to your, to your question related to whether ARPA could be used. We did contact um, our, our uh, Leah Barton, who, who has up most of the issues related to it. And we also looked at the statute. So the ARPA, what you're referring to is the ARPA revenue loss provision um, issue. And that that only applies to general revenue from, from own sources. So it doesn't apply to losses between individual categories. So what that means is that we have to show a net loss of revenue. So it looks at our general revenue and as Dave sort of pointed out, our revenues have continued to, to, to be stable because of our, our taxing structure. And that's a contrast to the way, for example, the city of Houston operates. And so that's why it's that way. So the, 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 the shorter answer is, unfortunately, it doesn't look like we can, but you know, we're, we're, we're certainly, we'll, I'll defer to, to Dave's team if they can, they can figure out. And just to be clear, I know they've been working hard on trying to turn over every stone on ARPA reimbursements. Thanks for checking. Yeah, Commissioner Cagle. Judge, I need to break in just a minute, mm -hmm. but I'm going to throw my three questions out so the folks can be looking them up when we come back. Question number one is to Jay, under item 21, it says request for discussion to propose tax rates, Harris County Flood Control District, Hospital District, <laughs> Port of Houston Authority with rates to be adopted at a subsequent meeting. Are we allowed at this time to say this is going to be our proposed section? I'll let you look that up during our break. Number two, what is the maximum that we can increase flood control to that goes to Dave? And then uh, judge based upon what those two answers are. I had a I had a third question, but I'm distracted. I need that break really quick. I didn't understand your first question, Commissioner. Is that the one for the break? No, the, yeah, okay. All right. Okay, well, let's take a break till 12.20 p.m. It's 12.05. It is 
1225 and commissioner's court is back in session. And so we were talking about how we need to make a, a proposal, perhaps a couple. So one question is, Jay, can we make more than one proposal besides the voter approval rate and besides the uh, no new revenue rate? And and if so, um, it sounds like folks need to make some more sure. proposals. Yeah. Sure, sure. I, I, I just um, wanted to go back um, because, um, you know, I, I've always taken value in the in the uh, tax cuts that I've made. But I always go back to a book that I read uh, when I was first on council, and it's called The Price of Government. And um, and it basically just gives a, uh, through it all, basically sets a very, very fundamental uh, way of dispersing your revenue. You set your priorities, and then you fund your priorities. And... Um, if you want to add more priorities, well, you adjust some of the other ones or you find efficiencies. But, if it, but effectively, you deal with your, your, uh, your revenue. You look at your revenue as your principal um, uh, parameter for how you're going to set your budget. If we, if we adopt the no new revenue rate, it will change our parameter. It will change what our revenue stream is. And uh, we're already hearing from Mr. Barry that there will be real impacts to debt service, real impacts to maintenance and operations, um, real impacts to growing government. Uh, I mean, I've uh, every, you know, I got Constable Garcia out there talking about how he needs more deputies and Constable uh, Eagleton needs more deputies. The sheriff needs more detention officers, needs more deputies. Um, so there is, there is a cost uh, to dealing with self-imposed cuts. And, um, and so I, 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 I got to hear it from Mr. Barry again. Uh, Mr. Barry, uh oh, looks like you're trying to log back on. And while we're getting Mr. Barry set, I, Judge, I do want to speak to a comment that's made that's been made about uh, wasteful spending. And um, we can debate a lot of things. <clears throat> the county administrator. Uh, is a new structure. That one happened this year. Um, but over the last uh, almost three years now, we have funded law enforcement to a tune of $103 million. I don't think that's wasteful, wasteful spending. Um, Today, I continue to, to track my, uh, monitor my staff uh, in terms of how many structural flooding uh, has been reported in my precinct. Thankfully, to this point, none. Why? I think in large part because of a million two hundred thousand linear feet of drainage maintenance that I committed to at the very beginning of my administration, which has cost me approximately 40 some odd, almost $50 million, I think. That's not wasteful spending. Uh, we have given the DA more resources, not everything she's asked for, but we've given her more resources to tune of, what is it, $13 million. Public health. I walked into this office recognizing that people in precinct two have a much higher mortality rate than any other part of the county. I remember when Commissioner Cagle was, um, wasn't trying to be offensive, but it took, it made offense to me. He said, hey, move over to precinct four, you'll live longer. Well, 
that's not an option for a lot of people. And so public health is an important department. And so I'm proud that I was able to uh, put 15 million more through motions uh, during the budgeting uh, process. And we all worked on putting more money into staff augmentation so that we could do more infrastructure projects. That's not wasteful spending. Um, we have put more money into the courts to try to uh, break the log down, the back the backlog. That's not wasteful spending. Um, we've given hospital district a slight bump. Not everything that they're looking for, but they need it. Public hospitals in Harris County are in disrepair. Any money we put into that system is not wasteful spending. Hiring uh, employees throughout our bureaucracy to do the work that people are doing out on the streets right now is not wasteful spending. Uh, and so uh, I just wanted to say that over our three years, my three years, being here in county government, um, I've, just like Commissioner Ellis was talking about, I've, got, I've had to compromise on a lot of things. I haven't been able to uh, get everything I wanted. I think Commissioner Cagle in this past budget, you said um, something to the fact that there are things I don't like in this, I'm not getting everything I want, but I can vote for what's in this budget. And you voted in the affirmative of our budget. I don't think you're voting for wasteful spending. Um, so I just want to be real clear that when you throw out terms like that, uh, and if you want to point to a new system that we put in place, uh, look, prior to uh, us getting here, people didn't really know who their commissioner was, didn't really know what department to go to when they had problems. Uh, we have a lot of ground to make up to make county government work better for the citizens of Harris County. The county administrator is not wasteful spending. It's going to make this bureaucracy that I'll never forget your predecessor, Commissioner Kegel, took issue on a longtime uh, Chronicle reporter, but it mentioned his name in the in an article he wrote. And he took exception to it. And when he uh, and I met to G Hall, as he would say, his anger at me for hiring that individual had nothing to do more than because his name was in the Chronicle and he didn't want to see his name in the Chronicle. And so I venture to say that for decades, any government has liked to be unseen, heard by a few, um, but with most not knowing how to make it work, how to impact it, how to engage it. And so the county administrator's office will be bringing organizations together, make them more efficient, make them work better, and get more output for the citizens. Uh, that At least that's why I voted for that consolidation. And, uh, and so it's not really uh, another bureaucracy, it's consolidation of government, which I think most people on the other side of my aisle tend to vote for, tend to support, because it makes government work better. Uh, so I will uh, always take exception with the wasteful, the comment of wasteful uh, spending. I'll tell you this though, if we don't get the revenue that will help our government stay afloat, 
not maximize what could be within our reach, but at least keep us at a, at a place of operation and allow us to give the citizens uh, some relief. Um, then I want to see what cuts uh, that um, if if that if that occurs, what cuts in their own operations will be made and proposed as a symbol of of solidarity, as a symbol of commitment to what comes out of your mouth, to what you do by your vote. And so I I, I want to see uh, what will happen when less money comes in, how many motions will be made to cut operations, whether flood control and engineering, tow road, cut them by X percent uh, because the uh, revenue isn't important. Um, Mr. Barry, you back online yet? Oh, there you are. <laughs> you are online. So, Mr. Barry, um, again, I want to hear what will be the impact, but specifically on infrastructure. I mean, because that's a big, big part of our work here, especially those who cover significant parts of the unincorporated area, the county where we're the primary service delivery. What will be the impact of no new of a no new revenue rate uh, as it relates to flood bond projects, flood control, M and O, uh, and uh, any other bond projects uh, that are uh, moving? What do we expect the impact to be? Thank you, Commissioner. Um, there are a number of impacts. First, let's talk about uh, the bond rating and raising debt to fund infrastructure. So for flood control, we have issued debt approved by the voters to fund 2.5, ultimately to fund $2.5 billion of projects. If we go to the no new revenue rate, we are not raising the taxes to pay for that debt service. That's bad for our credit rating. It's bad for the confidence that bondholders have in us. And I'm concerned it would impact our ability to borrow going forward. For this year, the way we would avoid defaulting on that debt is diverting $10 million of revenue versus our budget that right now is paying staff to work on the capital projects and going to the maintenance of what we have, which I think, as we've had numerous discussions about, is under maintained. So there both is an effect on uh, our ability to raise debt and there's an effect on our ability to do projects and maintain them. Now, with respect to infrastructure more broadly, the no new revenue rate does not support the county's existing level of service. We discussed we have a $20 million shortfall. We would have to identify cuts, and I think infrastructure would have to be on the table. But as importantly, going forward, if Harris County just goes to the no new revenue rate every year, because we can, not because it means anything in particular, as we've talked about, it doesn't actually mean we're keeping revenue constant. The proposal that my office came forth with is pretty much keeping revenue constant. The no new revenue rate, it's a number, convoluted number set by statute. That does not support us issuing new bonds. It doesn't support us issuing new road bonds. It doesn't support us paying the debt service on those bonds. So I, I'm, I'm concerned about the 20 million. I'm also concerned about the precedent of just going to that number because we can is not going to support our infrastructure plans going forward. And Mr. Verity, thank you for that. Um, because that is a major, major part of our citizens' concerns in this county. And so let me ask you one more question. 
will these cuts have an impact or likely impact on our bond ratings, whether it be uh, flood control, um, any other uh, areas that we have as a county, as a whole, uh, the likely impacts of a, a negative impact to our bond ratings. And what if such a, a downgrade in our bond ratings were to happen, what does that do to our ability uh, to uh, you know, we're almost exhausting this 2.5 billion. You know, <laughs> citizens are not expecting less or expecting more. What is the likely, what's, what's the likely impact of a downgraded bond rating? Well, uh, first of all, I think it's certainly negative for the credit, credit rating. Whether this one incident would tip us into a downgrade or not, I, I can't say one way or the other. It would be a real concern. Uh, a lower credit rating means a higher cost to borrow which means with the same tax dollars, we can do less infrastructure. An even bigger concern in my mind though, is that uh, a bond is a promise to pay people back. And that is backed by the willingness of this body to pass the taxes to pay the debt back. And I'm concerned about a message that for whatever reason, we can't do that will actually limit us from doing the bond issuances we need to do at any price. It's already a disclosure. But the very issues we're talking about today in Senate Bill 2 is already a disclosure and a risk factor in our credit rating and our bond documents. And I don't want to make it worse. Thank you. So are we able to propose, we, we must make a proposal today. Jay, are we able to make more than one proposal? Judge, um, yeah, the sort, sort of the, to the two points, uh, the, the quick answer on the proposing multiple proposed rates is yes, you, you can. You can we, can. we can fully notice more than one proposed rates. I, I, I think to Commissioner Ramsey's point, I think if you did more than two, it might be, uh, it, I think it might confuse the public, but two, I think is not a, uh, not a problem. Um, in terms of the other question that Commissioner Cagle raised as to what sorts of actions can be taken today. Um, I think it's important to recognize that the, the notice requirement is really about allowing the public to understand that we are, that the court is gonna be discussing an item, is gonna be considering an item. Um, it, it doesn't prevent you guys from doing anything because we wanna be clear, you're not actually, uh, you're not actually proposing a rate. You're not actually fixing a specific rate for the public. But a vote allows the court administrator, the county administrator and budget office. It allows our office to properly notice the public. Um, so we certainly think it's important for you to uh, take some sort of affirmative steps to tell us and give us some guidance um, uh, to, to a and act accordingly. So you can take votes today to give um, us some indication as to what your directions are. Um, and that obviously would not be binding in terms of anything final. So we want to be clear about that. And you, you can suggest more than one proposed rate. Uh, we would notice them in the same way from a statutory perspective that's required. Um, and again, that, that gives the public adequate notice as to what the options are. Um, and, and you can move along accordingly. Yeah. That answers the, the Judge, might I, might I add something? And, and I might be saying the same thing, but, uh, the purpose of the vote today is to propose the rates that would be on the menu for the vote to adopt on the on which is now scheduled for the 28th. So it can't be unlimited options. Could be one. Jay's advising it could be two, but we would need direction to provide those notices and have the public hearing to get those on the menu so that you could actually vote for them. The, the second point, real quickly, just does it have to be done today? I mean, the answer is no, if there is, if more time is beneficial to the court, um, our hard deadline to adopt rates is October 15th. So certainly my hope in bringing a proposal forward is that it was a balanced proposal that could gather the support, not only to pass, but to ultimately be adopted. Um, if there's reason to do more work on that proposal, we don't have to move forward today. We do have to adopt a rate by October 15th and it takes a couple of weeks after we start the process to go do it. 
Yeah, Commissioner Ellison. Yeah, yeah, on this point, and I know Commissioner Kegel, you had your three questions earlier. Oh. But uh, just on this point, to understand the procedure, if Commissioner Kegel or anyone else at this table needs more time uh, and we're trying to stay on the schedule, I don't have a problem. I'm not available Thursday, but if we had to post, I'd come back Friday. But I do get it. Uh, Jay, I, I know what was the analogy earlier, to Andy Mayberry, RFD. Uh, Ms. B would say, you can give three or four options, even if they don't understand them, just try to explain them. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we come down to is, whatever the options are, we lay them out. But what I heard you say, four of us have to be in a room for any one of those four options to be what we end up utilizing. And if four of us are not in the room on the vote on a, on a particular option that has three votes, then under state law, we automatically go to the lowest number. Is that correct? Am I clear on that, Jay? That is correct, sir. Okay. I just So that's why I'm saying in terms of putting cards on the table, and if Somebody needs more time. I don't mind coming back. We'll have a little notice so we know people can can be here this week. I just I, I won't be available Thursday. But if it's Saturday, Sunday, Friday, whatever the notice requirements are, and I would say I would err on the side of trying to explain it. If that was a Garcia proposal, which is budget, which is the county administrator's proposal, if that was a Cago proposal, if that was a Ramsey proposal, and I will tell you. I'll be in the room to vote for or against every one of them. I will be in the room. Uh, Commissioner Ramsey had called you, but I know Commissioner Kegel had his questions and I forgot. Go ahead. What is the max that we can, pardon me, what is the max that we can provide for flood control? Uh, it's the same rate that was in Commissioner Garcia's motion and in the proposal. Okay. I just wanted to make sure because I know that sometimes the numbers can change. If you reduce in one area, you can increase in another. So that is the max, no matter what occurs with regard to flood control is what is in the proposal before the board. That's correct. The limits are set entity by entity. You can't move tax rate from one entity to another. Okay. <clears throat> I think I do need a little bit more time. I um, I'm fully comfortable with the proposed rate for flood control. I am not comfortable with uh, anything other than no new revenue for the general fund. However, there may be room for some compromise with regard to the debt components of the general fund in the hospital district. Um, I need to run that a little bit more and explore that because uh, that protects our bond rating. Those are obligations that we already have, but I am not in favor of any new increases in those areas. I'll just, I'll just put that out there. I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm ready to do that, but the county debt service is a 0.04193. Uh, the, and of course, the uh, fully supportive of everything with flood control. And then with the hospital debt service, it's the 0 .00174. Uh, the port is a self-limiting thing because we are backing the note for the port, um, which I too am in favor of widening and deepening the, the port, supporting them as they move forward for those projects that was mentioned by Commissioner Ellis earlier. Um, the uh, Port of Houston was never the best geological place for a port to be, but it was the best economic place for a port to be. And that's why we have been competitive. We need to stay that way. That's that aside that was tossed out there earlier. And so um, to that extent, um, I think I'd like a little extra time, but I am I'm, I'm not sure which one of you guys I'd like to spend my silver bullet with. My my uh, my Barney Five bullet with, but I think I'd like to visit with somebody. Commissioner Ramsey. Yeah, I I uh, I think I've been pretty clear at this point where I'm at. Uh, I'll, I'll repeat it. Uh, one, 
I'm for the uh, flood control, the rate that Mr. Perry has recommended, which covers our, our debt. Um, so the uh, 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 flood control rate of 0 0.03349, I think has been referenced. I'm good there. That's good. Can I interrupt for just a quick question? For a quick question. My, my apologies. Um, Jay, since it seems that we're all in agreement on the flood control, is there a way that we can actually notice the flood control on one day? I know that we had proposed that back when Commissioner Raddick was here, and that was shot down, not from the legal department, but just, just shot down. But is there a way that we could vote on flood control on one day and then come back on another day and vote on the areas where we may be in disagreement? Since there yeah, seems to be a consensus on the one tax rate. Sure, you could just require multiple meetings, and, and, and that's what the court wants. Normally, it's done at one because of the sort of ease of having or minimizing the number of meetings. But as you as you pointed out, we require um, you know, two additional ones, another public hearing, and then and then an actual vote. So, would it make sense if, and perhaps Dave, you could work with Commissioner Cable, and we could bring this back? What I mean, whatever it is that. But I don't know if I don't know if that's something that can be done today. I mean, I mean, maybe that we need to repost this item later in the week or later mm -hmm. in another court. Yeah, Commissioner Ramsey. I, I, what I would like to see is something uh, defined where there's certainty on what we're doing, and I think it provides clarity too to the public who may be trying to figure out uh, where we're where we're going and what we're having a public hearing on. So if we're having a public hearing on two rates or three rates or four rates, I just think that doesn't make any sense. And the other thing that doesn't make sense is showing up on the 28th with multiple guesses in terms of what might happen. I think we need to know what the rate, the public hearing rate is going to be on the 21st, a week from today. Uh, what is it that we are having a public hearing on? You can have any number you want. I just think there needs to be certainty. And I'll just say, personally, there needs to be certainty for me. If we're going to have a public hearing on a rate, then I want it on a rate. And then when we show up on the 28th, then we know what we're voting on. We voted on a rate that we had the public hearing on on the 21st. So there, I'm not into multiple options and us making five different proposals here today. Uh, if I'm, I'm for walking out of here today or Friday or whenever we walk out with a particular right, uh, tax rate that we're going to have a public hearing on and ultimately vote on on the 28th. It was clear as we, we, we need concrete proposals. There's one proposal on the table that we can vote on. There's an additional proposal that wants to be drawn, that the commissioner here wants to draw up. And so it, it's, it just doesn't, and, and then Commissioner Ramsey, you don't want more than one proposal. So you're probably going to end up voting when we vote on simply proposing, I'd assume you would vote no to proposing multiple proposals. I, I had a concrete proposal. I mean, I've got a concrete proposal. Okay, so, so we now have two concrete proposals and one that is sort of being hatched. So, so it, if we, if we're, if Commissioner Cagle, if, if you're able to, finish cooking your proposal today, we can vote on these three proposals at the end of the day and see what comes out. If not, at the end of today, we can decide whether we this whether we have this meeting again, um, we put this item again at the next court, or we work with our schedules and we post another meeting in order to discuss the tax rate. I don't think there's a big issue. I do want to ask one question. Commissioner Cagle brought up and his proposal that he's cooking separating the debt from the rest for the hospital district and the general fund. Can that be done? The debt service. I, I'm I'm not sure I understand the proposal well enough to comment. I'd, I'd be keen to explore. Uh, I will say this. If commissioner's court does not vote to propose rates today, and by propose, I mean put specific rates on the menu for the public hearing and the vote to adopt, we will have to push that schedule back, likely, due to right. these requirements. So, Judge, we, we have time until October 15th, but I did want to just make that clear. We should move on from this. So, Commissioner Cagle and Commissioner Ellison, I, we, we have a long agenda. Yeah, Commissioner. 
it's not a proposal yet. I'm just noticing that when we when we read it into the record as it's proposed on here, you do have the debt service already marked off. And so that's where I was kicking around those numbers, which are significantly less than the M and O portions. Yeah, Commissioner so, Suggestion. Uh, Commissioner Ramsey, what I'm trying to get to is uh, the reason I was suggesting options to vote on is that there is an option that Mr. Berry's office recommended. Mr. Garcia made that motion. I'll second it. I haven't yet did, but I will second it. If four members don't show up, we that there'll be no vote on that. So when I say put cards on the table, what I'm saying is I will show up to vote for or against any proposals that are there. And if it's confusing to the public, the law is confusing, but it's the law. I mean, that was a time when you had Commissioner Sylvia Garcia, Commissioner El Franco Lee, three R's. That cork in the law has been there for a long time. And if those two hadn't shown up, or it could have been a DNR that just didn't show up, under you, you would not have been able to adopt the rate. So I was just thinking like a legislator. There were times when uh, either I was on the winning side or the losing side. Folks in the majority would let people, well, you go make a proposal, we're going to shoot it down. You can say, you shot your shot. But under this law, four have to be here. So that's what I mean. You got me? So when I was when I was saying put cards on the table, will you be here to vote even if you don't get your side? But you got to have options. If not, if you're saying, I'm not going to show up unless it's my proposal. Well, then if we don't agree to vote to that, we go to the doomsday. We go to the lower scenario. Am I making sense? That's that's why I was suggesting. I was just trying to figure out a way to facilitate us being here to get it to get on down the road. And I was trying to be clear on on where I was on the rights. And I think I have that. So, so why don't we come back to this at the end of the day to see if you have a proposal, Commissioner Cagle, and if not, we can figure out when else. You know, if we can wait till the next quarter, or we'll just break with a promise that we'll we'll make our schedules work for later on in the week. Okay, so let's keep going through the resolutions. And th there will be no action for now on this item. So there is, uh, I have um, three resolutions to take out of order. I think it may be four since the officer, Commissioner Garcia, uh, Commissioner Cable wasn't able to join this morning. Uh, so the first one is item 363 on page 69, and it's a resolution to support the resettlement of Afghan refugees in Harris County. And it's um, a lot of uh, groups have reached out about this. Let me just read the resolution. After the collapse of the Af Afghanistan government takeover by the Taliban, Afghan citizens are fleeing their homeland and seeking a safe place to live. Whereas since 2001, Afghan civilians have worked alongside the United States and allied forces providing critical guidance, interpretation, intelligence, and other services in the war in Afghanistan. Whereas the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees has estimated that 400,000 Afghans have fled their homes this year. Harris County has a proud history of welcoming refugees, resettling more refugees than any other metropolitan area in the United States. And whereas immigrants and refugees make Harris County's community and economy stronger, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Harris County Commissioner's Court proudly supports the resettlement of refugees of the war in Afghanistan and hereby notifies the United States federal government that Harris County stands ready to welcome Afghan refugees and Afghan recipients of special immigrant visas. Be it further resolved that the Harris County Commissioner's Court calls upon its residents to join us in welcoming our Afghan allies to their new home. It is hereby, uh, and that, that's the end of the resolution. This reminds me of um, a, 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 an event that took place just before COVID at Catholic Charities. And when we were talking about um, the limitations on refugees, and there was just so many people from all political persuasions, all backgrounds, talking about the rich tradition in this community to welcome refugees um, and, and to have the opportunity to do that again. It's a, it's a tragic thing, 
that we have to be in, in, in this position that folks are seeking refuge, but it's an important role for us to play. So I've uh, received questions, questions from, from groups, and I thought it'd be important for us to take a position on this. I think there are folks on the line to speak. Is that right, uh, Tiffany or Lucinda? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Sharik Ghani. Go ahead, please. Okay, we must have lost that speaker. Let's move on to the next one. Sadef yeah. Patel. Go ahead, please. Um, good afternoon, Judge Hidalgo and commissioners. Uh, my name is Sadef Patel and I am um, a part of the Anissa Hope Center team. And I'd, I'd like to welcome, um, and I'm working with the new Afghan refugees arriving in Harris County. Um, I want to start off by saying how amazing Harris County is with the diversity and the multiculturalism that it has um, and the way that they have always welcomed new uh, immigrants, regardless of culture or religion. Um, with Harris County being the most diverse county in Texas and maybe throughout the U.S., it's urgent for us to work with these individuals and families to quickly assist them to blend into our society. At Anissa, what we're doing is we're providing essentials like kitchen, household items, hygiene items, cultural necessities to these families, prayer rugs, things like that, and allowing them to seek employment and get self-sufficient quickly. And we're trying to work with other resettlement agencies to do this. Um, we have worked with several groups of refugees in the past 12 years, and we realize that it's very important to settle them in quickly, and it's imperative um, to do that right away, so if we want them to achieve self-sufficiency. Um, Harris County is one of the best places for these refugees because we have an infrastructure in place here that allows this court sort of diversity and multiculturalism um, with the ESL classes and all of those things that we have available. Um, and we uh, look forward to these new families to assist in improving the economy of Harris County and to uplift and make our county shine. I thank you for this opportunity to speak and ask you to join us in welcoming the new Afghan families to our wonderful Harris County. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Judge, I heard that there is a speaker in the courtroom who wants to speak on this item, Marissa Littell. Judge, she's actually here to speak on item 316, 347, 359, and 363 together. How do we keep track of time for that? 360. Okay, well, we'll do that and then we'll, we'll, um, we were proposing rules today so we can figure that out going forward. Go ahead. Uh, the, the, yeah. So we're in the middle of a pandemic, Can you right? Your name and affiliation? My name is Marissa, and I'm here as a constituent. We're in the middle of a pandemic, but we're welcoming all these Afghanistan civilians and using our taxpaying dollars as wasteful spending. I mean, it's it's astonishing to me that we're masking our children, yet you're welcoming all of these new Afghanistan refugees with no civilian background checks. Adrian Garcia, we know about the wasteful spending, but the wasteful spending is not done towards our police departments and health departments. It's things like this that is wasteful spending. Right now we're in the middle of a pandemic like you guys keep on saying, even though the wasteful spending is the vaccine incentive programs, the 8.6 million that you're gonna give to people to incentivize them to take a supposedly um, life-saving vaccine. It's $100 per person. That's our taxpaying dollars. Shouldn't they want to take a vaccine? Why do you have to bribe them to take it? Um, the $4.7 million that you're planning on using of our taxpaying dollars, that's wasteful spending. What's the wasteful spending is 60 million that went to Garner Environmental to put up a tent, a medical tent that didn't even take any patients. That's wasteful spending. 
The wasteful spending that we're talking about is the ones that you guys keep on coming up with these new budgets and these new things that we don't need. It's, it's, really, it's really concerning to me that you don't seem to look outside and see all the homeless people that are in our streets right now. And the influx that, you're, that we're about to be taking in with these Afghanistan refugees, you don't think that crime is gonna rise? You don't think that certain things are gonna happen? I am all for legal immigration, but right now what's happening is we see it. We see what's happening. And it's, it's really concerning that you don't see it. You walk into this courtroom at, or this building every day. Do you not see, are you not aware of your surroundings? Do you not see the homeless people out in the streets? I, I just went to get some coffee during the break and I counted at least 10 people that were homeless in a blocks radius. And now you wanna welcome in more people with no civilian background checks. Nothing along the lines of that. It's concerning to me that you guys do not see what you're doing to our country and our county. And I mean, the list goes on. It's, 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 it's really, really scary. And to bring up our police department and our Houston hospital. Can I finish or? I'm sorry, we need to stop you at time. Well, it's, it's really shameful what you're doing. And I really okay. wish you would just open your eyes and look at what's happening outside. I almost wonder, since you're here in person, if you want to just speak on the other items as well, so you don't have to wait until we- No, I can up. wait, because I'd like to have all three minutes for each item, because it's really concerning what I'm saying. But I'm just saying, but if you'd like to sit here, you're welcome to. Okay. So, um, that, do you have any other speakers? Yes, ma'am. Next is number 24 on the list, Sharik Ghani. Go ahead, please. Judge Hidalgo and Harris County Commissioners, uh, thank you for your time this morning and thank you all for working through the night to ensure that our county is safe. My name is Sharik Abdul Ghani and I'm the director of Minaret Foundation where our mission is to lift the voices of American Muslims for change through multi-faith and civic engagement. Uh, I would like to commend the court for taking on this resolution and signaling support for our Afghan allies who braved death and despair to support our mission overseas. Not only did they put themselves in harm's way, but they put their families in harm's way as well. Of the many reasons they supported our armed forces, one of them is that they believe in America, our city upon a hill. They believe in our values of freedom, of democracy, of the freedom of worship and assembly. More than anything, they see America as an opportunity to achieve exactly what you and I want to achieve. A stable household, a good education, a roof over their heads and food on their table a good life for their children, including an education and opportunities to pursue their dreams. As one of the most diverse counties in the country, I'm proud to say that Harris County has stood up through various agencies, such as an Nissal Hope Center, Interfaith Ministries of Greater Houston, Olive Branch Family Services, the Multi-Faith Neighbors Network, synagogues, mosques, churches, and so many more. It's also important that we take care of our allies to show our support and loyalty to those who saved the lives of our soldiers and aided our mission in a substantive way. In other words, the world must know we take care of our own and we will not abandon our friends and their families on the field. This is important for the moral fabric of our nation and to also secure the safety of our soldiers in the future. May God bless our troops, bless our country and continue to bless our nation. Thank you all. Thank you. Next to speaker number 28, Camille Khan of Interfaith Ministries. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon, Judge Hidalgo and respective commissioners. I thank you for this opportunity to speak on this platform. My name is Camille Khan and I am the Community Engagement Coordinator at Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston. Interfaith Ministries is Houston's oldest interfaith organization and is working with our volunteers and donors urgently to assist the newly arrived Afghan refugees in our city. 
These are our allies who supported our troops in Afghanistan and had their lives threatened because of that support, because of that affiliation. And now it is our turn to help them in their time of need. They are vetted from over five federal agencies, had to take pre-arrival COVID tests, and once they do arrive, provide a significant boost to our economy. Interfaith Ministry provides Afghan refugee families with case management efforts, airport pickups, housing, benefits assistance, medical case management, job placement services, vocational training, women empowerment groups, youth mentorship programming, and so many other essential services. Now, as we see more Afghan neighbors coming into the city, Houston not only has the capacity to take them in, but we also have a moral imperative too. Houston has always held the proud moniker of being a welcoming city. We have never before turned our backs on the world's most vulnerable citizens, and we certainly can do it now. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Judge, those are all the speakers we were able to reach for that item. Thank you. And so one of the speakers mentioned, I, I did want to um, just a quick note on the work everybody has done over the past days and, and past night and weekend for the, the storm. I failed to mention that in the morning. So Thank you. just a note of appreciation for all of our teams. Thank yes, you. Commissioner King. I just wanted to confirm with Mr. Berry, this resolution, there is no financial impact to the county. I'm, I'm not either and from what I reviewed. I, I appreciate um, some of the concerns about making sure everybody is is tested and is healthy and whatnot, but I also feel uh, I may have a learned disagreement with you on this one, but when Afghan civilians who worked alongside our troops, helped our troops when they were over there, provided safety for our troops over there, um, and, and now they don't have a home because they helped us, I think we need to make a home for them. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm going to be supportive of, of this resolution. Um, I, I do still encourage our State Department to do everything appropriate to make sure that we don't have, um, uh, when, when the gates are open, that we make sure that we have, that we don't, don't let folks in that may have a, a bad criminal history or something like that that would come. Uh, and, and I know that there is a vetting process in place, and we need to encourage them to follow that vetting process to make sure that we are all safe. But but those who helped us, I think that we need to help them back, especially our troops when they were over there for all those years. And so I'm gonna be supportive of this resolution, um, you know, uh, and just uh, uh, just wanted to make sure that, you know, I, I understand the concerns about safety. Sometimes when the gates are open wide, you don't always know somebody may slip in that's not been vetted, but we gotta help those who helped us, period. Yeah, Commissioner Allison and Commissioner Garcia. Oh, well, why don't we vote? Do we need a vote, Commissioner Ramsey? Well, we'll take it with the consent agenda. Yes, Commissioner uh, Garcia. Thank you, Judge. And I, too, uh, appreciate your comments, uh, Commissioner uh, Cagle. And I, too, uh, think it's important that we show uh, respect and appreciation to the Afghan community for all that they've done, all they've endured, um, and um, and all that they will have to still think about uh, while they're here. I'll just also say that uh, refugees are provided for by the Office of Refugee and uh, Resettlement, the federal office. And, um, and I, over my years, this is actually how I got to know Chief Fenner uh, when I worked uh, uh, over in the uh, southwest part of town, um, we, he and I would often meet with new residents. I would go to a lot of their, uh, their welcoming uh, events, and I will just tell you that it's always been phenomenal, phenomenal uh, to see uh, and meet these new families. And then uh, I still stay in touch with uh, many who I've met over the years who are bringing value to our, uh, our, our community here. A lot of them, thanks, uh, thank, I, I thank them because 
they've opened up restaurants and uh, they're sharing their delicious uh, foods and uh, enriching our culture. And so uh, I thank you, uh, Judge, for this resolution. And I also thank those interpreters, uh, those uh, individuals. In fact, you know, I was, uh, as all this was transpiring, I decided uh, to look at a movie that I'd seen uh, many times before, Lone Survivor. And uh, I had the honor and the pleasure of, of uh, meeting and getting to know Marcus Luttrell. Um, and it uh, never, uh, it, it was never taken lightly by me, recognizing that a village uh, fought against the Taliban. Many in that village died uh, because they were protecting a guest to their village. Um, and so um, it, Marcus uh, found it hard to talk about that experience. Um, but I'll just tell you that uh, that depiction of what happened uh, was impressive of what the Afghan community uh, has done for us. And I think Marcus will be one American, one American warrior that uh, would always be respectful and, uh, and appreciative to that village and that village leader that took him in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. One quick point. I, I think this is another example of what makes Harris County great in terms of our, I believe I've got this right, in terms of my precinct, the number of countries represented there. I think it's the most diverse. I was on Lebanese radio the other night, uh, enjoying that uh, that side of, of the of the culture and, and understand. This just adds to it. And it reminds me too. I met with a Korean veterans uh, recently. Now, if you're a Korean veteran, you're going to be in your nineties. And to know what they went through and how we partnered with them. Uh, and even though that outcome may be a little different than this outcome, we still partnered with them. That Afghan uh, warrior that fought alongside us is no different than the North, than the South Korean uh, folks that fought with us. So that's that's the context of this. And thank you for putting it on the agenda, Judge. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Next item is 364 on page 40. And I'll read the text of the resolution. Whereas on September 1st, 2021, a law prohibiting abortion in the state of Texas, once cardiac activity is detected in the gestational sac, went into effect. And the law effectively bans abortion before many are aware they are pregnant. Whereas reproductive freedom is an essential health necessity, and the decision to continue with the pregnancy is a deeply personal private decision best left to patients, their family, and their doctor. Whereas research shows that access to reproductive health services, including abortion, correlates to higher educational attainment and increased economic security. Individuals who are denied access are more likely to rely on public assistance and have incomes below the federal poverty level. Whereas the Texas law makes no exception for pregnancies that result from rape, sexual abuse, or incest, nor for pregnancies involving a fetal defect incompatible with life after birth. The law's only exception is for an undefined medical emergency that prevents compliance. Whereas outlawing abortion six weeks after conception forces those who wish to obtain these services to travel outside Texas to other states in order to exercise their constitutional rights. It hinders businesses and nonprofits in Harris County who seek to assist those who have decided to exercise their right to early termination of a pregnancy. And it will inevitably cause desperate patients to be maimed or die due to back alley abortions. Whereas the Texas abortion law limits patients access to medical care and interferes with the patient physician relationship by dissuading clinicians in the state of Texas from providing patients with the medical care they need. Whereas the Texas abortion law creates a vigilante bounty style enforcement mechanism that deputizes private parties to sue anyone who performs knowingly aids or abets or intends to assist in the inducement or performance of an abortion 
and in that way claim a $10,000 plus court costs and fees bounty. Whereas the United States Supreme Court in the Texas-based case of Roe v. Wade on January 22, 1973, vindicated a woman's right to choose whether to end a pregnancy without excessive government restriction. Whereas those in medical professions related care and transportation industries have the right to pursue their professions without fear of persecution by their fellow citizens. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Harris County Commissioner's Court hereby proclaims its strong opposition to the law and its impacts, as well as to the private civil prosecution of Harris County residents who assist those who've made the difficult personal decision to terminate a pregnancy under the rights protected by Roe v. Wade. Be it resolved that the Harris County Commissioner's Court supports the Biden administration's legal action against the state of Texas. And be it further resolved that the Harris County Commissioner's Court directs the Commissioner's Court's Analyst's Office to investigate opportunities to support individuals impacted by this law or otherwise mitigate the law's negative effects. And this, this is, um, is important to me as the only woman sitting on Commissioner's Court and only the second woman to be elected to Commissioner's Court. I feel that I have to speak for the women in Harris County, millions of women who'd be impacted by this law. The law is bad for women because it, it encourages the type of back alley abortion that the resolution mentions that used to happen before Roe v. Wade, countless numbers of women, countless, died in botched procedure. It's a terrible thing we can't go back to. So it's bad for women, but it's also a threat to public safety. When you have individual citizens of the community being baited with $10,000 cash to chase after, stalk, spy on women in the community so they can figure out whether the taxi driver took them to the clinic or figure out who their doctor is so they can collect $10,000 from them, that's dangerous. It's bad for public safety and it's bad for unity. We just got done talking about how diverse our community is. We cannot sow division to create something that incentivizes you spying on your fellow citizen. A child, it could be a teenager who got raped. It could be a woman. It could be, it could be any person. For people to be encouraged to stalk them so they can get a $10,000 bounty it's just beyond the pale. It pits neighbors against neighbors. It casts a shadow over our community. And I think it's important that we make a statement that this kind of law does not reflect who we are as a county. And I don't think it reflects who we are as a nation. This kind of vigilanteism is just nasty and it's mm -hmm. dangerous. And it's an issue that's important and protected by, by the, the, the courts as a right. Um, so it's, it's an unconstitutional law, and it's a deeply problematic, deeply problematic, I think that's a, a euphemism, it's a dangerous, dangerous provision, this $10,000 deal. I'll second your resolution. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia. I'm assuming we need to vote on this one. Yeah. Yes, Judge, we will need to vote on it. I don't know if we have any speakers signed up to talk on it, but I do have a substitute motion after I make a brief comment. The question of this bill is, in essence, uh, the concept of property versus persons. And the science of a heartbeat is one to where if there is a heart that is beating, that that becomes a person and it is no longer property. If it is a person, then it deserves protection. We have times in our past history um, have had moments where we have deemed people to not be people, but to be property. And uh, when you take a person and you treat them like property, you demean the value of life and you demean um, who we are. And so I believe that the science of a heartbeat is a good indicator that that is a person and that person deserves protection. Um, in discussing this, my, my, 
my wife in December, I will be have been married to her for 40 years. She deserves extra crowns in heaven for putting up with me for that. But judge, when she heard your press conference, which you talked about it briefly after uh, what had occurred on uh, preparing for the tropical storm, um, gently and kindly, she said, you may represent a lot of women, but you didn't represent her in your views on this particular subject matter. And so, uh, and certainly, she also raises the point, you don't represent half of the population that would be deemed to be property that would be disposable, as opposed to persons who should be protected. To that extent, my substitute motion is, whereas our nation was founded on an incredible, powerful idea, the idea that every single human being was created equal, with rights that come from our creator, from God, not from the government. You were born with those rights. The belief that everyone should have freedom and that everyone should be treated fairly. And whereas life is precious, life is a gift from God and every human is made in God's image. Every person born or pre-born has inherent dignity and has the right to life. And whereas we have a fundamental duty to fight for the vulnerable and ensure that life is protected, recognizing the right to life as a worthy cause, it is not radical, it should not be bipartisan. And whereas most Americans support significantly limiting abortion, do not believe that medical professionals should be forced to participate in abortions and do not want their taxpayer dollars to fund abortions at home or abroad. Whereas Senate Bill 8, Texas Heartbeat Act, supports the sanctity of life and the life of the, board of the unborn, be it resolved that Harris County Commissioner supports the policies that advance the cause of life. And that's my substitute motion. Okay. Sorry. You have a comment? Yeah, I was going to second that that motion. And just my comment on the on the uh, Senate Bill 8 is to say I prayerfully acknowledge that uh, Senate Bill 8 recognizes the significance of a beating heart in a child. And the book of Jeremiah says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. And that's why I'm supporting Commissioner Cagle's motion. Is that a friendly amendment to my motion? No, it's just, I'll accept that as a friendly amendment to my motion. Sure. Okay. Do we have speakers on the line? Yes, ma'am. Speaker number 29, Ana Rodriguez of Lilith Fund. Go ahead, please. Thank you. My name is Ana Rodriguez, and I'm a Harris County resident, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself and Lilith Fund in support of the Harris County resolution that opposes SB 8. I am the campaign director with Lilith Fund, an abortion fund that serves our community here in Harris County. Abortion funds provide funding and practical support for people seeking abortion care and lead advocacy work to restore and expand access to abortion. Abortion is essential health care. Yet every day, abortion funds hear from Texans who are struggling to access the care they need due to the many existing cruel and medically unnecessary restrictions passed by the state. It has always been difficult for people of color, young people, immigrants, and people struggling to make ends meet to access abortion. But Senate Bill 8 has completely pushed this essential care out of reach for most Texans with its draconian ban on abortion around two weeks after a missed period. Because of SB 8, we are seeing fewer calls to our hotline as people are unsure whether abortion is still legal, and many people are facing huge barriers in getting an appointment at a provider. The vast majority of Texans seeking abortion care are being forced to travel out of state to receive care. These Texans are forced to pay for expensive flights or drive hundreds of miles out of state to get abortion care. They have to pay for lodging, they have to secure enough time off of work for their appointment, and since the majority of our callers are already parents, they also have to figure out child care or pay even more for travel if they have to take breastfeeding infants and a loved one to help them provide child care. This can add up to thousands of dollars. And since it takes time to navigate all these barriers, people are being pushed further into pregnancy, which means the procedure itself is now more costly. As abortion funds, we are doing everything we can to help Texans access abortion care while still following the law. But because SB 8 allows any person to sue Texans for helping someone access abortion care, our staff, our volunteers, and our board are still at risk of harassing lawsuits that could cost $10,000 in damages each time. While SB 8 does not make getting an abortion illegal, 
It is designed to cut off the support network of people seeking abortion care, and through that to completely cut access, and it's doing just that. The truth is some Texans simply won't be able to access abortion, whether it's because they can't afford it or because they are undocumented and can't safely cross ICE checkpoints, fly, or drive across our own state to the existing papers law. Forcing people to carry a pregnancy to term is wrong, and it will push many Texans further into poverty. I urge the commissioner's court to vote in favor of this resolution opposing SB 8 and to take concrete steps to expand access to abortion care for Harris County residents, including using unrestricted ARPA funds to directly fund abortion or using county funds to cover practical support for abortion care, just as Austin already does. Thank you. Thank you. Next is speaker number 30, Lori Chow of I'll Have What She's Having. Go ahead, please. Hello, this is um, Lori Choi. Um, I'm a the co-founder um, and a vascular surgeon for I'll Have What She's Having and a constituent. Thank you, Commissioner. Our nonprofit, I'll Have What She's Having, is a movement of physicians and food and beverage leaders. Since 2017, we have been the face of working women being harmed by Texas state policy on family planning. Our men and women are some of the most important figures in Houston's restaurant industry, and our 100 plus volunteers have raised and donated hundreds of thousands to local preventive and mental health care providers. We got started because we predicted this exact moment in history, and we thank the judge and the commission for the opportunity to speak as doctors and restaurant workers to this resolution. As you know, Houston Food and Beverage is one of our most dynamic employers with over a quarter million workers and a labor force that's as diverse as Houston, self-describing as 77% people of color. Women are 53% of this force. Statewide, restaurant workers have report that 93% have no employment-based insurance and two of three have no insurance at all. 96% have no paid sick days. Our volunteers pre-pandemic were 40% uninsured, and I bring this up because access to health care is needed to prevent unplanned pregnancy or to support healthy pregnancy. And challenging for people who don't have insurance since our family planning clinics have been closed and our budget slashed since 2011. We all put our preventive health care on the back burner since the pandemic, and to ask someone to find a doctor to confirm a pregnancy and perform a termination within two weeks of finding out about a pregnancy is simply not possible. We're committing for medical procedures that one in four women are going to need in their lifetime. On a personal note, I tell you that I spend 60% of my time providing vascular surgery care in underserved areas of the country because I believe, as you do, that one's access to top-knowledge health care and your health should not be determined by your zip code. I've never really understood the urban-rural divide and resources that exist. I mean, in Houston, the world's greatest medical center's home, we also have an extensive network of smaller hospital and clinics that serve people who live within 30 minutes drive of the medical center. And we do this because when we seek medical care, we are at our most vulnerable state and we want to help people who are dealing with a very private issue, an intimate moment and a very stressful moment. We don't want people to have to leave their communities for care because it's compassionate and humane to keep us close to our homes and our support networks when we seek care. And we don't want this law or any copycat laws that are sure to follow to disrupt our lives too much or the lives of our loved ones. History's watching. We need to prove that tech, anyone with a uterus has the same rights as anyone without a uterus. And we ask that you pass this resolution and look to go further and be a sanctuary for providers to defy an unjust law. Thanks, and I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next is speaker number 31, Drew Silla Tigner of ACLU of Texas. Go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Drusilla Tigner, and I'm a policy and advocacy strategist and attorney at the American Civil Liberties Union of Texas, and I'm also a resident of Harris County. Senate Bill 8 is a, a cool law that, um, you know, Judge Hidalgo laid out so well in her opening statement. Um, it's a law that prevents the majority of abortion care from happening in the state of Texas, and it does not reflect the values of the majority of Texans who we know believe that abortion should be legal. 85% of abortions in Texas happening, happen after six weeks gestation, and as Anna said in her remarks, that's just two weeks after a missed period if you have a regular cycle. So you have a very, very narrow window to be able to make your decision about whether you need care and to be able to access that care. 
you know, even with this law, it's already really difficult to get abortions in Texas. You need to come up with hundreds of dollars for the procedure that is not currently covered by insurance because Texas law prevents it and is not covered by Medicaid. If you have to, you also have to get multiple days off of work because Texas requires you to have two appointments um, at least 24 hours in advance. You have to get child care because most people who get abortions have children. You have to get transportation. You, you know, it's a whole laundry list of things and barriers you need to be able to get access care to care, and SB8 makes it much, much worse. You know, we know that people will always need abortions. It's a fact of life, and it's been the case since people could become pregnant. And we also know that people with means will always find a way to get the care they need. It's the most vulnerable communities that are suffering the most under this law. People without the means to travel, teenagers who don't want to tell their parents, undocumented folks, people of color are all the people who are being left behind right now. And as was mentioned before, this law is not just about abortion. It is also very much about our system of government. The ACLU of Texas, along with our many partners, have sued in an attempt to stop the law from going into effect. But we've obviously been unsuccessful thus far, and we've been unsuccessful because the state government has passed a law that is deliberately crafted to be an end run around our Constitution. And I don't care what your views are on abortion, that should scare you. It is the state legis- if the state legislature can pass a law that infringes on our clear constitutional rights by skirting its responsibility to enforce the law and enlisting bounty hunters from all across the nation to do that work for them, then no fundamental right is safe. Every single one of our fundamental rights is on the chopping block if we allow this law to stand. Mm. That is why I'm so glad that Harris County is standing up today to say enough is enough and that our fundamental rights actually mean something. Thank you for this resolution and for your work supporting the thousands of people in Harris County who need abortion care every single year. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the final speaker for this item is number 32, Mike Zarella. Good morning uh, or good afternoon. My name is Mike Zarella. I'm a longtime resident of Harris County, Singapore. Uh, I'd like to thank Commissioner Cable for notifying its constituency about this resolution uh, against the SB8 law and the court for really enabling time for citizens to share their views. I'm speaking out today to encourage the court to reverently reflect on the rabbi's opening prayer this morning and reject the resolution opposing the new Texas law passed under SB8, commonly referred to as the heartbeat bill. The court has spent the past year promoting public health measures for the pandemic under the banner of follow the science, yet proposes to ignore the science that is clear on the biological fact that an unborn child is a distinct individual and thus deserves protection of the basic human right to life. While the list of whereas whereas statements imply fact, the resolution ignores a true factual approach in the statements. A couple examples or a few examples are, the resolution ignores that the state does not execute rapists and child molesters guilty of consciously per- per- perpetrating the heinous crimes of rape and incest, yet infers that the killing of innocent unborn children is justifiable. The resolution promotes abortion under the guise of reproductive health, yet ignores depression and post-abortion syndrome as a form of PTSD suffered by women who carry the decision with them for the remainder of their lives. The resolution referenced an inference to the dangers of back alley abortions as a potential consequence is hyperbole. As CDC research shows, the difference between the number of deaths from legal and illegal abortions is negligible. While any loss of life from the abortion process is sad and tragic, it's equally sad and tragic that every abortion kills an unborn baby and denies them the basic human right to life. Several other statements in the resolution are also uh, hypocritical in the view of how the county has tried to manage the pandemic through orders that that infringe on constitutional rights. I ask the court to consider how our tax dollars could be better spent on services immediately needed by their constituency rather than a vague proposal for the analyst's office to investigate ways to determine a law passed by duly elected representatives through the state legislative process. I encourage the court to set aside blind partisan political allegiance to a presidential administration openly hostile to the state of Texas and view abortion in the same context as other disrespect for and threats to human life, such as violent crime, murder, child abuse, genocide, et cetera. 
by rejecting the resolution. Contrary to the resolution's assertions, abortion is not simply a matter of personal choice, women's rights, or even religious opinion. It's a denial of basic human right and social justice. Through the direct killing of an innocent human being, and should not be supported by the Harris County Commissioner's Court through the proposed resolution. Hello, sir. Thank your you for your up. time and attention. Any other speakers? That's all for this item, Judge. Okay, so we have a substitute motion on the table. Let's vote on that first, and then we'll vote on the original motion. Okay. Yeah. Second. I see. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so we have a motion to table the motion until... You Table means you got to bring it back at some point. Why don't you just vote against it? Okay, so we got a motion by Commissioner Cagle, second by Commissioner Ramsey. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, no, no. Opposed? No. no. I'm opposed, so that, that motion fails two to three. And then, okay. yes, and Commissioner Garcia made a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. No. I'm in favor, yeah. So that initial motion passes three to two. Thank you, Judge. So, Commissioner Ellis, you withdraw. Your mic is off. I think you withdraw on your motion. So we're good. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Any other uh, uh, resolutions to take out of order? I know Commissioner Cable, you yes. have. Oh, yeah. Commissioner Garcia, um, item four under resolutions. Yes. Thank you, Judge. <clears throat> and um, we are now embarking on that season of uh, Hispanic uh, Heritage Month. And the first person that I'd like to recognize for this year's uh, endeavor to recognize many who have contributed uh, to, in all kinds of ways, uh, to making our, our, our community stronger, better, safer. Um, and, uh, and this honoree is no different. I will simply say that uh, Estela, otherwise known as Stella, uh, Mireles Walters, is a phenomenal example of the individuals who should be recognized. She is uh, the founder of Safe Walk Home, an endeavor that was born after a, a horrible and tragic event, but she looked beyond the tragedy and was able to make something positive and long lasting and strong as a result of that tragedy so that that victim continues uh, to live with us. Um, this, uh, her program, Safe Walk Home, has been an award winning grassroots organization. And um, it, uh, the program consists of reporting suspicious activity in the community uh, through a conglomeration of active citizens and people along uh, the routes that children would take to get to and from school, identifying uh, suspects if they, if something happens, they're willing to speak up and report uh, that to law enforcement and participate with that, rendering first aid if needed. The program works uh, in partnership with self-defense instructors in order to provide self-defense classes. And she has countless of volunteers all determined to keep our children safe. She also uh, serves in a leadership role, um, as you go figure, that uh, people like Stella uh, just can't find one thing to do. They have to continue to contribute. And so she provides a leadership role with Super Neighborhood 51. And then most recently, I have appointed her uh, to the CPS board, uh, Harris County Resources for Children and adults. And so this resolution, uh, I am so honored uh, to read, reads as such. Whereas celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month, we recognize community leaders for the remarkable contributions making our neighborhoods better places to live. Today, we recognize Estela, Stella Mireles Walters, founder of Safe Walk Home, a volunteer-based neighborhood patrol program in near Northside, Houston. And whereas in 2016, the tragic murder 
of a middle school child walking home from school prompt Stella to create what was then known as the Northside Mothers Group Program to ensure safe passage for children walking to and from school. Setting up base at uh, Holy Name uh, Church, they repaired the antique church bells to ring and alert neighbors to watch the children. And whereas known today as Safe Walk Home, the program consists of reporting suspicious activity, identifying the suspect, and rendering aid if needed. They also work in partnership with self-defense instructors to provide self-defense classes. And whereas a dynamic leader, Stella organized regular meeting program meetings and events with law enforcement agencies, HISD, Metro, and civic leaders. Her efforts led to approval of a city ordinance for the near north side neighborhood to combat vagrancy, trespassing, and drug dealing. Each year, HISD celebrates a first day of school event with Safe Walk Home, bringing awareness to the area about safety in and around our schools. And let me just say on that point real quick, uh, Judge, that uh, Stella always invites us out uh, to Marshall Middle School on the first day of school to welcome uh, the kiddos back, uh, welcome, welcoming uh, some back and welcoming the new middle school students. And it's always, it's always cute to see how shocked the kids are going, like, what's all this going on? All these law enforcement officers and, and elected officials, everybody's celebrating and congratulating them and clapping and hooplaing and the like. And uh, some of the kids are just kind of like embarrassed, like, please leave me alone. Uh, but we're giving them high fives as they walk by and welcoming their parents as well. And whereas through the dedication of countless volunteers, parents, local store employees, and many others all help guard the streets during school hours. And whereas in addition to her work as founder of Safe Walk Home, Stella has volunteered as Super Neighborhood 51 delegate and chaired its Crime and Safety Committee. Friends and colleagues know her for her volunteer efforts with school supplies and food drives and her relentless neighborhood watch. Stella serves on the board of Harris County Resources for Children and Adults, and whereas a medical laboratory te uh, technologist by profession, she retired after working many years at the Harris County Institute of Forensic Science. During her career, she worked as a histotechnician and as a uh, adjunct professor in the uh, histologic technician program at Houston Community College. Go figure, I didn't know that uh, such a program existed. So now therefore be it resolved, Stella, that Harris County Commissioner's Court recognizes Estela Mireles Walters for her service to the children and residents of Harris County. And I hope that Stella has been able to join us today. But that is my resolution, Judge. Thank you. Thank you. Can can you hear me? Yes, Della, please share yeah. some thoughts great. with us. Okay, great. Wow. Is that me? Anyway, <laughs> good day, Judge Hidalgo and Commissioners. I want to thank Commissioner Adrian Garcia for this honor as we recognize Hispanic Heritage Month. My name is Stella Mireles Walters, and I am the founder of Safe Walk Home. I accept this proclamation on behalf of Safe Walk Home. Today is a reminder that communities keeps us safe. It was the community that came together after a tragedy in Northside six years ago to help me launch Safe Walk Home Northside. I want to thank all of our members, the volunteers, the instructors, the law enforcement partners, the administrators, and countless community leaders that have made sure our efforts continue to this day. These words from Mother Teresa resonated with me at every Safe Walk Home event, and I quote, I can do things you cannot. You can do things I cannot. Together, we can do great things. And together, the community lowered crime in the North Side area and together we continue to advocate for safety for all families and students. Together we step outside of our comfort zone, my comfort zone, to make sure a tragedy involving another student would not be repeated. 
the work of, the work of communities is never done, and that is why organizations like Safe Walk Home must constantly be proactive as much as possible rather than reactive to keep our students safe. Every part of Harris County deserves to feel safe and secure. I know that y'all agree with me. My hope today is that every commissioner comes alongside of me and brings a Safe Walk Home program and its mission to every precinct in Harris County. I want to thank you again for this honor, and I thank you for acknowledging the rich culture, bravery, bravery and history of our Hispanic community in Harris County. And that I ask from the bottom of my heart. And I'm, I'm so thankful that a person will, can bring up something and that it means so much to the community. And with safety being so insecure, this is, this is a big effort. And I gladly accept the resolution, proclamation. Thank you. If, you, Thank if you. anyone has any questions, I'm here to answer. And I'm here to help you with anything that you need. Well, Stella, first of all, I am just so proud of you and so such a big fan for all that you've done, uh, what you've done in, in, um, in reflection of that, that tragedy uh, in our community. Thank you for being that leader that brought people together and focused uh, their efforts on the things that we could make better. And so that the memory of that beautiful child continues to live in all that you do and all the volunteers you bring together. And, uh, and you know what, I, I learned uh, something about you. I didn't, I knew you had retired from Harris County. I didn't know that you had retired as a, what was it? What, what is that work um, that you were doing? You, you retired as a histo technician. Yes, and that's, what is, that's a program that we, we need more professionals that w should join this program. I am considered the, um, the uh, what, what they consider a tissue technician, which is very important when it comes to cases with forensic sciences. Uh, we do evaluate, we run tests, we prove things that have been done to the body, and uh, which all mount up to building cases uh, against the, the uh, perpetrator. Wow. And every single histotechnologist is found in any hospital and research laboratory, from the Space City labs here up to Washington, D.C. museums. We're here to, uh, we're specially trained to deal with all types of tissues and the diagnosis of cause of disease or death. Wow. Well, thank you for your phenomenal work. Stella, you were one of those first uh, um, heroes that today so many kids talk to me about. They're like, I want to be a CSI uh, investigator. Uh, so thank <laughs> you for being a pioneer. Uh, and congratulations <laughs> again. Congratulations. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Do we have a motion by thank Commissioner Castillo and second by Commissioner Ramsey? Um, we vote on this with the consent agenda, yeah. Commissioner Ellis, I miss a resolution. Judge, I have one for um, Marva Gay, who might be on the line. And this is to congratulate her on her retirement from the Harris County Attorney's mm -hmm. Office after 26 years of exceptional service to the government and people of Harris County. It says, whereas Marva Gay began her work for the Harris County Attorney's Office as an assistant county attorney in August of 1995, prior to her own boarding, she gained expertise in the field as general counsel for the Kentucky Hospital Association, which prepared her for her role working with the Harris County Hospital District Division. Marvel became the first general counsel to Community Health Choice and was instrumental in helping to establish an affordable insurance program for residents of Harris County and the hospital district. Whereas Marvel Gay subsequently became the division chief for the general counsel division of the county attorney's office, where she worked on some of the county's most significant contracts and purchases, drafted opinions with Harris County officials, and made submissions to the Texas Attorney General's Office and counsel clients about governmental responsibilities and legal obligations. Whereas Marva Gay's knowledge and expertise of hospital issues, insurance, and public health are held in high esteem, she went on to become general counsel of Harris County Public Health and Environmental Services Department, working with Dr. Palacio and Dr. Shaw, 
Marvel has made national presentations sharing our knowledge with public health council throughout the country and has critically assisted during numerous crises, including Hurricane Harvey and the coronavirus pandemic. So, Judge, we're going to miss her, but what a, an exceptional 26 years. So, congratulations, and I believe she is on the line. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. I want to... I want to thank a number of people. I want to do the second on that, Marvin, before you get too far down the road. This is this is this is former <laughs> Judge Cagle. I'm doing your second. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, and I'll put in a plug now for the Irish Lawyers Association. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I want to thank first of all. I want to thank Dory Wind, who hired me all those years ago, oh, wow. 26 years ago. Dory Wind is still still with the county, and she's still a good friend of mine, even after all these years. And I want to thank, <laughs> I want to thank um, Scott Lamont, who I think was one of the masterminds behind this resolution, so I appreciate him. And I want to thank all five county attorneys who I've worked for, um, and at least four of them were all Irish lawyers. Mike Driscoll hired me, and he's, he died. Uh, Mike Fleming died a couple of years ago, way, way too soon. Mike Stafford, um, who I really enjoyed. Mike Stafford, Vince Ryan, I really, all these people, I consider them personal friends as well as the boss. And now Christian Menifee. So I've had a really wonderful career with five wonderful county attorneys. I also want to uh, say a word about some of the really wonderful assistant county attorneys who helped me along the way. Don Whitley, who I think some of you may remember, and Scott Bresk. They were like the, uh, they could give lectures and write books on Terrace County uh, laws. And I also want to thank two of the uh, directors, former directors of Harris County Public Health, Harris County Public Health. I know you're not supposed to have a favorite client, but there was no doubt that was always my favorite client. And I started working with Dr. Mena Palacio and had great fun and also worked with Dr. Sumer Shaw, who was absolutely wonderful and wonderful to me. Um, so thank you for everything, and thank you for this wonderful resolution and the opportunity to say goodbye to you. Congratulations. Thank you. And thank you for mentioning uh, Dory. Dory uh, was one of those uh, assistant county attorneys assigned to me when I was sheriff and uh, was a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, individual and, and uh, provided a great deal of support. So thank you so much for mentioning, Dory. Thank you, Marva. Thank Congratulations you. and thank you. Thank you so much. And we can thank take it with the consent agenda. I'll okay, so the motion is by Commissioner Ellis and second by Commissioner Cable, and we'll put it on the consent agenda. Commissioner Ramsey, did you have a motion, uh, a resolution out of order? I did. Thank you, Judge. Uh, we're going to recognize, would like to recognize, make a proposal to recognize uh, uh, Crime Stoppers amongst uh, others. But uh, the job they did recently in the uh, finding the uh, person that murdered or alleged to have murdered Officer Everett Bresco, I think is an example of the good work they do. And the resolution reads, whereas on September 26, 2021, the National Day of Remembrance honors victims of murder, Harris County sadly will be remembering over 200 new names at this year's event. The number of those who are remembered has risen in the wake of the violent crime epidemic in Harris County. And whereas community involvement and trust in law enforcement is key to reducing crime in Harris County, the best way to become involved is to leverage the work of community partners to reach out to the community and help bridge the gaps between the public and law enforcement. And whereas since 1980, Crime Stoppers of Houston has strived to work with residents, criminal justice partners, and the media to shine a light on criminal activity in Harris County. 35,975 
cases have been solved through Crime Stoppers tip, tip line. With the increasing rate of crime in Harris County, the tip line has been tremendous asset in solving crimes. And whereas the tireless efforts of Crime Stoppers and Houston CEO uh, Ronnie McCarris and Director of Victim Services and Advocacy Andy Kong, among other staff and volunteers, has helped to keep thousands of Harris County residents say through advocacy, outreach, and action. More importantly, Crime Stoppers has given a voice to victims. And whereas Crime Stoppers of Houston is an indispensable partner in reducing and solving crimes in our region, the, their efforts include the Safe School Institute, Victim Services and Advocacy, the Fallen Hero Project, the Safe Community Program, among others. Now there be resolved, the Harris County Commissioner's Court solemnly celebrates the National Day of Remembrance and commends the efforts of Crime Stoppers of Houston to support and promote community safe Second. from the Second. threat of violent crime. Second. I had my son up, Second. but he said the word first. <laughs> Judge, you got to make a decision. It's bipartisan. Uh, so, uh, motion by Commissioner Ramsey, second by Commissioner Garcia. Do we have do we have speakers on the line? Yes, ma'am. The first speaker is number three, Edward Pollard of the Houston City Council. Go ahead, please. Well, good afternoon to Judge Hidalgo and the commissioners. This is Council Member Edward Pollard, District J. I stepped out of our City Council public session just to take this call. But I want to thank um, Commissioner Ramsey for bringing this resolution forward. I also want to thank Andy Kahn, your entire staff, uh, for all that you all do with Crime Stoppers. You all have been a valuable asset and organization to Houston Harris County for a long time, not only to help and solve and reduce crime, uh, but to support the families of the victims. And so we all know that the top priority in Houston Harris County right now is uh, public safety and finding ways to reduce crime. And Crime Stoppers goes a long way to aid us in that effort. I think one of the first initiatives that my office partnered with Commissioner Ramsey was a town hall on public safety where one of the panelists was Andy uh, with Crime Stoppers. And we were talking about ways in which strategies together uh, to reduce crime in Southwest Houston. And so it's going to take organizations like Crime Stoppers, the community, local leaders, and law enforcement to continue to work together to bridge that gap. And I want to thank Commissioner Ramsey for his continued uh, effort towards addressing public safety and making it a top priority because it's going to take those type of efforts and type of leadership to get us to where we want to be. So congratulations, Andy, and your entire team and um, all the families. You're in my thoughts and prayers. Thank you, Councilmember Pollard. Appreciate you calling in. Appreciate you partnering with me on the victims there on uh, Bessonette. That was great. Thank you. Councilmember, thank you thank for you, taking the time. It's always good to hear your voice. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Next is Andy Kahn. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ramsey. Thank you, uh, County Judge, Commissioner Cagle, Commissioner Garcia, and Commissioner Ellis. Uh, crime, you know, I've been doing this a long time, and I've always had an adage that crime victims are the only unwilling participants in the criminal justice system. Everyone else chose their role. So it's the least we can do to make sure that victims' rights, their due process, their well-being, and their being put back together again remain a priority. And in Harris County, we have some of the most incredible organizations that work with victims. We're, it's truly honorable how many organizations we have that work with sexual assault, homicide, domestic violence, and human trafficking. I serve on the board of parents of murdered children and surviving family members of homicide. I also serve on the board of Texas EquiSearch. And as always, any member of the court is invited to attend any of our parents of murdered children's meetings. And more importantly, I want to personally invite each and every one of you to the National Day of Remembrance, September 26th, Sunday evening from 6 to 8 p.m. Organizations throughout the country will be hosting ceremonies to commemorate homicide victims and surviving family members of homicide. We have one of the largest events in the country, and all of you are welcome to attend. And again, I want to thank Commissioner Ramsey. It's truly honorable to be given a resolution and we're going to continue to do what we do at Crime Stoppers, and that's get suspects back in custody and help victims navigate the system. Thank you. 
Thank you, Andy. Keep up the good fight, brother. Thank you, and thank you, Commissioner, for bringing this. They, they do they do great work, and the tip line is is key. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, and I know you've been doing it for a long time, long, long, long time. Uh, thank you for all that work. Any other speakers? Yes, ma'am. Next is number six, Rainia Mancarius of Crime Stoppers of Houston. Go ahead, please. Good. Good afternoon, everybody. County Judge Lena Hidalgo, Commissioner Ramsey. Thank you so much for this. Commissioner Garcia, Commissioner Cagle, Commissioner Ellis. It's certainly an honor to be with you here today. I hope you are all um, safe and, and okay following uh, uh, Tropical Storm Nicholas. Uh, this this recognition means a great deal to us. We are the community arm of public safety. We work so closely with all of you, uh, with Commissioner's Court, certainly with City Council, all of our elected officials, and most importantly, uh, representing law enforcement and civilians who are either victims of crime or just really care about the public safety of everybody who calls the city and county home. You've heard the statistics, the tip line has done so much, solving so many cases, uh, locating so many suspects. It's also exonerated so many. Um, it's been vital in the solving of the Castro case, Samuel Olson, the Grotto murders. Uh, we'll be doing more with District Attorney Kimog through our Catch a Killer program. And we thank you. We just continue to thank you for the partnership, for the leadership. Uh, public safety is an issue I think we all agree needs to become um, a priority issue, as I know we're all making it that and uh, reflecting everybody in the community. I join Andy in hoping that you guys will be at the National Day of Remembrance on September 26th, and I also hope you will be with us, all of you, at the Crime Stoppers on October 26th. We continue to be so thankful and look forward to working together even more. Thank you, Ronnie. I appreciate you calling. Ronnie. Thank you. This is Commissioner yes. Kate. You're awesome. Thank you for all you do. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. So much. Judge, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Any other speakers? Um, I was just going to say earlier, Commissioner Cagle was wanting to take item six out of order, and we were able to get Officer Goodwin on the line. Yes. Let me call it up in one second. I just want to clarify the motion for the uh, Crime Stoppers resolution is by Commissioner Ramsey, second by Commissioner Garcia, and we'll vote on it with the consent agenda. Commissioner Cagle. Yes, Your Honor. Um, we just had uh, 911 pass by, and uh, so I thought it was appropriate that we would stop, pause, and remember. Uh, we have on the line Officer John Goodman, who was going to this morning uh, do our opening invocation. Uh, however, the uh, the weather last night did not cooperate, and he had a power outage and uh, was not able to join us at that time. But he is now with us. He is the Spring Independent School District's uh, uh, Police Division's chaplain. And Officer Goodman has served nine years in the United States Army, 30 years in the Texas and uh, Texas law enforcement generally. He's an ordained minister. Uh, and he uh, attended the uh, Okadome College of Biblical Studies in Southeast Houston. And he's been a chaplain in the Spring, Indep uh, Spring Independent uh, School District's police force uh, since that time, in addition to his duties as a first responder who protects our kids, he is also the senior pastor at Unity and Love Baptist Church for the last nine years. And uh, he'll be receiving, Judge, our resolution honoring 911. Whereas President Abraham Lincoln said, next to creating life, the finest thing a man can do is save one. Whereas we commemorate the 20th anniversary of the attacks on September 11th with those memories still painful to our hearts as our nation has traveled a long journey to recovery. Whereas uh, one of the enduring lessons learned from 911 is that we must cherish and recognize those who run towards the danger to be first to respond, protect, and defend. Whereas our brave men and women who serve here in Harris County have earned our respect as they have faced down hurricanes, blackouts, budget concerns, chemical explosions, ice storms, loss of life in the line of duty and a pandemic. Now, therefore, let it be resolved that we in Harris County Commissioner's Court honor our all our first responders spread out across our community. And Judge, this is an appropriate resolution for today because some of the most unsung first responders are our road and bridge crews. In order for the ambulance to get there, the trees have to be cleared off of the roads. In order for folks to know not to go down 
a flooded out pathway, which blessedly in precinct four, we didn't have to put up any barricades. Someone has to get out in the storm and put out the barricades. And when the waters are high, someone gets into the water to help get folks out. And that is our road and bridge, and oftentimes our parked crews pitch in, and they are our first responders. If they were in the military, they would have been called the CBs, uh, the construction battalion folks who got there to build the air strips under fire so others could come in afterwards and make their landings. And so uh, I want to thank uh, Pastor Goodman, Officer Goodman, uh, for receiving this resolution, and he can make a few remarks, and I would join that this resolution applies to all of our first responders, including uh, the ones who clear the roads so that the others can get there. Uh, Officer Goodman? Yes, this chaplain Goodman was for the Police Department. First of all, I want to say thank you, thank you to uh, to Commissioner uh, Jack Cagle and to each of you as Harris County Commissioners for supporting the Harris County Law Enforcement Agency for their selfless efforts in protecting our community. Um, uh, we as officers in Harris County cannot do our job without your support and resources. And I just want to thank each of you for just taking out the time to thank each of us for the uh, job that we do from day to day upon a day to day basis. I am honored to serve as the first responder, police officer, and law enforcement chaplain within uh, this great Harris County community. And I'm just excited for what uh, each of you have done for our law enforcement community and you continue to do. And it's my prayer that God continue to bless each of you as you direct this great uh, county as you lead. Uh, so on behalf of the law enforcement community, uh, it is a great honor and a privilege to accept this resolution. And may God bless each of you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. Thank you, Chaplain, Officer, <clears throat> yes, sir. Pastor, yes, sir. all of them titles. Thank you for them all. Yes. And blessings. Yes, Y'all be blessed. Thank you so Likewise. much, Officer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's it for resolutions. We have several speakers left, but it's time for a break. So. Why don't we break until 2.30, then we'll hear, hear the rest of the speakers and move on to the agenda. Your Honor, if I can make a slight suggestion. Of course. Because there's been some homework for me to do. Yeah. Would you mind giving me 30 minutes so I can work on a little bit of that? Sure. So we'll, we can break till quarter to three. That works for me. Oh, thank you. It's 2.20. Okay, so it's 257 Commissioner's Court is back in session. Let's begin hearing from some of the speakers, please. All right, Judge, next is speaker number nine, Julia Orduna of Texas Housers. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Judge Hidalgo, Commissioners. My name is Julia Orduna. I am the Southeast Texas Regional Director for Texas Housers. And I am speaking today because we are very interested in the success of the rental assistance programs in Harris County. Texas Housers has been observing eviction court dockets in Harris County for a year and have seen how important rental assistance is to keep Texans housed. Emergency Order 39 states that cases where parties are interested in participating in the rental assistance programs should be abated for 60 days without question. Our observations dictate that the 16 Justice of the Peace in Harris County do not administer their court cases uniformly, including the interpretation of Emergency Order 39. And sometimes even the same judge interprets this order differently within the same docket. It is not only impeding equal treatment and fair trials, it also skews the odds towards the landlord, an issue we already knew existed before the pandemic. We have millions of dollars waiting to be distributed to keep residents of Harris County housed. There is no reason why a single writ of possession should be executed right now, especially for non-payment of rent cases. We applaud the six Justice of the Peace who are currently working with the Alliance to better assist parties in eviction courts. It is important that all 16 Justice of the Peace allow this county-funded work that the Alliance is doing into their courtroom. The community navigators should be able to connect the landlord and tenants 
and inform them of their rights of the specific rental assistance programs so they ha may have a better understanding of how they can each benefit from the opportunities that the county has given to them. Texas Housers believes that by collaborating with community navigators and rental assistance programs, justice of the peace can minimize the stress in their courtroom and reduce the amount of eviction cases seen before them. We urge you to understand what are the limitations that each justice of the peace is dealing with, why some of them continue to hold in-person hearings despite the fact that we are now at a level one COVID threat, and find a collaborative and constructive way to explain to landlords the benefits of the programs, explain to tenants their rights, and minimize the spread of COVID-19 infections. Commissioners, I'm available to each of you and would be happy to speak further on our work. I appreciate your time and am happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your advocacy. It's a very important issue. Thank you. I know that, uh, is it Tiffany who's calling the speakers? Yes, ma'am. Tiffany, I, I know I'm sure you've called some folks already, so we'll hear from the folks you already called, and then we're going to take a break to talk about the tax rate, a break from speakers to talk about the tax rate. Okay. Thank you. All right, next speaker number 10, Elisa McBroom. She's speaking on COVID-19 item 9. Commissioner Cable, are you sending around your proposal? Okay. Good afternoon. Go Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Catholic Charities has the Biden contract to process illegal border migrants in McAllen, giving them prepaid debit cards, emergency hotel vouchers, and transporting them into the country. When I go to their website today, catholiccharities.org, the first headline <laughs> says, help Afghan families coming to make their new home in Houston. And it has a picture of one woman in front of a group of 15 men and five children. It sounds like Catholic Charities is already, already has plans and funding and permission to do this, whether or not items 359, 363 get approved. Uh, but we know that 95% of the Afghans who fled Afghanistan didn't work for or with U.S. interests in Afghanistan. They weren't vetted at all. And whereas they were able to freely make it to Kabul airport during a week when the Taliban ruled the streets of Kabul and the legitimate government had collapsed, it seems logical to believe that they are members of the Taliban uh, side of the conflict, i.e. many of them are jihad and they are waging war, a terroristic war against Americans. And even if they aren't, I don't see any reason for them to be in the USA, much less in Houston, and I don't want them here at all. Commissioner's Court has awarded Catholic Charities about $200 million of our federal emergency COVID relief money so far, year-to-date, 2021. That money was passed through a federal omnibus bill in order to help our people, the population we had here at the time the bills were passed, get through the COVID crisis without financial hardships, and that money represents debt that we have to pay back. Given that Catholic Charities' priorities and activities are primarily centered around moving, settling, and funding illegal migration, how do we know substantial portions of our emergency COVID funds aren't being used by Catholic Charities to bid for resettlement of a large new illegal migrant permanent welfare class? We don't want that, and until they show us transparency on how that money is being used, they don't need any more money. Um, real quick on the vaccines, a new study shows that teenage boys are six times more likely to suffer cardiac damage from a vaccine than they were to be hospitalized from COVID. After 18 months of pandemic and billions spent by this commissioner's court, you still are not offering any county residents any early treatments for sick people to prevent them from surging the hospitals and dying. That's not acceptable. Treating sick people should be your first priority. Make parking lot and <coughs> minister the governor's Regeneron program is free. You should also set up parking lot tents to give residents. Hello, ma'am. Your time is up. Ma'am, your time is up. 
All right, Judge, the last speaker that we already had on the line was number 11, Karen Allen, and she's speaking on COVID-19, item 18. Go ahead, please. Karen Allen? Yes, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, ma'am, please go ahead. Okay, then yes. Um, good afternoon, Judge and all commissioners. I wasn't anticipating speaking uh, this late, so I'm going to go rapidly through it and just say as much as I can and follow up with written correspondence. Um, I'm here to speak about a matter that is of the greatest importance, and that's evictions and the legal system here in Harris County. Um, I will address a few of my uh, objectives and then just kind of give background. First of all, I'd like to say um, that I, my goal is to stand for myself and the hundreds of thousands of others who are facing or who have faced evictions. And I want to be able to shine a spotlight and to see what can be established in order to monitor what is taking place within our local courts. Uh, I personally have faced an eviction that did not adhere to the law uh, in your JP and county courts uh, under the JP court and uh, Sharon Bernie's court and, and in the county with Judge George Barnstone, who I understand has since resigned. I am seeking assistance um, because much of the assistance I see is for those individuals who are about to be evicted, but for those who have wrongfully be, been evicted, I've not found any assistance. I have dedicated my life to working with youth and young adults, and now I am going to not only stand for myself, for other families, because what's taking place is a tragedy. And again, I am seeking assistance uh, in obtaining housing for myself, assistance in um, helping to vacate or otherwise remove an eviction that was issued under Judge Barnstone. I'm sure that you all understand that during uh, any time it is difficult to uh, obtain housing with an eviction, but during a time of national pandemic, and Judge Barnstone has had, from my understanding, allegations of misconduct for years, but he was allowed to sit under, um, under the watch of our county commissioners and judge, and I don't understand that. And I do want to get clarity and assistance with this matter. Um, and again, I am going to stand and I committed myself to becoming an advocate um, to stand for myself and hundreds of thousands of other families um, so that we can see processes and procedures for monitoring the actions of our judges. Hello, ma'am. Your time is up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Is that, that is Tiffany? Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you. So let's move on to the tax, move back to the tax conversation and we're trying to walk away with is one or a couple of proposals. Your Honor, if I could direct everybody's attention to slide three, page three of the overview of the proposed property tax rates. And um, the left hand column is identical to what Commissioner Garcia earlier read in terms of the proposed tax rates um, that had been initially proposed by the administrator. Um, and uh, is before the court. The, I'm full agreement with the flood control section I believe all of us are in full agreement with regard to the flood control section. 
In the first section where it's county MO and county debt service, the total of those two come up to 37,693. If we went to the no new revenue rate, that number would drop to 37,223, which is a difference. Let me get my piece of paper here. Of point. 047 or roughly half a penny. Um, the discussion was that there could be issues involving the county debt service if we went to the half a penny drop. Um, but as we and what I would propose as to a tax rate that we instead of of having the half a penny increase as was proposed um, for the whole section that we have a quarter penny increase, a 0.025% that would go towards the debt county debt service. And so what uh, I, I went and I used my, my one Barney Fife bullet with Commissioner Ramsey and uh, I think that he is amenable to the compromise position between what was proposed by the uh, administrator and uh, the position of no new revenues at all with regard to the county section. And this would, in essence, split the difference between those two and it would go towards the debt service uh, section. And so that first section instead of reading county m and uh, at the 3350 um, would go to uh, 33030 for maintenance operations and point o instead of saying point o four one nine three would say uh, point o four 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 three for a debt service for a total of three seven four seven three which in essence is halfway between the proposed, it's, it's a quarter penny instead of a half penny of the proposed uh, increase above the net no revenue rate. Would you like for me to repeat that? Are you sending it around? It, it, Commissioner Ramsey's office sent it around to everyone. Um, yeah. Oh, got it, got it. Can somebody send it my way, please? And I've, and I've given a copy to um, Mr. Barry. You got an extra one there? <coughs> and I'm giving one to our clerk. Math works out. The math works out. If you see the worksheet that uh, Mr. Barry sent around the no new revenue rate, it shows a reduction of 20 million on Harris County. Essentially what Commissioner Cagle has done is reduce that to 10 million rather than 20 million. Rather than 20.2, this is the uh, worksheets on the back and they're, they're not numbered. It's a tiny little number. Oh, I'm sorry, 12. So that, that rate that Commissioner Cagle referenced point three seven four seven three means that uh, the county revenues is reduced 10 million and that addition the 10 million went into uh, debt service I haven't seen it uh, if you don't mind getting it over to me um, oh there you go mr Barry your thoughts on this I mean, does that kind of walk us through what it means in terms of numbers for everything, Mr. Barry? I mean, you still, you guys still have flood control and flood control the way that it is, support the way that it is, and um, hospital district uh, with the no, no new revenue. I want to say the way that it is, the way that it was proposed by the county minister. Got it. And, and, and when you just said no new revenue to the hospital district, Mr. Berry, uh, 
what is the translation in terms of what that means to the hospital district's bottom line? 30. So um, I'll answer your question, Commissioner Garcia, but I'd like to make sure I understand the proposal first, if you don't mind taking just one, one second. So um, would you like me to roll through it in my layman's terms once more? That sounds great. Okay. If on, back to page three, this would be very similar to what we would post paper, which would be what the public would read. And currently we have under the county MO as the proposal, the point 0.335 and the county debt service 0 0.04193. And then below that as the total 0 0.37693. I just like to focus for a second on that, that big number, which is the sum of the two parts, the 37693. If we went to no new revenue, across the board for that section, that 37693 would go down to 37223. The difference between 37693 and 37223 is 0 0.0047, roughly half a penny. And so, what I am proposing is that instead of the 37693 or the 37223, that we add a quarter of a penny back in, 0 0.025, but that we put it into the category of county debt service. That way that would allow us to continue uh, to pay our debt service and would also make it to where we could perhaps even expand our bond issues that we have outstanding that we've not yet issued for infrastructure. Because there are a number of bonds that were approved in uh, previous elections that have not yet all been issued. And if we wanted to utilize the capacity of those bonds, we'll need to have some room. And so by adding 0 0.0025, in to the county debt service capacity, we will both meet the current debt service requirements and also have capacity to utilize what is currently unutilized bonds that are in our road and bridge. I think we've already uh, issued all the parks bonds, but we've not issued all the road and bridge bonds and would allow us to tap into additional road and bridge funds by tapping into the county debt service. So we would propose, uh, or I would propose, I think Commissioner Ramsey is, is, is amenable to adding in the quarter penny instead of the half penny and have it go to the line of county debt service so that we could both service our current debt and have capacity to issue the already existing bonds that have been approved, but have not yet been issued. That's the layman's understanding of these items that would be published. And I, I do think there is a question of whether we can set a debt service rate for bonds that haven't been issued yet. And, 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 and I'm not sure that we can. I, I don't know if anyone from county attorneys or tax office has that answer off the top of their head, but I'm, I, I believe it has to be based on actual bonds that have already been issued. And uh, and just, uh, Commissioner Cagle, I just want to, I'm just trying to track your proposal. Um, because you, you right now you're talking about uh, the county debt service, but you, earlier you mentioned the hospital district. In the, in the hospital district, I was, I was willing to do the debt service on the hospital district. A colleague of mine, I was not able to persuade him to go in that particular direction, but I was able to bump him up to the debt service here in right. the in the county. I used I used my one bullet, mm -hmm. and I no. and I got him to agree to go the quarter up for the debt service. And I don't think that we. I think I agree with what you're saying. We can't say that this is going to go to pay future bond. It still has to go through the approval process. 
but if we approve the tax rate for it, that it's there and available for it, then we can issue them going forward. I don't, I, I think I agree with your non-lawyer words of saying, you can't tie something to a future expenditure that's not been made yet. But at the same time, I do think that we can put it into what we publish to the public saying that we will fund debt service and give us the room to issue the additional debt. And, and I'm not saying one way or the other. I, I know if we can or can't. I would just have that question because I know that you need to have a schedule of payments on debt issuances to raise the taxes to pay them back. So uh, we need to, you know, we need to look into it. It's, it's my response on that. Okay. And the, the, you know, my, my other thought is that, um, I, I mean, look, it's, we are setting a new baseline on the tax rate every time we set one. So it is an improvement to not cut the tax rate as much. Um, this would not solve the $20 million gap, and correct me if I'm wrong, Commissioner Cagle, that we have versus our adopted budget at the county, nor would it solve the gap at the hospital district, which I believe is $37 million. I would agree on the one. Mm -hmm that this does not address the hospital district. Um, as to the other, where you have a $20 million gap, this does add 10 million back into the category. The, the debt service taxes, however, are restricted. So for example, if we had a, in the budget, we had a uh, m and expenditure to pay a sheriff's deputy or pay a public health employee or pay a precinct employee, we do not have the flexibility to move debt service taxes over to do that. So we would not solve that problem. So but we could take we could take money that's not initially dedicated to servicing the debt and service the debt. Yes, so you can. just, just yes. put the 10 million up in the other in the general OM. You, you can, can move money from reduce, I'm sorry, go. And we can use it to reduce commercial pay of which we've got some significant commercial pay for it. The, the debt service rate. I, I would generally agree with that. We'd have to check in terms of the exact schedule we need for setting the tax rate. But yes, you can you can retire commercial paper early with debt service taxes if you ch check all the boxes. So um, yes, you can use m and revenue to, and I'm sorry, if I, do you want to go ahead? You, you can use m and revenue to pay debt service. You can't do the opposite. So under this proposal, we could not take these added taxes we have from debt service and use it to pay the public health employee or the sheriff's deputy or the, the, the precinct employee. So that problem would not be solved. I would say the, the, you know, the problem of, of uh, you know, setting a new baseline going forward and that impairing our ability to issue debt and invest what we need to, right? it would be somewhat reduced, but but not not eliminated. But it, it's a step in the right direction. Commissioner, I just want to make sure I get it. So mm -hmm. this proposal essentially cuts the county tax rate and it cuts the hospital district, correct? And from an m and perspective, all the way down to the sort of lowest level. What impact do you think this would have on the bond rate? Mr. Barry, um, yes. can I interject real quick? This is Elizabeth Doss sure. with the Harris County Tax Office. Um, and I know there's lots of things in motion here. I just wanted to kind of say something and I can let Jay jump in. What I understand about the truth and taxation worksheets that you know we've calculated um, for all the county jurisdictions, the debt rate that is shown under the voter approval rate and the debt rate that is being proved um, by uh, budget management um, for a county example, 0 0.04193. Um, that is the debt rate that must be adopted to pay those debt funds by requirement. And what I understand from the tax code, that's the debt rate you must adopt to pay those debt bonds. Um, and that's kind of a requirement. Um, so I think that's kind of the discussion if, if Jay wants to back me up on that. That's what I understand those debt rates to be calculated as and they have to be adopted as such. Now, the only way for those debt rates to be changed is if there's other unencumbered funds to pay down those debt rates, you know, there could be that situation. For example, the um, Hector money. 
that was used to pay down debt. So I think the only discussions there can be is what MNO portion do the commissioners want to adopt? Sure, Jay, would you agree on that? Yeah, uh, yeah. Hi, um, hi, uh, uh, Elizabeth. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, that's our understanding as well. Really, what the court is looking to do <clears throat> is really deal on the MNO side, the IS side, the interest in. Uh, and cost for debt service, interest in service is, is something that, that is essentially fixed because to the to the to Dave's larger point was you know we cannot not pay bondholders so that rate can't be jeopardized um, and so there's there's less movement there than it is on the other on the MNO side. My proposal is to increase the amount towards the reduction of debt. In other words, by having the quarter of a penny increase, they would be, if we were in the feds, we would say earmark towards debt reduction and or the issuance of the existing debt bonds that are out there. And I know that we have commercial paper that you can use um, your debt service to pay for. I'm not quite sure how all those rules work. I know that oftentimes commercial paper has been cheaper than the issuance of bonds depending upon your market at other times the issuance of the bonds is cheaper than the commercial paper and it just depends upon the current market conditions and i i think essentially what would have to happen is for us to come up with a new schedule of debt retirement that would pay down debt more quickly i think we'd have to do a complete legal analysis on that because i agree we can't just raise the money and set it aside for debt that doesn't exist so i think you know, I, at a minimum, I wouldn't be comfortable moving forward on this today until we've done that full analysis, because mm -hmm. this is not the kind of thing you want to make a foot fault mm -hmm. and then get in a fight about later. So what I'm understanding from our, our legal team is that the 0 0.04193 is calculated specifically to what our current debt is right now, and that we are currently not aware of a mechanism by which we can actually increase to pay down the debt faster. There may be a way to do it, but you are not currently aware of one. I, I'm, I'm not ready to, to, to volunteer one off the top of my head. That's right. I would want to. I would want to do the work. And how long would it would it take you think for us to work that out? I I, I hate to promise on the spot. Uh, I, I don't, I'm, I'm talking, are we talking about days? Are we talking about weeks? Uh, I, I think it would be, I think it would be days. I mean, from my perspective, at least it'd be interesting to hear where other folks are on the proposal. And if there are other pieces of this that might be on the table, because again, I, my reaction to this is of the issues that I presented with going to the no new revenue rates. This is helpful on one of the issues, but there remain a number of of other issues and there and there may be a another compromise to where the quarter of penny goes to the overall category but we just have a agreement that it's going to go towards infrastructure uh, commissioner, reduction debt I, I, I would i would say and i'm sorry i would say that would be a lot simpler to implement if you said if the discussion were to veer in the direction of well let's work on the county m o rate uh, maybe it's not keeping it the same as Commissioner Ellis mentioned. Maybe it's not what the county administrators proposed. Maybe it's not the new revenue rate, uh, and and have an agreement as to what some of those funds funds would be spent on. Right, that that would be a more straightforward for this way for this negotiation to go than plugging money in a in a debt service account. Yeah, Commissioner Ellis, we would still have a significant hole in terms of the county's general fund. And in terms of the hospital district. Yes. And we would have to make some cuts to make up for that. Yes. And if we're going to make those cuts, uh, I think at some point we ought to have that discussion. It would be helpful going into it. I know where I'm going to want to cut it from. I'm going to want to cut it from the ones who didn't want to pay for the services. But I just think it would be helpful to have that discussion as we go. I mean, we still talk about serious holes that we would be putting uh in the budget so what she was essentially saying is you would agree to a limited uh version of what the county administrator proposed for flood control but only if that money went to service debt 
That's essentially what you're no, saying. No, they, they don't want... Flood, flood control is the same as what... If I'm getting it. Flood control is the same as what the county administrator proposed. The difference comes... With the, the county, well, the hospital district is the, is the major difference because there they're proposing no new revenue, which is about $36 million less than what the county administrator proposes. And then with the county, if I'm getting this right, Commissioner, it's it, what, what Commissioner Cable is saying is in practical terms, it would be $10 million over the NNR, we would still be under budget because the, the 20 million put us 2 million under budget. So we take, so we'd be $8 million or $7 million under budget. And they want, and, and, and Commissioner Cable would like to earmark that toward the debt, even though we're approving it for m &O, he's saying it's going to be earmarked toward the debt service. And what I think is, I think we do have a, a a realistic proposal, Dave. I mean, if if it's it's a question of the way it's written, it's sort of a semantics situation. Um, so instead of saying we're setting this rate for the debt service, we set it for M and O, but we know we're going to use it for debt service, and so we have two proposals, and we simply need to make both motions, and Available. and the dates remain the same, and we go and move on because it's three thirty. And I really do think we have reached a point of voting. So is Commissioner Gar uh, Commissioner Cagle's uh, document appropriate for voting? It says um, it says that for Harris County, the rate of 0. 0.33030 for maintenance and operations and 0. 0.0443 for debt service. I think that bullet, a, 1A, that needs to be edited, yeah. correct? So what... So why don't we hear from some speakers while well, these edits are made and then we could make both motions. Does that work? That's fine. That I think work. you have something to add, Commissioner Ramsey. Sure. Okay. All right. Uh, so Tiffany, do you have any other speakers? Yes, ma'am. Number 12, Nancy Decker of Cypress Creek Face. She's speaking on COVID-19 item 18. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nancy Decker. Good afternoon. My name is Nancy Decker. I'm the Executive Director of Cypress Creek Foundation for the Arts and Community Enrichment, or FACE. I live and work in the Spring Klein area located in the unincorporated area of Northwest Harris County in Precinct 4. I've lived in the area for over 30 years and worked at Cypress Creek FACE for over 21. Thank you for allowing me to speak today to give you an insight into what it means to be an arts presenter during COVID in an unincorporated area of a county. Cypress Creek Faith was founded in 1997 when the Centrum opened at Cypress Creek Christian Church. We are a 501c3 with a mission to provide cultural arts programming and educational opportunities for the community. We usually employ four people. We are celebrating our 25th season this year. Annually, we served over 15,000 patrons with our concerts, free children's programs, master classes, and summer camp. Our annual budget is just over $500,000 each season. When the pandemic hit, we had to shut down and lay off staff. We had to cancel 18 months of concerts. I've spoken to artists who are barely hanging on, artists with young families and babies on the way. It's been especially difficult for them. They depend on our being able to provide them the opportunity to work. We tried virtual programming that was offered free and requested donations so we could pay the artists. For 427 days until early May 2021, we had no in-person concert. Because we are located in the unincorporated incorporated area of Harris County, our only source for funding is through the Texas Commission on the Arts. When I began at FACE in 2000, the Cultural Arts Council of Houston Harris County was our voice for arts funding. When they closed their doors and it became Houston Arts Alliance, we lost our voice. Their focus became the city of Houston. We felt exiled and alone like a forgotten stepchild. I believe the only mechanism to support the arts in the local, at the local level is the county, the Harris County Commissioner's Court. The American Rescue Plan funds the, count, funds the county is expected to receive, allow for spending on arts and culture, and present the opportunity for the county to support the organizations that support quality of life and economic growth in the unincorporated areas. Our industry was decimated like no other. We don't have drive through options like restaurants or outdoor spaces for social distancing. We have to wait it out until this pandemic is under control.
thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of the arts. I know from experience that we make a positive impact in people's lives, especially with seniors and young children. We lift up hope when it seems hopeless. We need your support and help to continue our mission. There are other members of the arts community in unincorporated Harris County that may not be able to speak today because. Hello, ma'am, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next is speaker number 13, Michelle Bonton. She's speaking on item 18 under COVID-19. Go ahead, please. Greetings, Judge Hidalgo and honorable commissioners. My name is Michelle Bonton, executive director of Harris County Cultural Arts Council. We are the first and only arts and culture organization in our community of more than 40,000 residents. We're located in the unincorporated east part of Precinct 2. Our mission is to improve quality of life through access to the arts for residents in unincorporated Harris County and to use the arts as a tool to promote social equity. I'm here today to urge the court to ensure that funding for the arts in unincorporated Harris County is included in art funding allocations. There were other organizations who planned to speak today, but they're without power and asked me to express their regret. Commissioner Cagle, I'm very aware of your strong support for the arts and bring you greetings from Clara Lewis over at FACE. Commissioner Ellis, I know of your work to expand arts access in our county, and I thank you for that. Commissioner Garcia, don't know if you remember, but you shared stories with me about your arts-related education, and I noted your fondness for those memories. Absolutely. So I think I'm in good company. Uh, good. <laughs> I think I'm in good company as I talk about the importance of the arts, and I thank you for allowing me to speak today. The arts employ tens of thousands of county residents and have an impact on the county economy of more than $1 billion every year. The $57 million the county sees in tax collected from the arts is enough to have paid for all of the drainage projects you mentioned earlier, Commissioner Garcia. Apart from the economic impact, the arts are critical to our mental health because they help us to cope with and make sense out of the challenges and traumas of life. While nearly all industries were impacted by the pandemic, the arts and entertainment industry in our county saw a closure rate that were 26% higher than that of other industries, 57% versus 31%. The unincorporated areas were even hit harder because although nearly 50% of county residents, and that's more than 2 million people, live in the unincorporated areas, and 80% of the county's population growth over the last 10 years has been in the unincorporated areas, there's no governmental mechanism for arts funding for unincorporated Harris County, such as the city has. Further, arts organizations in unincorporated areas are historically marginalized and underserved where arts funding is concerned and are not able to benefit from the funding offered to groups in the city limits. This situation is not equitable and needs to be addressed. I want to urge this honorable court to ensure that the rights of residents in unincorporated Harris County to have access to and benefit from the arts without leaving their community are protected. You have the opportunity to do this by allocating art funds in an equitable manner to include organizations in the unincorporated areas. Art funding is allowed by the art guidelines, will address two of the three broad spending priorities the county has identified, health and jobs, over 35,000 to be exact. And arts funding specifically for unincorporated areas also addresses this court's commitment to equity in the use and allocation of arts funds. Hello, ma'am. Thank you for your time to welcome the partner. Michelle, thank you, thank you for uh, call, thank you for calling and, and weighing in. Um, you know, right now we are contemplating uh, making dramatic reductions in our, in our budget. Hello? Michelle? Michelle? Uh, I'm here, Commissioner. Oh, there you are. Listen, thank I'm you for here. calling. No, no, I'm here. Thank you for calling and weighing in. And we're right now contemplating making uh, uh, reductions in our budget. Uh, it's it's all money. It, it uh, Some of it is in the general fund, which uh, some of this may come from. Uh, some of this is going to be in other areas of operation. But it's all... Uh, it's all part of what we have to think through. So I appreciate you calling and weighing in because what a lot of people don't realize is that arts is um, part of uh, a significant part of our economy. And, um, and you know, our uh, community artists tend to uh, create a lot of, uh, you know, 
jobs and uh, and economic revitalization in some of the underserved areas. And so I really appreciate you weighing in. And so thank you so much, but we're contemplating that right now. So thank you. Commissioner, thank you very much. I appreciate you all's time. Thank you. Next is speaker number 15, DC Derby, speaking on item 18 under COVID-19. Go ahead, please. Look, uh, Commissioner, with all due respect, um, public expenses on on um, art does not create jobs. I think you should correct yourself for the statement. That, that's an insane comment. Um, thank you uh, for your opportunity to speak on this. Um, I'm very much concerned about the um, influx of what are called Afghan refugees who are being spread out across Harris County. Um, Five million dollars for health care use on the on these people. These people are unvetted. We don't know if they're good or bad, if they're part of a terrorist organization themselves or not. Um, I think, unfortunately, um, you know, that we, we have a, a crisis that unfolded in Afghanistan and we've left them with billions of dollars of assets and, and information. And, and those people have connection to these people who are coming here right into Houston and they are infiltrating our, our communities and, um, the judge is uh, responsible for this. And I think that by um, edict, we need to reject anybody coming in who's not legally documented. Uh, same thing with the sex trafficking that's happening with our open border system, that um, they're part of a money laundering organization with uh, Baker Ripley and the, um, the, the other uh, so-called charities. I think that this is a, uh, a cash money laundering organization um, with, and, and, and that the, the court is being a, the running dog of this um, Perkins Coy group uh, who is uh, writing a lot of the legislation and agenda items that are on, that are being proposed using Harris County tax dollars is complete waste. This, um, it's, this is a neo-Marxist uh, regime. And by the way, um, Judge Hidalgo, um, the uh, the translator, uh, please don't um, don't ridicule our commissioners by saying that our their constituents are calling in, um, uh, speaking out against it. They haven't asked us to do anything. Okay, we see what you're up to. We don't like it. Okay, we see who you're aligned with. We don't like it. Okay, this is anti-American. It's anti-Texan. It's anti-Harris County. The people of Harris County don't like it. Okay, so that's why we're calling. I think that, you know, this court, this, this commissioner group is wasting um, millions and millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars of our taxpayer dollars, and it's, and it's unright, okay? So I think we're fed up. I mean, it's talking in, in a health crisis, and we're talking about spending hundreds of millions of dollars on art displays, and oh yeah, by the way, it creates jobs. That's insane. How can and we talk about equity? Equity. The word equity Hello, is a sir, Marxist communist up. word. Oh, thank you so much. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next is speaker number sixteen, David Galvin. He's speaking on item three twenty-seven under Commissioner Precinct Three. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon. I speak on behalf of the canvassing team that was put together to engage in vaccination, vaccination outreach. The whole crux of community outreach and door-to-door -door canvassing is the ability to channel the power of persuasion. There was no better group equipped to persuade than the one assembled for this project. The people recruited and selected for this initiative hold a specific skill set that does not easily transfer to different occupations, nor does it easily translate to different personalities. We have experience going door to door as precinct chairs, as neighbors, census workers, and as volunteers performing necessary and often thankless work to build trust and community. We never know when we will be greeted by a belligerent resident or a hostile dog, but we take that chance anyway. You of all people should know these kind of citizens and this type of civic engagement are in short supply, especially in this climate. Members of this program moved here from out of state because they believed in the urgency of an effort like this and the efficacy of the engagement strategy. Many of the people on this canvassing team took this position as a second job. This court has upended people's lives and their livelihoods. 
getting rid of this vital public health service because of optics or politics is a travesty. It was yielding results. We knocked almost 500 doors and spoke to well over 100 people in just 90 minutes of work on day one. We had assembled what was to be the largest vaccine outreach team in America. Harris County once again had the chance to set the tone for the rest of the country. To reduce such a transformational public service to politics yet again is one more reason why Texas and America are still mired in this deadly pandemic. It's myopic and it's dangerous. To eliminate this program just as it was getting off the ground feels like adding insult to injury, not just for the employees, but to residents of Harris County. This vaccination effort is akin to the national service undertaken by civilians during World War II. We should continue rallying together against our common enemy known as COVID-19 and not against one another. When we're working out there meeting people where they are, we aren't speaking to them as political hacks, but as patriots trying to get this country back to some sense of normal. For the first time since graduating college, I feel like my degree in public affairs and community service was going towards something worthwhile. For the first time, I finally felt like I had a dream job. This court has taken that away from me. We joined this initiative because we believe in it. We don't want to give up on this, and neither should you. You owe it to Harris County to see what we can accomplish. We are qualified to do this work, and this is indeed good and noble work. We want to serve our communities, our city, and our county. Please give us the chance to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Next is speaker number 17, Susan McKinley, and she's also speaking on item 327 under Commissioner Precinct 3. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon. I'm a native Houstonian, a constituent uh, from the Rice military area, and I ask to speak today because I am really fed up with the political sniping um, at every level of the country, but especially at your level. And um, I really don't care which side of the aisle it comes from because, you know, I'm, I, and I'm sure I'm not the only citizen that's really over this this ridiculous behavior. So what I'm asking you to do is please hark back to your discussion earlier in this meeting about compromise. And I want you to strap on some cooperation and consider continuing this vaccine outreach. And what I want you to do is put the people of Harris County number one. Put us first, please, and try to make the county a safer place with this Elevate vaccination canvassing. And, you've, you know, all of you have been elected duly, and you represent the entire population of the county. So whether a citizen voted for you or not, each and every one deserves your efforts to protect them and serve their best interest. And if this whole effort for canvassing turns out to be a big success, is one person going to get credit? No. All of you will get credit. So instead of trying to micromanage about the subcontractors or niggle about other issues, you know, get someone, I'm sure you have some kind of uh, team in, in place that can do audits. Let them handle it, because I don't want to see this related to votes or political careers. It is about lives. And I'm a vaccinated person, but I just want to see the day when I can stop worrying constantly about getting infected, being hospitalized, or keep hearing about all the people who've died from this virus. And, you know, our country is supposed to be about the quiet enjoyment of life, and that's something we should all aspire to and try to achieve. So I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you to pull together and do what public servants are meant to do. Just look after your people. You know, let this vaccination canvassing effort proceed and, you know, here's a novel idea. It could be a really shining example to the rest of the country about bipartisan cooperation. Yeah, you know, I think it's something that you can do, and I implore you to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next is speaker number 18, Elena Marks of Episcopal Health Foundation. She's speaking on item 327 under Commissioner 3 and 372 under Supplemental COVID-19 Items. Go ahead, please. Thanks very much. This is Elena March, and I'm the president and CEO of the Episcopal Health Foundation. I address my comments to the need for funding for grassroots, community-based organizations to accelerate vaccine uptake throughout the county 
and I want to offer an invitation to the county to take advantage of infrastructure developed by a statewide coalition of foundations to accomplish this result. I don't have any opinions of Elevate Strategies contract, uh, not trying to get a contract from the county. My reason for speaking is solely in the interest of increasing vaccine uptake in the county. While the vaccine rates have seen an uptick recently, Harris County is still well below the level that most experts say we need to achieve to protect our people and our economy. We know that there's still pockets of people in the county who for a variety of different reasons have not yet decided to get vaccinated. Foundations across the state came together earlier this year to form Your Shot Texas. It's a collaborative aimed at getting funds into the hands of community groups who could help bridge the confidence gap that some communities are experiencing and also could connect or navigate those people to vaccinations. We developed the fund to complement the efforts of the health healthcare system and the public health system and governmental entities who we knew would be active in promoting vaccines as they have been. We knew that there were a lot of residents who would not be reached or not be persuaded by the health system or the government but they might be open if approached by known trusted people and organizations. Our aim has been to get funding into the hands of those groups whose pre-existing relationships with communities because we believe that those trusted relationships are critical to building the confidence and ultimately increasing the vaccine rates. The Your Shot Texas funders in Houston include uh, Episcopal Health Foundation, the Cullen Trust for Healthcare, Arnold Ventures, the Cullen Foundation, Houston Endowment, and the Rockwell Fund. Uh, with our statewide partners, we've raised a few million dollars. We've awarded 12 grants in June. We're announcing another 23 grants next week for a total of about a little over $2 million. Our fund is administrated by the, administered by the Community Foundation. We've also assisted Texas A&M in awarding grants to CBOs. A&M received $10 million of federal money. It was passed through to them through the State Health Department, DSHS, uh, also for the purpose of increasing vaccine confidence and uptake. Your Shot Texas provided administrative support to the A&M team as they were establishing their run, and we provided staff from our participating foundations to review grant applications received by A&M. Hello, ma'am. Your time is up. Judge, do we does she get three minutes per item? Um, sure, I guess so. that's how we said we do it today. We'll adopt the rules, which I think say something different. But today, yes. Okay. I, I just have a sentence more. It's just to, to offer if, if you're interested in using the infrastructure of your shot Texas to get funds out the door, um, we can do that for you and would be happy to discuss that. This is what private philanthropy has been doing statewide uh, for the last several months. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, next we have right. number 20, Noelle McSherry. She's speaking on item 327 under commissioner precinct three. Go ahead, please. Hello, my name is Noelle McSherry, and I am here because I want to um, share that I feel the vaccine outreach is working, and I feel that um, putting a delay in right now um, would be costly in terms of lives. Um, each one of you is an elected official, so I am sure each one of you has experience with block walking and having volunteer block walkers and possibly paid block walkers working for you to get you elected. You know the importance of having these conversations with um, your potential voters and the fact that a face-to-face -face conversation is sometimes the thing that's needed um, to convince someone to take the action. Um, in the case of um, working with uh, voters, getting them to vote for you, but in the case of vaccines, working with them to get the vaccine. We need our population vaccinated to protect our children and to protect our immunocompromised community members. So I am very concerned that you would be um, looking at an organization that is focused on these block walks and choosing to delay or take away the contract. We don't have time. 
Time is of the essence right now, and I will say again, we are talking about lives. How much is a life worth to you? We need people vaccinated. These block walks are working, and we are finally up and getting good results. So the fact that there is now some quibbles about the process really concerns me when time is of the essence. That is everything I wanted to say. I support the vaccine outreach program and keeping it running for as long as we need to to get our community vaccinated. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Next is speaker number 23, Amber Boyd. She's speaking on item 327 under Commissioner 3. Go ahead, please. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon, Judge Hidalgo and the Commissioner's Court. Uh, my name is Amber Boyd, and I'm a lawyer um, running a small law firm in Harris County. Um, Judge Hidalgo, I understand you ran on a poor platform of transparency and hope, and I don't believe that what has transpired with the Elevate strategy should dilute that nor take away from the hard work and service you've provided to Harris County. However, what transpired with Elevate Strategies is a minor issue that highlights a major problem that Harris County has with its procurement process. I am concerned with the following. Number one, no one knew the amount of the contract. How is this possible? Further, will there be a new way to address this discrepancy? Number two, if the procurement process fails for a large vendor like UT, what about small companies like mine? How can we be sure this has not occurred before? Number three, Elevate strategy should never have been part of the process. The requirements were, were waived to allow this vendor to participate makes the procurement process look like a joke. Number four, UT has, was denied because of past project performance, and, and, and that doesn't pass the SNF test because if that standard was always used, we, would have, we wouldn't have the same vendor for all these years to collect our delinquent tax, property taxes. Number five, I've, I've, I am also highly offended by a prominent local newspaper indicating this, in this in incident reflects on the NWBE program. Many NWBEs were qualified to apply, but were not given a chance. Number six, in the 185 years of Harris County has existed, um, has there ever been an evaluation that included multiple members from the, the county judge's office? Number number seven, I've been here multiple. I've been here for multiple meetings, um, pointing out Harris County's procurement process issues, and this incident only only amplifies that this problem. Today we are counseling a contract because Harris County got its hands caught in a cookie jar. However, instead of just canceling contract, we we need to correct the procurement process. And I, I so do my time. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you so much. Next is speaker number 21, Diana Alexander. She's also speaking on item 327 under Commissioner Precinct 3. Go ahead, please. Hello, this is Diana Alexander, and I'm calling to um, speak about the um, continuation of the vaccine outreach efforts in Harris County. Uh, this contract was voted on in the June 8th meeting, and it was clearly labeled in the agenda that um, the uh, award was going to, it was going to be approved, I'm sorry, voted on um, to see if uh, um, Elevate was going to be awarded the contract based on their per proposal um, submission. <clears throat> and so it was very clear that that a uh, vote was going to happen at that June 8th meeting, and uh, proposals were um, announced in March. So uh, I understand that Commissioner uh, Ramsey has um, taken issue with this vote being unclear, but um, since the bid process began in March, his office had ample time to do their due diligence on researching other options. Um, and if you look at the website for Precinct 3, it's not like there's information on um, vaccines, on um, health options in time of a pandemic, or anything regarding public health that would be um, suitable for our circumstances. So I kind of find it hard to believe that the commissioner is 
really focused on finding solutions um, on this issue. Um, so we have this opportunity to pursue a novel and innovative way to overcome vaccine hesitancy, and that can bring enormous value in terms of public health um, and relieving strain on medical care infrastructure during this pivotal time uh, with the onset of the Delta uh, variant. <clears throat> to explain more in detail, the outreach team of approximately 50 canvassers uses data from county health officials to target vulnerable communities with low vaccination rates to have those person-to-person -person interactions to answer questions and allay fears. Once again, Harris County has an opportunity to be a leader in terms of meeting public needs under very dire circumstances. This program is already making a difference with hundreds of people having those crucial conversations about the vaccine and COVID-19. Please do not cancel this vaccine canvassing program. It is a worthwhile effort, and I suggest an examination of the data already collected will support its continuation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Next is speaker number 19, Andrew Mead of Mead and Nice. He's speaking on item 327 under Commissioner 3 and 372 under Supplemental COVID-19 items. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Judge and Commissioners. Again, my name is Andrew Mead. I am an attorney speaking on behalf of Elevate Strategies, LLC. And I'm speaking on agenda items 327 and 372. I'm not clear whether I have three minutes or six minutes, but I'm going to get right to it. You have six. Uh, first, so I we're, want... That's what we're doing okay. with speakers. Um, I, I appreciate that, Judge. I wanted to commend the commissioners and judge uh, yourself on the uh, targeted community vaccine outreach program uh, with the goals of educating vaccine hesitant population in Harris County about the availability, efficacy, and safety of the vaccine. Uh, I think you, you all were uh, tasked with an emergency where lives were at stake. The commissioner's court should be commended for taking swift action in a meaningful action to stem the spread of COVID-19 in Harris County and otherwise protect the health of the citizens. Uh, I want to address a few items. The program, and despite a lot of uh, media attention that it's recently gotten, went through proper procedures and the best candidate won uh, through those procedures. The program and its facilitation required a contractor capable of engaging in targeted messaging that is reaching out to the vaccine hesitant population in Harris County with effective messaging. That is providing information that would be persuasive to the particular audience and sources that would be in uh, authoritative and informative for that audience. The county uh, published its RFP, but received responses from only four candidates and narrowed it down pretty quickly to UT Health and Elevate. UT Health was disqualified uh, in part because it had not satisfactorily performed under other existing contracts with Harris County, including COVID contracts, and that's the Harris Saves program. Uh, Elevate, on the other hand, which is a woman and minority uh, Hispanic-owned uh, business, won because it had the best proposal and because it was highly qualified to do the particular task at issue. That is target, targeted and effective community messaging. This is an Elevate's first governmental contract, and the proof is in Elevate's performance under the prior contracts and under this contract, including its effective participation in the 2020 census for both Harris and Fort Bend counties, and its effective participation in rolling out a large portion of the COVID or the uh, Hurricane Harvey relief funds. Now, I believe as Commissioner Ramsey, uh, you had about 10 points under agenda item 327. I've got about three minutes left. I think that would break down to about 18 seconds per point. I probably don't have time to go over each of them, but what I would do is shortcut uh, that by saying this. Uh, myself uh, and Elevate will meet with anyone at any time that they would like to go over what Elevate's qualifications are to carry out this contract, what the plan and process is for carrying out the contract, and what its performance to date and uh, has been and will be. Uh, before uh, terminating this contract, 
I think the commissioners should ask those questions uh, and get real answers to them, not just asking them rhetorically. What are the qualifications? What's the plan and process? And how has the performance been so far? And what will it be going forward? Uh, Harris County, uh, through the commissioners and, and through you, Judge, have put together a good plan for an important purpose. It will literally save lives. Uh, right now, there is no other entity that is ready, willing, and able and prepared as Elevate is to launch the program tomorrow. Elevate uh, can literally uh, uh, be prepared to canvas tomorrow as well as its overall program of over 150,000 unique door knocks, over 2.7 million planned phone calls, over 4.5 million planned mailers, over 2.7 million targeted text messages, and over 20 million digital imprints and ads, all, all ready to launch and ready to go. Elevate has 15 employees currently specifically hired uh, to carry out this task and another 35 plus ready for onboarding to carry out these tasks. Uh, Elevate is ready to go. We're under an emergency, and when the RFP was initially issued, uh, the emergency's only gotten worse with the Delta variant and the, and the Mu variant of, of COVID. Uh, before the contract with the right qualified company that's ready to go is terminated, I think the commissioners and judge should look at whether they've got anybody else ready to go. And, and right now, there isn't anyone else to. Um, I, I would encourage uh, anyone who has uh, sincere questions um, to meet with myself or with others from Elevate so that we can answer those questions or, or to ask them now if you'd like to. You, you have done a great service for Harris County in putting this program together. It would be a disservice to Harris County to terminate it without uh, being sure that there's someone in place uh, to properly carry out the program. It would effectively mean abandoning the program or hiring somebody else which will lead to a period of delay, inevitably, during which more people will get sick, more people will die. Again, I wanna thank you for the time. I wanna thank you for putting the program together as a citizen of Harris County. I invite you to ask me or elevate any questions that you have. Thank you, thank you. Next is speaker number 22, Shannon Heindel. Speaking on item 327 under Commissioner Precinct 3 and 346 under Transmittal. Go ahead, please. Hi, Commissioner. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. While I understand what the gentleman before me was speaking about, he's obviously being paid by a company to promote his ideas that he wants to get this award, right? I disagree with it. First of all, these people call and they don't stop calling. So no matter how much you're asking them to quit, they continue to call you repeatedly, no matter if you're working or not. That's frustrating to receive nonstop telephone calls and text messages for something what I myself don't agree with. It's a waste of funds. Our homeless people that you have downtown, you could be taken care of so much better. We can't I can even walk safely with my child without having someone stop me every two feet asking for money. There's $11 million. Everybody's educated at this point. We're not stupid, and we don't need for you to do more propaganda to us, more shoving things down our throat. What we need is for you to start helping our homeless and our vets and cleaning up our city. Make it respectable again, because right now it's a dive and it's a shame that it looks the way it does. So I disagree with that. And when you have to pay people $100 to try to convince them to come forward to get a vaccination, there's something wrong with this. Again, funds can be spent so much better to help our community. And it's not by putting it into some company who's going to harass people, who's going to send nonstop messages, who's going to disobey the FDA law or the federal government law on the do not disturb list. And that's a waste of funds. I, I just disagree with that. I also have a problem with your... Um, the number 350 that you have on there for the services, but people get, well, but you know what, I'm going to go right to number 359 instead with regard to the given, you know, health care for refugees and immigrants. Absolutely not. Our federal government already announced a week and a half ago that they've already got them on their health care. There is no reason why any of our money needs to go to anybody else other than our residents, the homeless community, and helping them out first. Let's clean up our own mess before we worry about what the federal government's making a mess even more for us with. Other than that, that's really, you know, 
I, I disagree with them even coming into our community. We don't have enough room the way it is. We are overpacked, and it's time that everyone starts to stop looking at what the news is saying and look at our community as a whole and think about our community and what do we want to do to make it better for us, not for the rest of the world, but for us. What can we do with this over homeless population? What can we do to help them out? What can you got an extra hundred dollars? Great. I am for you taking that $100 and giving it to each and every single homeless person, not to try to force them into a vaccination, but to help them to get off their feet. Let's think about being decent human beings first before we worry about all this other propaganda you're trying to shove down everybody's throats. But that's all I really had to say, and I really wish in my opinion my vote would matter with you guys. I do thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Commissioner, I take it the uh, tax rates are not done yet? The proposals? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay, so let's keep hearing from the speakers. Judge, um, I'm not sure if the in-person speaker is still there, Marissa Littell. Littell, she had a few more items that she wanted to speak on. No, she's not here anymore. Okay, we're still trying to reach some more speakers. A lot of them are having power issues, and so they're not being able to speak today. So I will let you know when we get some more speakers on the line. Okay. Um, well, we are down two. Yeah, I guess so. So let's break till 420. All right, thank you. It's, it's 424 and Commissioner Scott is back in session. Uh, Alex sent an email to everyone's team with the updated tax language. So, uh, Tiffany, does it work if we if we go to taxes for a minute? Oh, thank you. We have some speakers on the line, Judge. Oh, okay. All right. How many do you have on the line right now? Um, we have all the rest of the ones that we were able to reach. All right. So, number thirty-five under agenda related, Hans. Wait, uh, hang on, Tiffany. The, the concern is, I know Dave needs to publish this sooner rather than later. So, so that's why I wanted to know if it's a lot. Okay. Then let me just go ahead and finish. Let us try and and crank through this. So, okay. Just, yeah. So, okay. So, we'll be efficient. So the tax, the tax. Um, everybody should have gotten the uh, language. And essentially, these th these are the motions. Um, Commissioner Garcia had made two motions. One is directing BMD and engineering to develop contingency CIP that assumes significant loss in the county's ability to borrow. That motion would stand. The other motion um, to direct budget management and the real estate division to develop a list of county properties with a high market value that do not presently serve functions related to justice and public safety with a focus on properties in areas of current high population growth for presentation October 12th for determination of which pro properties would be placed in the market for sale. That motion stands. Those are the additional motions Commissioner Garcia had and made. I'll second all. There's other, I got it. There's other, um, but in lieu of the, the motions with the specific tax rate numbers, they would be as follows. Two, two proposed sets of tax rates. The first proposed set of tax rates is as follows. This is the one that um, the county administrator first proposed. For Harris County, the rate of 0 0.33500 for maintenance and operations, and the rate of 0 0.04193 for debt service, for a total tax rate of 0 0.37693. For the Harris County Flood Control District, the rate of 0 0.02599 for maintenance and operations and the rate of 0 0.00750 for debt service for a total tax rate of 0 0.03349. For the Harris County Hospital District, the rate of 0 0.16497 for maintenance and operations and the rate of 0 0.00174 for debt service for a total tax rate of 0 0.16671. For the Port of Houston Authority of Harris County, a debt service rate of 0 0.00872. And for all Harris County entities, a total tax rate of 0 0.58585. The second proposed set of tax rates, these are the ones Commissioner Cagle proposed, are as follows. For Harris County, the rate of 0 0.33280 for maintenance and operations and 0 0.04193 for debt service 
for a total tax rate of 0.37473. For the Harris County Flood Control District, the rate of 0.02599 for maintenance and operations and 0.00750 for debt service for a total tax rate of 0.03349. For the Harris County Hospital District, the maintenance and operations rate of 0.15636 and 0.00174 for debt service for a total tax rate of 0.1581. For the Port of Houston Authority, a debt service rate of 0 0.00872. And for all Harris County entities, a total tax rate of 0 0.57504. Secondly, we need to make a motion to set the dates and times for the following meeting so that the public can provide input on each of these two proposed sets of tax rates. A public hearing on September 21st, 2021 at 1 p.m. for discussion of the proposed rates for Harris County the Harris County Flood Control District, the Harris County Hospital District, and the Port of Houston Authority of Harris County, and a meeting to adopt rates for all taxing units on September 20th, 2021 at 10 a.m. And there would be an understanding that the, uh, under Commissioner Cagle's proposal, that the, that the um, maintenance and operations uh, amount would also go to debt service. Yes. I did want to ask, on September 21st, I did a hearing. We have the jury assembly room, the El Franco League assembly room opening at 3 p.m. If we meet at 1, depends on how many people testify, we may not be out of here. So I'm wondering, do we have to meet at 1? Is that by law? Could we meet earlier that morning? I just say for none of us to be there for uh, that dedication of the jury assembly room. So my question is, do we have to meet at 1 that day? Is it a problem if we meet that morning? We I may still be meeting at 1. The times that worked for everyone um the public hearing we could break okay if it goes long i'm just right. low i just like to, people yeah, went through our, the schedule okay I'll, I'll leave regardless but you know so is there a motion for all of that second so there's a motion by commissioner garcia second by commissioner ellis uh, all in, yeah. i got a question yes i'm going to ask it one more time so we're having a public hearing on the 21st to consider for the public to give input on two rights. Is that correct? Correct. Because there's two proposals. So then we will meet on the 28th and pick one of these. That's my understanding, Dave. Yes, I mean, that's correct. Yeah, you can only, yeah, I'm sorry, sorry, Josh. Well, technically, you guys are also noticing the no new revenue, right? And the, and the, uh, well, what all goes into the notice, Jay? Sure. So, so the notice has, has, normally you would have three options. You would have the proposed rate, the no new rate, or the voter approved rate. Those are the three options that you would have. And then you would make a decision based on those three. What we're essentially doing is, is a, is a fourth option which in this case would be the, uh, the a, 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 there would be essentially two proposed rates. Uh, the one that was initiated by Commissioner Garcia, the other one that was initiated by Commissioner Cagle. So you're really having an option of four. So to Commissioner Ramsey's point, um, it's not essentially a single rate. It's, there's normally an option of three. Now there'll be an option of four. So we will go to the meeting on the 28th, uh, voted by a majority of people in the room uh, on one of those rights, and we don't know which one. Is that correct? Yes, yes, the, the court will pick a rate at that time. Commissioner Cagle. For the purposes, I don't think anybody wants the voter approval rate. I've not heard anybody say that they want the voter approval rate. Um, does that have to still be noticed? I know that the no new revenue rate does have to be noticed, but does the voter approval rate have to also be noticed? Yes, the notice requirement has requires, it's actually very, the statute is very prescriptive in that we have to specifically list all three of those options um, and then you, you, would, you would vote on it. So that's, that's essentially uh, has to be in there. And the flood control proposal is the voter approval rate for both proposals, for both options. Yes, Commissioner Ellis. I, I just want to make sure that in terms of trying to make sure the cards on the table. First, Dave, can you just in rough numbers give us 
what the cut will be under each one of these and when there is no cut. I'm guessing the, the new proposal that's added will mean that we will have uh, uh, it will, that will be an additional $20 million. Is that about right? So it'll be a $47 million hole instead of a $67 million hole. I'll just walk through it. Let you walk through it just so we know what numbers we're talking about. The uh, so I'm, I'm comparing the two proposals from com, uh, the, the motions originally proposed by Commissioner Garcia and Commissioner Cagle, and now we're bringing them both into this one motion. So uh, the budget shortfall under the um, for the county from going to the no new revenue rate would be uh, just over 20 million, and that if with Commissioner Cagle, Cagle's proposal would remain if that money is used to pay off debt because it's not covering m and uh, Under the um, flood control rate, uh, the, the difference between the no new revenue rate and the, the rate that's in both of these proposals is $17 million. And then uh, in the hospital district, the um, difference is right at $40 million. And um, I do think it's important that we hear from the hospital district on uh, what it means for them. Uh, I also think it's important that we have some understanding, uh, Mr. Ayer, on how many people have to be in the room for the meeting on the 21st and how many people would have to be in the room when we actually vote on setting the rate and what the consequences are. Sure, so so for the hearing itself, the statute only requires You might've hit mute. Okay, so mute. Say it again, you went on mute a second, I'm sorry. I, I, I can't, I'm frozen. <laughs> um, let me see if I can. Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, can you, okay. Um, um, so for the, for the public hearing, um, only three members of the court need to be present. For the, uh, for the actual adoption of the vote, four members need to be present. Okay. And then, Jay, just to make sure I'm sure, and if we don't know, if we're going to test your law, then let me know. When we actually want to pick whichever option we're going to go with, do four people have to be present the constitutional quorum to start the meeting, and then we conduct our business and take whatever action that a majority of the court decides on, or do four people have to be present for the vote on each of these, shall we say the Ramsey Cagle proposal and the Garcia proposal? I just want to know. And if we don't, if the law is not clear, tell us that. I just want, I want to know and I want them to know, do they have to be in the, we have to, four of us have to be in the room on each separate vote or just to establish a quorum for that day of four people. Um, I, I'll go back and, 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 and make sure a hundred percent, but in the past it has been four people must be there for the vote. So it, it constitutes a quorum in the same way that the three members constitute a quorum. So, um, but I, I will, I will go ahead and verify that and, and have an answer for you. Um, and Judge, if I might, one, one last point to just make sure I'm clear. I'm treating it as if I was still in the legislature. There were times when people would say, we want to let you make your case, even if you don't have the votes. Make a motion, go down, and then the budget comes up. People might you know, try to amend the budget or whatever. Uh, but we need to have some understanding because when we sequencing these of what we vote on, if I don't have a vote on the Garcia motion, I'm for that. I still will be in the room and sequence it on how we're going to vote on it. So do we vote? I'm willing to concede. I said earlier, instead of voting on this one first, on the Garcia motion first, where well, maybe there are three votes, I don't know. I'm more than happy to let you all vote on yours first. But if we vote on your motion first and you don't have three votes and then we vote on the second one under what he said earlier, he's going to research it. 
and four people are not in the room. Then we go to the worst case scenario. We just ought to know that. Well, I, I don't, I, I think the only way, I'm just, just being clear, the only way that, that there could be any uh, clear understanding of what's going to happen on the 28th is if you walk out of here today with one right, not two rights. So if you walk out of here today with one right, it's pretty clear what we're voting on on the 28th. And so when you when you think about uh, how many people is going to be there and all the other questions that come into play on that day on the 28th, the only way that you're going to know that is whether we're voting on one. And right now we're voting on two. Well, we, I respectfully disagree with you a little bit. Is what I'm saying is, if the interpretation of the law is that you, Commissioner Ramsey, have to be in the room, I'm asking you, if you don't get your way, are you saying you won't be in the room when we vote on the Garcia one? That's, that's essentially what I'm asking. Well, I mean, it's a lot of times. It's like you told me, Commissioner Ellis. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's time to vote three, two. And I've been told that uh, any number of times all year. And, and what we do know is that we need four people in the room to vote on a tax rate on the 28th. And if we, walk, if we walk into that room with two options, I'm pretty sure I know how that's going to end up, end up being. So I'm saying the, if, if you started this whole conversation earlier, clarity, certainty, transparency, so I've tried to be all of that. So there is a rate on the table. Mr. Garcia has proposed one. We propose two. But the only way that we're certain in terms of what we're voting on, uh, all of us, is if we walk into that room with one right. So I think we're going in circles, and we, we haven't even gone to the agenda. Yeah. We, I think we, I've, I've made my point. Look, I, I I'm going to be here regardless of what people, people, unless I'm dead. I'll be here. Well, I think I made my point pretty clear, too. Okay. Well, okay. Yes, Commissioner King. A variant of what Commissioner Garcia was saying, Jay and Dave, if we come in on the 28th and there's not a quorum, what is the last date that a vote can be taken? And could there be enough time to notice just the flood control? piece to where because we're all in agreement on flood control and it may be that using your phrase sequencing we could sequence the flood control at a different time and i'll just say i'm not I, i'm not okay with having more than one meeting yeah. so I, and so that so I, I just think we all everybody has a slightly different perspective but if we take the lowest common denominator we need one meeting and two proposals, because that's what covers everybody. It, it just, you it's know. Just, I agree, and I think we've discussed it. And how's it? Yeah, no, okay. Commissioner Cagle wants his proposal. Commissioner Garcia wants his proposal. I want one meeting. I want one meeting. <laughs> so, you know, if you have five meetings, I'm not showing up. How about that? I agree with that. I'll be alive. So, I'll have to do away so, so Can we vote on this, on what I read, and move on? And and just to be clear, the voter rate is not an option. It just has to, by statute has to be published, correct? Uh, that, that's my understanding. Is that it has to be published in the newspaper? But certainly, if we, if this motion as proceed, as proposed were to proceed, my marching orders would be to prepare an agenda that notices possible adoption of those two options and not anything else. Got it. Uh, and Jay, will... Jay, do you agree with that? That's correct. Yeah, it just the item just needs to be no, noticed. Nothing. No, you don't actually have to take that vote. And just, just for clarity, I'm not voting on two rights. So if there was a right on there, we could vote. I'm not voting on two rights. Okay. So, so let's uh, get the motions. And judge, if these yeah. motions are broad enough, so, like if we want Dr. Porsa asking any questions, no impact on, on that budget during a pandemic, all of that can be discussed when we meet. Yeah, we can okay. discuss when we So, So then let me make the proposals again and let's vote on each set of rates separately so you can only vote on one of them. Is that what you're saying, Commissioner Ramsey? Uh, it, this motion is to adopt two rates 
so that Mr. Berry can go publish two rates. Yeah. What I'm saying, I'm not supporting publishing these. So you'll vote two no. Right. Right. I'm saying it. Let me so I will just vote. He's still going to vote no. no. Right. Oh, so you're just going to vote no on the whole thing. Okay. So, um, because I can also take them separately, but okay. So we, we have a motion. James is clear on the motion. Judge, I just want to make sure is Commissioner Garcia's other additional motions included on this, or is that going to be taken separately? The directing budget management to, and the engineer to develop a potential contingency capital improvement plan. Is that included in this? Yeah, that was in my original motion. It, it shouldn't harm. It shouldn't harm. It shouldn't harm this. You could do that as a question? request. I think that that was a request, yeah. and Jay already said that it's just a transmittal, and they're going to do it for you. So this, it does not have to be quite a motion. So those just, are no, not right. motions. Okay. Disregards. So the the only the only motions are there's a motion on the first proposed set of tax rates. There's a motion on the second proposed set of tax rates, and there's a motion to set the date and times for for two meetings. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so Commissioner Garcia made the motion. Second. And Commissioner Ellis made the second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. No. Uh, okay, uh, so I'm in favor, and the motion carries. Three to two. More speakers? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Speaker number 35, Hans Martisuic, speaking on item 369 under supplemental items. Martisuic. Martisuic. Uh, good afternoon, Judge, Commissioners. Now, I just tell you this after listening to all that for the last 10 minutes, I feel sorry for you all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Look, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Uh, I, I'm just surprised that. Uh, after this PFM study uh, that and the soaring crime rate that, that we're dealing with in the county and, and the city of Houston right now, that you'd even attempt such an endeavor that I believe could negatively impact law enforcement and the delivery of police services to the community. Uh, what's even more surprising is that you, you're doing this after the backlash that you all experienced the last time. You attack what I believe is probably the, arguably the most community oriented policing agencies we have in the county. Uh, I, I realize, you know, we want things to the city, the county, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I think it'd be that money, that half million dollars spent on this study might have been better uh, spent reorganizing and bringing back the recruiting division in the, in the sheriff's office rather than having HR run it, which apparently is what they're currently doing. I don't know if you're all aware of this number or not, but between uh, June 24th and September 3rd, the separation report shows 70 people leaving. Out of that 70 people, only 11 are retiring. The other 59 are heading to greener pasture somewhere. So uh, it, it's anyway, that, that, that's, it's an issue and, it, and it's a problem. And, and the reality is, I don't think this is any time to experiment with public safety or the careers or lives of over 1,600 dedicated hard and hardworking deputy constables. You might ask the deputy constables that over the last month have been shot at, attacked with a knife, and run over while providing law enforcement services. You might ask them what they think about your plan and the second class status of law enforcement that you apparently believe they are. I'm uh, guessing they might have a different opinion. I would just encourage you to reconsider this, this decision. Uh, even the best, even those decisions made with the best of intentions can have unintended consequences. And with what's going on in today's society right now, we don't need any more unintended consequences. So I appreciate you giving me a few minutes to speak. Thank you, Thank you so Hans. Good to hear you. All right. Thank you all. Be safe. Next is speaker number five under non-agenda related, Joy Davis at the Texas Organizing Project. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I would like to respectfully disagree. Uh, law enforcement, uh, they're not treated as second class citizens. Um, thank you. My name is Joy Davis. Um, 
Thank you, County Judge Lena Hidalgo and County Commissioners. Uh, I'm a member of the Harris County leadership team with the Texas Organizing Project. I'm also a constituent residing in Precinct 1. I'm here to speak about the appointment of the Sheriff by Commissioner's Court if Sheriff Gonzalez is chosen as the next director of ICE. The criminal justice system is designed to increase mass deportations, over-policing, and mass incarceration. In Harris County, we currently have a progressive sheriff, and we need to continue with that trend. I urge the Harris County Commissioner's Court to appoint a new sheriff that is committed to policies and principles that make Harris County safer, fairer, and more equitable. And the next sheriff must commit to maintaining and expanding the Harris County Jail Population Dashboard, um, and also promptly and you know promptly and responding to Public Information Act requests and other requests for information from community stakeholders, disability rights organizations, civil rights organizations, and immigrant rights uh, advocates to ensure transparency in the sheriff's office enforcement actions. Finally, all camera footage and critical incidents, including in custody deaths, use of force and shooting should be released promptly to the public. Uh, Harris County continues to be a significant driver of the deportation pipeline with the highest number of ICE arrests and detainers in the country. Uh, the Harris County Sheriff's Office must prioritize local needs and strive to limit its involvement in federal immigration programs and practices to the fullest extent permitted by state and federal law. And lastly, our top membership strongly feels you should remove the ability for ICE to have an office in the Harris County Jail. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Next is speaker number seven under non-agenda related. Sonequa McQueen of TOP. Go ahead, Good please. afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone from Harris County Commissioner's Court. I thank you for the opportunity to let me speak today. Um, yes, we're speaking about our topic in regards to selection of the sheriff. We urge the Harris County Commissioner's Court to appoint a new sheriff that is committed to policies and principles that make Harris County healthier, fairer, and more equitable. We reiterate our demands that we have been demanding since this process began. We demand for a new Harris County Sheriff to be committed to reimagining public safety. The prevalence of law enforcement violence and its tragic results have sparked widespread and justified outrage. Police violence is a leading cause of death for young men of color in America, especially black men. The time for continued mourning and vague promises of reform is over. We need accountability and immediate action. Our second demand, a comprehensive view of community safety, where the size, scope, and role of their departments is reduced and reinvested in areas like housing, education, mental health, and health care, especially in black and brown communities. We also seek transparency. The next year must be committed to maintaining and expanding the jail dashboard. In addition, general orders and other internal policies should be published on the sheriff website and open to the public. Further, the next sheriff must commit to promptly, fully, and in good faith respond to public information act requests and other requests for information from community stakeholders, civil rights organizations, and immigrant rights advocates to ensure transparency in the sheriff's office enforcement actions. Finally, all camera footage and critical incidents, including in custody deaths, uses of force, and shooting should be released to the public promptly. Nextly, we request minimizing unnecessary contact with the criminal punishment system. Our next year must understand and be strongly committed to maximizing community-led pre-booking diversion and harm reduction intervention, interventions, such as the law enforcement assisted diversion, everyone with, integ with dignity act. We ask that y'all move forward and consider our demands when you're considering uh, making a, a decision on the sheriff. And finally and lastly, we ask that a, a vocal and strong proponent of defendants' constitutional rights to due process and access to legal representation be emphasized by the sheriff. Sheriff Gonzalez was an outspoken supporter of misdemeanor bail reform. The next sheriff must be committed to ensuring 
the people are not detained. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for calling in. Thank you. Judge? Yes. Um, just a, as a point of clarification, I know Elizabeth is trying to um, prepare the notice for purposes of our advertising. Is it was was an act? I know a vote was taken on Commissioner Garcia's, and that vote was three two on on that that tax rate. Was there an actual formal vote taken on uh, Commissioner Cagle's motion? And the reason is is that we actually have to list that vote in the notice requirement itself. Yes, we we voted for both of them together, and okay. both of them was three two. Okay, excellent. Thank you. I, I apologize. Yeah. Yeah. You you took a one we took one vote for both options. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Thank you. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Next is speaker number eleven under non-agenda related, Darla Johnson Underwood. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, please. All right, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. So um, I had a few uh, items I wanted to address, uh, management budgets, uh, committees, and purchasing. So first of all, as a uh, taxpayer, I wanted to know who picked the three individuals from your office to serve on um, the committee specifically related to health care issues. Uh, how do you ensure that for any committee that your office is involved in, uh, where either federal dollars or local funds are spent, that qualified committee members with the appropriate experience in that field are designated? You know, it's our hope that you, uh, going forward, that you look at and communicate a policy concerning your employees and friends, and more importantly, political allies serving on committees where substantial budgets are allocated. Uh, secondly, uh, this process was simply fraud. I mean, on the citizens of Harris County by commissioner court, who provides the oversight, who, who provides the oversight to commissioner uh, court? Political operatives with ties to members of the commissioner's court with no operational capacity should not be getting rich off the taxpayer. Have you, the commissioner's court, launched an investigation um, into this matter? Will this court ask an outside agency such as the FBI or Attorney General of Texas to investigate corruption in this matter? Canceling a crime as a unilateral decision is not good enough. I ask that as a taxpayer, for any of the commissioners to address this sh issue as an agenda item for the next commissioner's court meeting. And lastly, with respect to purchasing, let's address fairness and transparency. Supposedly a committee evaluates a RFP. Of course, in this case, we have suspicions even of that, uh, even of the scoring results. A contract is awarded to a company, then the chief of staff of a member of the court decides to call the procurement person and cancel the winning bid. In this case, on an unsafe uh, claim of tardiness on a separate, uh, separate may, may be related, maybe not contract. So um, if the chief of staff of any of these commissioner court members here can call and disqualify a winner, what's the purpose of the bidding process? Is this uh, just a game to show a fair bidding process? What do these court members and the public do any of you have when your office decides to cancel? A Hello, ma'am. Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Next is speaker number eight under non-agenda related, Iris House of the Texas Organizing Project. Go ahead, please. Hello, Judge Herbergo and the County Commission. It's a pleasure to be here today. Again, my name is Iris House and I am a member of the Texas Organizing Project known as TOP here in Harris County. 
as an active member in our local rights to justice campaign, I know that accountability is, is a major critical component to making sure that there is healthy uh, trust among the citizens and the law enforcement with the community and that, that they're supposed to protect and uh, serve. That is why we continue to urge you all to on this court to listen to all working class communities and taking into account of our needs when selecting the next sheriff. Whomever this person ends up being, they absolutely have to be committed, committed to policies and principles that will make Harris County, Harris County healthier, fairer, and more equitable. We need the new sheriff to be a supporter of the remaining public safety, to re-image public safety to better serve our communities and keep Harris County residents safe. Enhance transparency. We must have transparency. That means all camera footage in critical incidents, including in custody deaths, use of force, and shootings that we continue to keep seeing every day should be released to the public promptly, not no long wait. In addition, the new sheriff has to be a supporter of minimizing unnecessary contact with criminal punishment system. They must understand and be strong committed to maximizing community pre-booking, diversion, and harm reduction intervention, such as the law enforcement assisted diversion ICE. I mean, let everyone let everyone advance with dignity lead program model that diverts people to non police support and behavioral health services. They must also commit to continuing and working with community organizations to prove improve the county's current citation and summons program. Here in Harris County, we also need a new sheriff who will be vocal and strong proponent of defendants constitutional rights due to due process and assess legal representation. They have to be about ensuring that people are not detained pre-trial simply because of the lack of money. Furthermore, clearing the horrible case backlog while protecting accused persons' rights must be priority for the next sheriff as well. Judge Hidalgo and the commissioners, our next sheriff certainly has their work cut out for them. But as you can see, this is an appointment that our county cannot afford to mess up. Hello, ma'am. Your time is up. All right. Commissioner Cable. Jay, I've got a question for you, sir. Yes, sir. We've now had five people uh, talking about the replacement of the sheriff. <laughs> There's some news on the sheriff's appointment that I'm not yet aware of in the media. Not that I'm aware of. I'll, I'll certainly the sheriff or someone from the sheriff's office online. They can I'll certainly defer to them or someone else. But I, I, my understanding is uh, Sheriff Gonzalez remains Sheriff Gonzalez and, until the Senate confirms him. Um, and at that point, uh, vacancy will be, will be available, and, and then the court can act accordingly. Yeah, I, I know that we can't engage these, these folks for as it's not an agenda item. It's just with. With so many on the one subject, I was curious if there was news I was unaware of. Um, if, if you wouldn't mind just checking with his office and then letting my sure. office know. Thank you. Sure, I, I will do that. Good point. Any other speakers, Tiffany? Judge, those are all the speakers we were able to reach. All right. Thank you. Let me go, go through the um, minor corrections to the agenda. Item 13, agreement with Houston Rodeo. The department requests no action be taken on this item. This is for a vaccination site and it had already been approved. Item 18, uh, never mind. Um, item 183 on page 19. We need to add an S and then the words to and after the word precinct so that the item reads Request by the Constable of Precincts 2 and 5. Council item 283? Uh, no, item 183 on page 19. That's oh, okay. a high-intensity drug trafficking project task force. 
Item 189 on page 19. The department requests no action. It's a reimbursement for cell phone. Page 26, item 232. I have a note here that no action is re is requested on this item. Is that right, Dave? The calculation of the voter approval rate? Judge, can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, this is a tax office item. My recommendation would be to take no action. Your com recommendation would be what, Dave? No action. To take no action. Does the tax office have any comments on this? Item 232. Hi, this is Elizabeth Doss with the Harris County Tax Office. Um, no, ma'am, we don't have anything just by statute. We had to put it up um, for your decision for us to calculate that rate if necessary. Okay, so no action on item 232. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, Thank you. Item 265 on page 29, risk management services. Increase, we need to increase the value of the renewal by striking $74,000 and replacing it with $96,142. And those are all the corrections. Now for the consent agenda. Uh, these are the following executive session items. There's an executive session item uh, 354 to approve the nomination of Elisa Max as Harris County representative as primary representative and Jonathan Stever as alternate to the HGAC's Regional Flood Management Committee. Does anyone need to go to executive session on that? I do, Judge. Was that a, I do? I do. Okay. Three, for 354. I don't judge, but uh, as to Alyssa Max, I just think she's awesome. Yeah, agreed. Item 355 is to appoint Lloyd Smith as an alternate delegate to Judge Hidalgo on the HGAC Transportation Policy Council. I do, Judge. Um, 356, <laughs> executive session for possible action in regards to the NHHIP. I do. 357, an executive session to approve to change CSD's representative on the way home continuum of care steering committee. Okay, we'll put that on the consent agenda. And then item 358, I, we do have to go to executive session four, which is uh, to discuss submission of comments to the Texas General Land Office mitigation plan for CDBG grants. Oh, and Judge, yeah. my, my correction, 354, I don't need to go back on that one. Okay, so 354 goes on the consent agenda, but 355 still needs to go back. From yes. Mr. Garcia. Okay. Um, so here are other items that have been flagged for discussion. Item 18 on page three is the broad COVID item. I have some brief updates on there um, related to the nursing program. Item, and it's just the update I promised I'd give. Item 19 on page three, I would like to discuss that item. It's on the criminal case backlog. Item 20 on page three. I do want to discuss that. Okay, we'll discuss that one. Commissioner Ramsey had flagged it as well, and so had I. Item 33 on page four, budget appropriation transfers for the flood control district. Commissioner Cable, you had flagged that item. Yes, Judge, the certain county departments is the portion of that that I need for us to discuss. We may need to just do a vote on it because um, I think some of those other appropriations are for the elections administrator okay. and some other departments. Why don't we, let's do that. So, yes. I'm moving. So, you, would, Sorry. you are moving. We need to move. Judge, I would move. Yeah the item as to flood control only. Okay. So there's a motion by Commissioner Cagle of item 33 as to flood control only. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Garcia. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Now we need a motion 
For item 33 S to the remaining, the remaining items. Second. Motion by Commissioner Ellis, second by Commissioner Garcia. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. No. I'm in favor. Motion carries three to two. Did you catch that, James? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Item 155 was flagged by precinct three, approval of an agreement with TechStop. Do you still need to discuss that? We've got some work to do on that, so we're going to put that on the future. So no action. No action. Got it. Item 162, 10 positions for the Economic Opportunity Department. Precincts three and four both flagged that. Second. Motion by Commissioner Ellis on item 162. Second by Commissioner Garcia. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. No. I'm in favor. Motion carries three to two. Sorry, Judge, to interrupt, but that was item 162. That was, what was, who were the commissioners? It, it was, what was your question, James? For item 162, who moved on Ellis. that item? Ellis, second I by second. Garcia. Three, two, uh, Ramsey and Cable voted no. Correct. And what was the item beforehand that was no action? That item one, 155. 155 and no action. Okay, thank you. Item 169. Move it. Second. That is also related to the Economic Opportunity Department. Um, motion by Commissioner Ellis, second by Commissioner Garcia. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. No. I'm in favor. <laughs> Um, motion carries three to two. Item 192. I'll move it. That is simply, that is the, the uh, polling locations list for November 2nd, 2021. We need a vote on that. Well, the concern I've got, they're showing 24 hour voting at Tracy G. I never agreed to that. They should also show two drive through in precinct three. They should also show two drive through in precinct four. So that was never, never my understanding. So you want to vote against it? Yeah. I'll move it. Actually, I would move for the locations, but not for the extended hours past nine and for the drive through. Okay, just take two votes, but that's all right. Yeah. Okay. So, so Commissioner Cable, what would be your motion? My motion is to approve the locations, but that the locations would be um, um, subject to not being passed nine o'clock and or drive through voting, and then we could have a second vote on the the way that they would be operated. In other words, that they would be consistent with our. Uh, Voter integrity bill that was passed. This does not include. That's a question for Dave. I, I don't believe so. It's simply, it's right. simply the list of polling locations. But let me make sure the county attorney. Yeah, it's just. A, Is she on the line? Maybe then. On this, on this item, one hundred and two. <laughs> I, I apologize. Was there a question for me yes yes sir mr barry quick question on item 192 uh, yes, sir. this is only the list of locations we're not funding them these are just potential locations that could be used in the upcoming election is that correct uh, yes that's right though i would say that um as we review the budget it's possible that this will evolve a little bit more, in which case it will come back. But it's the it's the working list of location and hours. Could we? I, I'm curious to hear from the elections administrator, or that we discuss it in executive session. I'm just I'm puzzled by this item, frankly. Yep. So. Me too. Um, I, I'm good. For, I'm good with going to executive session. Could we? This. Because I think there's a potential litigation question here. So could we hold this for executive session and, and perhaps the, the county attorney and elections administrator can both yeah, fill I'm, us in? I'm good with that. Okay, let me let me flag this over. Okay. Item two forty. That is um community engagement programs to mitigate non appearances for the Justice Administration Department. I'll move it. Second. 
There's a motion by Commissioner Ellis and a second by Commissioner Garcia. Any comments? Can uh, um, Dwight, can you give us a, sort of just a thumbnail sketch of what these programs entail? Oh, okay, Judge. I mean, not Judge. Uh, Doctor Correa, Yanis. Yes. Doctor Correa, are you on the line? Yeah, Yanis yeah. Correa. Can we just hold this till we we'll get? Come back to yeah. that item. So that so item two forty is still for discussion. Two ninety three, an award to Main Lane Industries. Commissioner Garcia, this is your slide. Um, yes, Judge. I, uh, no need to hold it. I just wanted to just say how excited this is. Eighteen miles of roadway that will uh, result in streets in the East Alden area being paved uh, by the end of this year. So, or beginning November this year. And so, I'm very, very excited. A lot of work. Community has long needed it. So just proud of the 18 miles of roadway that'll be paved. Thank you. Oh, right. I'm That's right. Oh, well, it's kind of dangerous up there. No, no trouble. Yeah. I've been, I've been, yeah. Been, that was a good bit. Yeah. Very good. Okay, so that that goes on the consent agenda. <laughs> oh, yep. Item 298, an award for drainage improvements. Same thing, Judge. Uh, we can go ahead and move on this. Uh, simply that these are 34 homes in the Harvey area, I mean, in the Harvey area, in the Highlands area, that um, that were flooded uh, during uh, Harvey. But this project is going to be taking uh, several out of, of the floodway. So I'm very excited about this work. Similar to 299, uh, 14 uh, homes flooded during Hurricane Harvey, 25 during Imelda. And uh, this project is going to take several of them many of them out of uh, harm's way once uh, uh, once we're done with this. So very, very excited about these two projects. So that's item- 298 and 299. Eight and 299, both are the drainage improvements. Yep. Those are for the consent agenda. Yes. Oh, wait. I thought you had a question. Item 319 is a request for the court's analyst office to assess compliance with the Prompt Payments Act. Right, uh, real quick, Judge, before we go to 319, uh, can I talk on 304 real quickly? Yes. On 304, um, I just want to uh, check. We are, uh, we should be in the pursuit of a master system for all capital improvement uh, projects and, and the management of, and uh, CapTrack uh, seems to have gotten uh, some good attention from the toll road, but I just want to make sure that uh, both uh, flood control and uh, engineering are paying attention because right now I believe we have eBuilder and we have another system and uh, and apparently none talk to PeopleSoft uh, with the exception of CapTrack. So I just want to make sure I put this on Mr. Barry's uh, uh, list to take a look at to ensure that we uh, can get to a universal system to track all of our capital improvements, uh, capital improvement projects, and do uh, and, and be much more effective with it. Commissioner Espigola and I spoke with Mr. Trevino about this this morning. A good deal, and good. I echo that encouragement. Good, good call, there. Good and the major general, and the major general. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. So, as presented, that three or four goes on the consent agenda. That's correct. Um, we discussed 293, 298, and 299. Next is 319. Uh, yes, Commissioner Garcia. And 319, uh, I, I do want to discuss that uh, when we come back to it. Okay. 324, Commissioner Cable. This is an agreement uh, by Harris County and the Tagore Society of Houston. Judge, I used to be the lawyer for the Tagore Society. Um, and uh, Tagore wrote over a hundred years ago, beautiful poems about peace and love and harmony, and beauty. 
Uh, one of his more famous comments is, beauty is truth's smile when she beholds her own face in a perfect mirror. That's beauty. So he, he wrote uh, about 100 years ago, I was the lawyer for the society. I have talked with the county attorney's office. And just out of an abundance of caution, I'm going to uh, abstain from voting since I was their lawyer um, more than 20 years ago, but still I was their lawyer. And, uh, and uh, where, where is uh, Mr. Iyer? I think he was, I think his counsel is that it's best for me just to abstain from a vote, but it's not necessary for me to do anything with an affidavit of interest because more than 20 years have lapsed since I was their lawyer. So there's no conflict there. Uh, Mr. Iyer, are you there? I am. Uh, I am. That's that's correct, Commissioner. Uh, that's. Uh, I, I think. I think. I think it's even debatable how if you need really need to abstain. But I certainly appreciate your your uh, steadfast uh, adherence to to even the the slightest appearance. And I think that's what you're doing is more than enough. All right. Having said that, I got I got more points here if you wanted to hear them. But I think it's uh, five eighteen, and you probably don't need to hear that. Yeah, it's a, send them, send us a copy of them. <laughs> So let's take a vote on that item. Is there a motion? Second. Motion by Commissioner Earl is second by Commissioner Garcia. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Abstain? I abstain, Judge. And I'm in favor. So the motion carries 4 0. Item 327, Commissioner Ramsey. Item 347. That is a transmittal of the gift cards. Commissioner Cable. Judge, it's a transmittal, and therefore I don't think that we can take a vote. I just wanted to say that if I had a vote, um, I would be voting against the, the uh, process of giving away the gift cards um, in that process. And so I just wanted to have the record be clear. I don't think that there's anything beyond that that we can do. Okay, so that, that transmittal item is, is simply that... The process that the transmittals normally go through. Item 348. Hey, on, real, yeah. real quickly, Judge, just on, on that point, um, I, obviously, I, I think everyone should do things that are responsible that uh, keep everybody safe. But I understand, and I don't know whether anybody has a report on it, that it has been immensely successful. Uh, I know we had hit walls of hesitancy. Uh, resistance, whatever we want to call it, um, concern. But once we launch that incentive program, uh, an incentive program that is similar to many incentives that are uh, throughout our way of living, whether it be your car insurance, whether it be your homeowner's insurance, um, you know, the uh, that this particular program has shown uh, immense progress. I mean, so much as so that if you notice, I'm not uh, as vocal as I initially was on the rate of vaccination in my precinct because we're doing better. Not we're not uh, in a great place as of yet, but we we took a major uptick that we had not seen since we first got the vaccine uh, as a result of this incentive program. So I don't know if anybody's got numbers on this uh, at the moment, but. I, I do want to say that, you know, I I, I agree with Commissioner uh, Cagle uh, that uh, maybe we shouldn't be having to pay, but we do, and we pay in many other ways that uh, everybody around this table uh, benefits from. Um, and I mean, maybe not county-wide, but we do participate in incentives. Uh, we get coupons at CVS and we go back and redeem those. Uh, we get uh, insurance rates for driving safer and slower and, uh, you know, drive wise apps and all that kind of stuff. And we put in burger bars and security cameras and our insurance rates, homeowners insurance rates go down. We do things around uh, our society and, and we get benefits. You know, you use your credit card, you get points back. Uh, so there's a lot of incentives that we all uh, participate in. And this is just one that is intended to help save lives. So judge, I just want to thank you for leading the charge on this, but if at some point somebody could give us a report just to show uh, the success of it since it's been implemented. 
Yeah, and, and Judge, I did want to have a positive note on it, although I'm against the giving away of the bribing, as it were, of people to, to take the shot um, from from the, the one side of the equation. Judge, I do note that uh, a half a million of this was given to HEB, which is local, and I'm very pleased with that. And I disagree with the program, please, that if we're going to be doing the program, more of it is coming back local instead of the um, the faraway uh, company. And I'll smile even more when we see that we're using our own um, uh, financial department that our, that our employees have with our credit union in there, because I understand that they're willing to also give uh, discounts for the program, and that would then benefit our employees as well as um, the benefits that, that Commissioner Garcia was referring to in the program. So I just would throw that out there. Commissioner, um, yeah, Judge, I just want to congratulate you as well. Judge Whitley of Tarrant County called me about it uh, and said that initially he was reluctant to do it, but he heard about the success and criticism in Houston and want to look into it. So they decided they, they're going to do it. He did tell me that he did ask his uh, county attorney, a DA over there, whether or not they could go back and give people something who had already taken it. So you couldn't do that because they'd already taken the shot. But uh, hey, you ought to be proud for stepping out there. So Tarrant County is going to follow your lead. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I have some data I can share with you guys really, really quickly, um, which shows, you know, we all heard about the enormous increase in participation in the public health side. Then my obvious next question was, is this people just like who would have gotten the vaccine anyway, but are just going to the public health site instead? So the first hint that it was actually a successful program is that whenever there were interviews at the sites and they asked people, you know, why are you here? They would say, well, because of the hundred dollars, they wouldn't say, well, I was already going to come. So we did an analysis where um, I'm trying to pull it up, but we basically um, put the seven day average of first doses in Harris County compared to first doses in neighboring counties. So uh, Galveston, Brazoria, Montgomery, and Fort Bend. And they, they, they worked on the chart to where they all have the same peak. So it, it accounts for the fact that, you know, we're at different levels of vaccination. And basically what you see is a big gap where, where the other counties, all of them, they follow the same trajectory and the average follows the same trajectory. Their curve goes like this in terms of vaccinations. Ours is like sort of flat or a slight decrease. Um, and then lately though, it has gone back down. So this area is the increased vaccinations and it's a good, you know, 30,000 people or something. Director, um, uh, Director Robinson just gave me that the number, 50, almost 56,000 have participated in the incentive program. That is phenomenal. And so look, um, again, I, I, I tend to in principle agree, um, but anything to get people to step forward, shake them loose, get them to the vaccination sites, that's a good thing for us. It's a good thing for us. Yeah, so we're gonna be trying to get the word out again. Unfortunately, the program expired right in the middle of the rain yesterday. So we were, we just had to decide, are we going to extend it or not? And we couldn't do a big news on it. So we said, let's extend it two weeks. We're going to do a big push once the, the news of the storm passes and see if we once again are able to create that gap between what, what would have been the behavior had we not had the program. And if we don't see that, then we'll end it. Uh, but right now, there's been tens of thousands of people who would not have gotten it but for the, the um, and and as you guys know it's not just the public health sites anymore anywhere if people go anywhere in the county they just go on ready here so they call the phone number and they can get their their a hundred dollars so that that um yeah we'll be sharing some of this data when we announce the extension and, to, and, and so it'll and go through the 30th prepared a, a memo that i sent to judge whitley yeah, so they, they put something that was pretty comprehensive set it down. Yeah, and I've, I did speak with all the judges, and so we're we've got a, a good group. Judge Whitney is, is fantastic. Um. So so anyway, so thank you. So that was item three forty seven. Did we vote on it already? 
Or the trans metal. Oh, it's the trans metal. Got it. Oh, wait, item 348, I had flagged that one because I wanted to update you guys about the nurses, but I'm okay putting it on the consent agenda. I'll, I'll just, I'll share this update when we get to the COVID item. Um, 350, 350 is uh, also um, about nurses. And so I'll discuss the COVID item, but it's a transmittal. 359, a renewal award. I'm okay. That's um, Do folks need to vote on this item? Is a, a renewal agreement public health for the good. Texas or Refugee again. Medical oh. Screening Grant? Um, you pulled it. Did you want to vote against? Well, the, the concern I had is when the grant goes away, the positions will still be there. That it's that that's the that's concern. This is grant funded. I get that part. But it seems like when we create new positions, uh, again, that, that's something that stays with us. So you just want to vote? Yeah. Okay. Well, or, or have a modification that says that, that the positions only last for the period of the grant with an end to the positions. So Is it, do you know, Dave or Barbie, how this works? I suspect they're tied to the grant would be my guess, but... Yeah, because I assume when the grant goes away, the position we vote goes. yes and no on funding it. We weren't funded for it. Dave, do you have something to add here, or is Barbie on the line? Oh, uh -oh. I'm muted. I'm I'm gonna call you. Okay, he pulls his phone. Um. Okay, David Barry. Okay, Dave, I've got you on speaker. Uh, Judge, my understanding of this item is that, that the positions would only last as, so long as the grant, but also this grant has a history of being renewed. But also this grant has... History of being renewed. Oh. He said it has a history of being renewed. So I wouldn't... I wouldn't, I wouldn't end up right away if people would get renewed again. Is Barbie not on the line? Uh, Tiffany, or... Barbie's on the line. Director Robinson? She must be having technical difficulties because she's on here and she's unmuted. Okay. Uh, well, I'll just text her and see if she has anything to add. Um, all right. So do we need if, to if vote on it? If you want to hold it or give her a vote on it, Tom. That's just about Okay, I'll move it. Hi, Judge. This is Gwen Sin. Oh, hi, Gwen. Hi, how are you? Um, just, uh, I think Director Robinson might be having some technical difficulty, but this refugee medical screening grant is has a 42-year history um, with Harris County and Harris County Public Health. 42? 42. 42. 42 years. Wow, okay. So the grant doesn't seem to go away. And this is a medical screening to make sure that the folks that are coming are are healthy and don't have any communicable diseases. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And also have referral to services within the community. That's fine. Okay. We don't consent. Thank mm -hmm. you. We're, thank you, Gwen. We're, we're putting it on the consent agenda. Good deal. Thank you. Tom, thank, thank you. Thank you all. Um, thank you. Okay, Dave, I'm going to just keep you here on speaker because we may have questions for you. Commissioner... Oh, yeah, I want to talk about that when we get to it. Okay, so we'll discuss item 366. Item 368 on the jail population. I'm assuming you want yes. to discuss this, Commissioner Garcia. Yes. Item 369, Commissioner Ramsey. Yes, we're going to discuss it. Item 370, uh, I'd like to cover that one. That's a really exciting, um, just wonderfully good news on another creative program we have going on for vaccination. And Judge, to yes. the extent <laughs> of 370, I, I don't know if you want to vote on it or if you want to talk about it and discuss it, but from my perspective, whereas the regular program is we're giving away cards mm -hmm. to, um, to the card users, this is almost like the card pushers. We're giving money away to those who snag people and bring them in to get the shots. And yeah. so I would... Um, uh, I, I understand that there's disagreement as to whether or not amongst us whether that's appropriate or not, but but I would 
I would vote no on that. I'm okay. okay. Well, let me just. I want. I want to hear what the judge has to say. Yeah, this is a. This is a. This was entirely a um, public health idea, and the department did research. One of the the questions I, we asked when Director Robinson got here was, "Okay, we're all guessing as to what will get people vaccinated." Can you, and, and it doesn't make sense for us to go look at, say, Vermont, which doesn't have the same demographic breakdown as we do. So can you guys find a community that has a similar demographic breakdown where we know certain demographics are more <laughs> than others and try to figure out um, what got them to, to participate, to get the vaccine? So the public health department found an example some in, in Louisiana and Barbie can add or, or Gwen if I'm missing anything, I can't remember where. And it was basically the idea of, you know, each community is different. And, and we, we all know this and each community knows what will bring people out. And ultimately the community groups are best at sort of rallying people. So could we offer an incentive for community groups to bring um, their networks out to get the vaccine. And so what we decided was to do a pilot. And over the past month or so, we did a pilot with 10 sites where we partnered with 10 um, community groups across the county. Harris County Public Health prioritized the zip codes, the, the priority zip codes where we have low vaccination rates, high SVI, et cetera. So they partnered uh, with, with 10 community groups and each community group would receive $100 for each person that arrived up to $5,000 maximum. And so that could offset costs of flyers, you know, putting on an event. Uh, what we heard from the community groups as we were brainstorming this is they would like to provide more incentives and promote the event, but they need a budget for that. Um, and it also, uh, we also would provide $100 for the folks who came. And this was before we had even started our $100 vac uh, vaccination incentive. So this was a sort of a pilot for that as well. This is why we decided to do it throughout all public health sites because it was looking really good from the pilot. And so what we what we got back was that these um, this program increased participation well beyond what the standard participation is at, at our public health sites. Um, all but one site saw attendance numbers be double, at least double what our normal sites are. And um, on average, the, the folks were quite young. Uh, average site at all sites were under 40. Um, Co-located events with food drives, haircuts, et cetera, were quite successful. So, and these are the creative things that the, the community groups came up with. So um, Greenhouse International Church, they did phone banking, uh, flyer distribution. They promoted the vaccine on the church's weekly broadcast slot on their radio station. And they co-located the vaccine event with HIV testing, um, games for kids. They did a lottery, St. Pius Church. They announced this during church. They made a flyer, social media. Um, other uh, other groups like East Harris County Empowerment Council, they did cellular text banking with some of the funding. Um, mostly these were uh, communities of faith. So we have St. Leo, the great Catholic church. They did 20 outreach events. Um, they brought food and I guess with some of the funding we offered. So anyway, it was a big success. So now we want to extend it to 20 to 25 more sites. As you can tell, I'm excited about it. I think it's worth trying. And I think we have to think outside the box uh, and, and see if it works. I, I'm supportive of it. I think, I think the more partnerships we can do with our faith-based community, I think that's a, that's a big untapped uh, resource for us. So that, that would be something I would support. Can we put it on local or if you want to vote? I'm in favor of working with the faith-based community and local folks and helping them with the budget to try to do programs like this. I just have a problem with the per head uh, bounty part of the program. Uh, and I understand it may work, 
but the, the the bounty part of that just kind of that something about that just doesn't rest well with me and so i'm fine with just voting on it i'm okay sorry so there's a motion for item uh 370 dollars for partnership a community partner incentive program a motion by commissioner ellis second by commissioner garcia all in favor aye aye opposed no i'm in favor motion carries four to one and if you guys have ideas send them our way um as far as partners item 371 is in agreement with grace Solution. and judge on that last comment yeah we may we may do that we may have some folks send some ideas over to you on how to partner with some of our um our nonprofit partners that are out there um maybe not necessarily in a in the in the bounty program of that but how we could partner with them to help put on programs in all they achieve the very same goals that we're talking about here Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Item 371, Commissioner Ramsey, you had flagged this one. This is the uh, this is the partnership we have with the city of Houston to house um, homeless individuals who have COVID. And we initially stood it up in 2020. Then we wound it down in early early this year because we we just didn't need it anymore. And now we need it again. And so basically the city and Alex, you have to correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the city pays the rent and we pay the services and staff. A anyway, it's, it's 50 50. So it's all FEMA reimbursable. It's FEMA reimbursable. Correct. That's fine. I don't need to know. Okay, so that'll go on the consent agenda. Uh, that was item 371. And item 372 is the purchasing agent terminating the agreement with Elevate that we should discuss. Those are all the items. Okay. So, so let's. Um, there's Sorry. no public hearings on the agenda. Any any other clarification, James? Yes, Judge. Uh, item 160. That's intergovernmental and global affairs. Request for discussion and possible action regarding the Harris County legislative agenda. No action. Okay. And Judge, just to be clear, we were waiting on something on the general auditor's report. And I don't know if we've gotten that yet where the, the PFM, the, the PFM transmittal is sometimes buried in the middle of that. Which, which item is it? Oh. Needing to flag that we were, we were waiting. I'm told we're fine now. It's just every now and then there, there'll be that transmittal that's in the global report and we have to break it out. And we hadn't, as of this morning, gotten our number in but we have it now there's not anything in there okay and the auditor may help us in the future by just going ahead and liking us so these are the items we have yes, yes. I'm sorry i've got two more items to Go ask on um item 328 uh -huh. it's a request for discussion and possible action on the approval of an interlocal agreement reviewed by the county attorney's office between Klein isd and precinct four that should be in the consent agenda consent as presented yes okay and then item 365. That's a cool program. We could talk about it, but I know that it's 541 in the afternoon, but it's uh, it's where we're working with the client school to get kids to where they can see how farming was done and they get to actually see how uh, where eggs come from, where food comes from. And it's really a cool thing to put people in touch with the ground. It's a Go great ahead, program. Oh, sorry. Yes, ma'am. Item 365, that's... Uh, Request by the county judge for discussion and possible action to approve and adopt the updated rules and conduct and decorum of meetings of commissioner's court. Oh, yes. Yeah. So those are the updated rules. Um, the motion would be to approve the rules as presented. And I have some questions. OK, yeah, I, I forgot to flag that one. So we'll flag 365 for discussion. James is good. Yeah. It's that beard. <laughs> it helps them think. Is there anything I need to pull, James? <laughs> Not today, sir. Anything else, James? No, oh, ma'am, that's all I have.
Thank you. Um, look at the hand. Um, let me go over what the, our different slides are just to make sure everybody has what they need. So, so he, here's what we're going to be discussing. Executive session item 355, Lloyd Smith's appointment. Executive session 356, NHHIP. Executive session 358, comments for GLO's action plan. And 192, we're taking to executive session, which is the um, early vote locations. Then regular agenda item 18, item 19, 20, 240, 319, 327, 365, 366, 368, 369, and 372. Is there a motion for items one through 372 with the exception of items already voted on in the discussion items I just listed? Second. Is a motion a second? All in favor? Aye. 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 You opposed? The motion carries unanimously. I'll take a quick break. Sure. Uh, it's 543. Okay. I, I want to say five till, but we're <laughs> just going to be here at six. Let's just be back at six. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. you, Judge. I need to get, I need to get on the trail mix. It's six, six of four and commissioner's court is back in session. The name of the game is efficiency. We're going to start with the broad COVID item and um, my update is very, very brief. Um, I promised to update you all on the um, nurses. And what happened was we had earmarked $30 million. We, we did, we had Setrac uh, help us administer this. They did a survey of the hospitals and they found that the hospitals needed so many more nurses than the initial uh, assessment had shown. So we ended up um, authorizing Setrac to hire uh, just over 600 nurses. The vast majority of them, like 535, arrived within a week. Really? Yeah, they're still right now. We're still at the 535 right now, for whatever reason. Oh, I know why. Because uh, of the Louisiana um, uh, impacts, because the, the Ida strain their hospital systems even more, and so there's just there was some delays there, but. It, it, you know, those nurses were walking into, you know, everywhere from Texas Children's to Memorial Hermann to Ben Taub and LBJ. Um, all the hospitals, you know, absorbed their nurses over the, those last uh, 70 or so. One thing that I, I learned going through this process is in the three week period between August 11th and end of August, in total, including our 600 nurses, 100, uh, 1,300 nurses were sent to Harris County uh, from various sources. In terms of the region, 2,000 nurses. So it just, it really shows you the, the scale of the issue right now. Um, the numbers are beginning to trend downward. Um, the positivity has been trending down for a while. The cases and the hospitalizations are beginning to trend down. That suggests we've reached a peak um, General population beds went up recently once more, but the the sense from the from the data people is that 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 we have reached a peak. The problem is that the peak is so high that you're still at this extreme strain in in our in our hospital systems. So um, those are the big updates. The only other update I wanted to share with you all was the the data on the incentive program that Commissioner Garcia already covered. So judge quickly yeah. on uh, vaccinations. Yeah. Uh, the focus is still on adults. The focus has not shifted to high school students or younger than 18. Our, our, our focus right now is still adults. Is that correct? We've been trying to focus 
on everybody that's unvaccinated so to, and, and, and qualifies, so 12 plus. The younger the population, the greater percentage of them that are unvaccinated. We continue to partner with schools on events. We continue to have successful events in schools, but there's still a very, very large chunk of the younger population that is not yet vaccinated. Yeah. Judge, our office is probably going to reach out to you in the next few days. We are having more and more folks who are contacting us trying to get tested uh, because the apparently the, the more lucrative thing is to provide the shots, but the testing is not as available right now. And so uh, we may reach out to you to try to see if we can work up some way of making more testing available. Yeah, and and I know that's something the public health department has been running down is to balance out, you know, we don't want to have it and not use it, but we also want to need it and not have it. So that's something for us all to run down together. Um, so I, I will say I've heard from the hospital, some of the hospital leaders, um, I was on the phone with Lori Upton from SETRAC and, and, and our folks, they were in very close touch, obviously, with Dr. Porsa. And it, generally, a, a enormous amount of gratitude from our hospitals for this step. And I know that all of our teams are working to ensure that this is reimbursed. But the fact that we were out front getting those nurses as quickly as possible I think we can be certain, we can be certain that this court helped save lives. Um, so I hope that's a, a good a good thing. Um, so that's it for my broad COVID update. So judge on that item, is there any action? No, James. Thank you. Okay, the next item is uh, 19. It's a, the criminal case backlog status. And I, I flagged it. I mean, I know we've asked questions about this. I took a look at the report. I think it's good that there is a report. I am not seeing, I guess I, I wanna see a path to success. You know, we received a proposal from, it wasn't PFM, it was, um, oh God, goodness, the ones with the I. <clears throat> Anyway, JMI, from JMI about a year ago, their proposal was it's a certain class of cases that just, just need to be dismissed. We said, well, realistically, the judges are not going to do that. So let's come up with a solution that is palatable to the actors in the system. We can't make them do that. Um, and, and this was the solution. But the commitment I made and the... And the the reason I, I'm I'm comfortable with the investments we've made is because the sense is we're gonna make sure that that's gonna get us from point A to point B. And I don't see right now in the report how we're gonna get to point B. So what needs to happen? Can we prepare an updated report at the next quarter? What, what can we do so that we visualize where we need to be and project how what we're doing is getting us there and identify whether we're off track. It may be that we're not gonna get on track for another two months while the programs really get going and the additional court is fully staffed and whatever it is, but I don't want us to wait, you know, six months a year and just continue crossing our fingers on something that may or may not be yielding results. I think we need to be able to evaluate whether what, what we're doing is, is making a, a measurable difference and gonna get us past this backlog once and for all. So that, that was really my question. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Garcia, Commissioner Ellis, and then Commissioner King. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Um, and I, I appreciate you um, bringing this this up. Um, I do want to, I do have an item later that uh, 368 that I want to talk talk about, and it, and it basically relates uh, to, to this item. <clears throat> but, um, Mr. Berry, I know that um, when we talked about the uh, court docket website that there was a uh, conscientious decision not to have two sites. Um, but I, the more I think about it, we may need to have two sites um, because we need something internal uh, to make sure that our investments are reflected 
as the judge uh, touched on, and, um, and, and let it be sort of a project management type of site that lets us know when the associate judges go online, um, whether you know, we're able to hold um, you know, the appropriate courts uh, in the evening. Uh, I think we talked about doing stuff on the weekends where, where it made sense. Um, and uh, so I, I'm thinking that we may need um, an internal work um, uh, site so that we can really track the movement of the backlog because I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that we're not, we don't know, we've put a lot of money into this system, but I'm not, I, I don't have a good feel for what money is being used whether the things that we funded are, are, are moving and, uh, and whether we're seeing any movement on dockets. And so uh, I, I'll, I'll visit with you uh, later, but those are my initial thoughts that I think we do need to have a subsequent site that we can track and, and work from to, so that we can ask questions and, uh, and find out you know, more about what is working, what isn't working, and so that we can have definitive answers at this table about where our investment is at, uh, is since we've made it, since we appropriated, since we put it on the, on the agenda, since it's been approved. I think, uh, I think a internal work site will be very, very helpful to make sure that we're moving uh, that bureaucracy along. Yeah, Commissioner Ellis. So, Chase, thank you for uh, listing this item. Um, and there are about eight, eight things in here that the report showed me that we've done, which are significant. And I think worth re reiterating again. A one new district court, which the judges took the lead on advocating for. Associate judges, jury operations, about 2 million, 2.5 million for the associate uh, district the district court associate judgeships, uh, emergency response dockets, 3.4 million, public defender's office, uh, 547,000, evidence backlog, 92. I think that was particular staff in the sheriff's office, triage for the DA, about 3.8 million, judicial dashboards. Uh, and that, that is quite a bit. Judge, you made reference to the JMI report and the recommendations of there, and you also made reference to things we cannot do, things that this uh, five-person board cannot push. Commissioner Garcia, you've been very effective, I think, with the smaller group. So what okay. I'd like to suggest before we do a second dashboard, we can do it internally anyway, but uh, I, I know Judge, uh, the presiding judge, Kelly Johnson, called me wanting to visit, and I was we were dropping off our last kid in college, uh, so I couldn't do it. Uh, but maybe a oh, I would suggest so I can only use a bullet with one. We meet with a small group and Judge Johnson convenes because maybe the things you want, they would put on that dashboard. I think what Mr. Baird was trying to do was be a little less confrontational. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can add those things. Some of the judges had concerns about a dashboard not showing everything. Well, what does show everything? Mm -hmm. I get it. Mm -hmm. But if we could tweak some changes. So I think he tasked them with putting it together. Maybe we can add the things you want, but I think if we have that small group, okay. I, I think uh, that uh, Beth Key is going to come back with some recommendations on the, uh, uh, the, the the super committee that the judge passed on to me. The challenge with that is sometimes it's hard to have that conversation, to be honest with you, because three of us are on it. Mm -hmm. And we just can't have that one-on-one. -on -one. None of us have enough time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we ought to we ought to try to do that. And you know, Jay and I did lay out a whole host of things that that, that ought to be done. But I'd suggest that we we'll try that. We want to try. It Sounds good. Even this this Friday, I, I know she's got to go do some family stuff as well. Sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Cable. Judge, on three quick questions, which nobody here may know the answer, but whoever it is does those the answer could communicate back with us. Uh, the first one is, is that we've got associate judges that we approved, but we're waiting on approval from the Texas Supreme Court. And the question is, when can we see them to be online? 
Um, we have the success of added juries. We now need to have judges to put the juries into the box and start to try the cases. So when, when do we anticipate getting the associate judges trying cases? Second question is, when can we anticipate the new district court starting to try cases? Um, I know that we have funded it. It's approved. Uh, I guess the governor still needs to approve um, who the judge of that court will be. That it's a, dis a state district court, so that'll be a, a governor's appointment initially and then an election. And then the third question is, um, I know that Mr. Bethke has tendered a resignation. How much longer do we have him before he's gone? I think it's the end of October. Check out on me. No, I, I, I'm just guessing. For some reason, October was in my mind. I think it's the end of October. But if we could have somebody who knows, contact our office and let us know on the uh, when we can see the associate judges trying cases, when can we see the new district judge um, trying cases? Well, the district court says here it's up and running. The associate judges, I'd have to defer. Do you know the, the answer to court that? Have to... Or... I do not have a date on when the uh, uh, Supreme Court is supposed to approve the ruling. Commissioner Rand. I think the challenge we get some people on the line is I was talking to Dwight. Some some of our county department heads don't have power. Yeah. <laughs> Just a quick to reinforce what Commissioner Garcia, Judge, I think asking the eighty thousand foot questions, trying to get to understand the rhythm of the court. I spent quite a bit of time with Judge Poe, Ted Poe here this week talking about these things. He said, well, you know, there's a certain rhythm that a court can get into and try in cases and move on. I don't think we've got an understanding of that. And that's a big mystery in terms of we're we're doing our part. We're investing in in juries. We're investing in in, in uh, uh, defense. We're investing in, in courts. But we don't know. I mean, there's some courts not even have court. some 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 judges are not are choosing not to have court. There might be an explanation of that. But at least if we saw some evidence, some indication, that can't be that complicated. Figure out how much who's holding court and what's the what's the status of that. So that that would be my interest in the number, whether that's one or two dashboards. I wouldn't think that'd be too hard for somebody to tell us who's having court. Yeah, and I think the challenge is that it, it's other elected officials. And so it's, it's you know, the benefit of having someone like Dave or like Anna or like Jim is that in theory, they can bring all these parties together and, and figure out the answer to your question. What I haven't figured out is how do you get past, you know, they don't give them the time of day and then, but frankly, none of us can go sit there and do it ourselves. We don't have the type of time to do that. And I'm just afraid that I agree with you. And you know how many times we've asked that, this yeah, question is right here. So I guess the reason I bring this up again is because I'm at a bit of a loss. I want to hope that this is just sort of slow trends because it's not going to be overnight. But I suspect that there's more that needs to be done. And so, you know, the judges are, are focused on their courtrooms and they know something's, you know, not quite efficient, but they don't, it's not in their minds, their job to figure it out. And, and for us, you know, we'd love to figure it out, but we can't do it and they don't listen to the, the appointed folks. So I think the dashboards you know, are creating some movement because there's a tendency for all of us, by the way, when an issue comes up, to just talk about our precinct, uh, our court, when it is the county or the courts. So I think the dashboards do put a lot, you know, it created a little, uh, it, it created a little consternation, you know, it's just the, the power of the data being out there. So could we, uh, Dave, is this something you can bring back once a month? And then hopefully, I think it's, your idea is great, Commissioner Ellis, if you guys can try to break the logjam on at least the dashboards. So at least we'll hear them before we just do another dashboard. And we try, I mean, short notes, but I'd say try for this Friday. And perhaps continuing to look at these charts reminds us to not let off. And maybe one of us will come up with another great idea because. It was a great motivator, Judge, every month when the printout came to show 
which judge was trying cases and which one didn't. And it, you know, I always had to be the one on the front of the list. And then others started to compete. And before long, you saw how we were all moving our dockets yeah. at a good pace. Taxpayers were getting their dollars worth because we were putting in the putting in the extra hours to make sure that we tried those cases and moved them. Because at the end, at the beginning of every month, all of the, the data, how many cases you got, how many you moved, they were all there. I'll just make this final point and I'm, I'm uh, it's not devil's advocate. I just think perhaps they move the cases faster, right? But is that fast enough given the scale of the backlog? So that's, I mean, I think we need to wait for them to start moving them faster and then we need to project and see, you know, is this going to get us like 2% of the way there or like 60% of the way there? So, uh, so Dave, can you bring back this report once a month and let us know, obviously, if there's anything we can do to speed up the approval of the associate judges or anything else. And I mean, I think all of us are concerned about this issue, which is. Yep. And, and Judge, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Right. A absolutely. The intent is to bring this report back every month so that it, in fact, does function as a kind of dashboard focusing on the total size of the backlog, what percentage of it is getting disposed each month, and also keeping our eye on the jail population, because as Commissioner Garcia was alluding to, that's a sign that the courts aren't keeping up with the most uh, serious cases Absolutely. of that population growth. And, and furthermore, keeping track of all the initiatives we funded and doing an individual evaluation of them, and also having a running list of, of new ideas, of things we need to continue exploring. The, the reality is that a for most of the initiatives that this, this court has approved, they're still in the, uh, being implemented. So the district court just started operations at the um, beginning of this month. Uh, the three uh, emergency response dockets um, are set to uh, start trials on uh, September 21st. So I think when we start seeing um, some of that data back and start seeing the trends, that will start uh, helping us really come to an informed view of is is this enough, right? Or do we need to be doing uh, do we need to be doing more? Um, and so, uh, absolutely, this will this will come back once every month, and I expect it will grow over time. And to, to some of the comments I heard, I mean, this is absolutely something that no one party can fix. This is something that will require cooperative effort of the district attorney, of the judges of commissioner's court and their power of the purse, uh, of the sheriff's office, of others. And um, what I can tell you is that I think there are a lot of good conversations going on. And I think I've made it very clear that as commissioner's court representative, the door is always open for, for good ideas and big ideas that need support to, to resolve this. Thank you. Item 20, Harris County Priority Outcomes. Sorry, Judge. Good. Item 19, is there any action? Uh, I don't think so. <clears throat> Do we need any action on 19? No, no James, no Thank action. You. Uh, yes, you. Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, Judge. On um, item 20, uh, first I want to thank uh, Mr. Barry and his staff uh, for working, um, or and, and Leah, uh, for working with us through the process of, uh, you know, uh, defining uh, priority outcomes for the use of uh, ARPA dollars. I was surprised um, that um, I was the only member of court who did select increasing home ownership as a priority. And, um, you know, we do have uh, as a priority increasing affordable housing, but we got to keep in mind that a home purchase at an affordable rate is affordable housing that stays affordable and creates uh, generational wealth. So I expect that, uh, yeah, I expect that we, we, I rather hope that we keep that in mind on our work uh, toward affordable housing uh, because it's just, it's always been, and uh, Commissioner Ellis has touched on this many times, it's been one of those elusive things for uh, Harris County. City of Houston has done a lot of work in that regard, but uh, I, I don't want to uh, think that we have redlined the county, but I want to make sure that we continue to look at all creative opportunities to bring more affordable housing and affordable housing opportunities uh, to the county and uh, 
and make sure that it's reflective uh, throughout uh, the county and all of our precincts. And then secondly, as I was perusing the list, um, one thing did jump out at me, and I, I do want to make a, a, um, a friendly edit just to, for the sake of uh, making sure it's in there, but on the transportation goal statement, um, I, I think we make inference to it, but I want to make sure it's really understood. And that is that uh, multimodal transportation projects do speak to this. This may not speak to, and the reason I'd, I'd like to make sure it's stated in it, uh, and, and this is the way Maeda would read, is that Harris County will promote multimodal uh, uh, transportation projects, including, and then everything else that's in there, um, is because multimodal uh, transportation projects speak to a lot of this that's, uh, that's indicated here, but not all of this reflects multimodal transportation, uh, modes of transportation. So I just want to make sure that we cover our bases because multimodal uh, projects is uh, something important to all of us and it's more, um, it's more encompassing than just these, these particular uh, uh, metrics that we've laid out. So Mr. Barry, if I could uh, get your commitment to make sure that that's uh, in there, that, that would help me a great deal. Commissioner Garcia, that, that sounds good. I think, um, again, we wanted to bring forward these outcomes at this time because it was it was, it was was ready to check in and make sure we were headed in the right direction. These will continue to evolve, and the plan is that they really form the center of the budgeting process, that we're laying dollars against outcomes against ways to make people better off. No, exactly. So certainly, I think um, we can look to add a priority outcome that reflects access to multimodal transit, and um, we, we, can, we can work on that. Yeah, because uh, my worry is that we may inadvertently leave out hike and bike trails as an example. And so I want to make sure that that uh, we kind of cover both spectrums, the items that have uh, been specifically laid out, as well as to the universe that multimodal uh, transportation projects touches. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I had uh, one also minor edit, which was on flooding. I wonder if we could add coastal protection somewhere, Dave, protection against storm surge. Uh, I, do, I don't see where else it would fit. Maybe I didn't read it carefully enough. Speaking of that, Judge, one of the casualties of uh, the storm is Sylvan Beach. My peer uh, out at Sylvan Beach was just devastated. And it's just interesting because I met with uh, the first lady of the port, Maggie, and uh, Maggie, uh, I was telling her about the uh, the master plan that we're doing for uh, Sylvan Beach Park, and uh, and I, you know, it, it, it's always good to meet with citizens like this because I was telling her how beautiful it's going to be, and da, da, da. she goes, you know, if you can spend money, spend it right. How about how about a seawall so that it, it can beat against a storm if, if we ever have one come? She made a good point, so. So to to what you're just touching on, Judge, uh, I think we do need to make sure to speak more on storm surge protection. Those are my comments. Yeah. Judge, it's um, six thirty on a on a Tuesday evening. We could spend a lot of time going through a lot of the little stuff in here. There's a number of things that are not really what I would support. Um, a lot of really good stuff in here too, but you want to just want to just vote on it. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Ellis. Second. Second by Commissioner Garcia. That is for item 20. 20. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Sorry. Is it as presented or is with changes being made? With the changes being made. Sure. Yes. With the changes being made. With coastal coastal protection and multimodal uh, transit projects. To be added to the backup. Sure. Okay. All in favor? If I might suggest, I think the. Um, uh, if this works, uh, we could approve them as presented with instructions to the Office of Management and Budget when they come back with the uh, actual proposed budget to include storm surge and multiple transit. Does Wait, that we'll work? Butcher, just so we're not. Sure, you your work product. Um, yeah, okay, just so, so we're not editing on the fly. Does that work? Yes, it works. So as, as presented. As presented with the instructions uh, at a later time. 
Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. No. I'm in favor. Motion carries three to two. I I agree they're well done though. Thank you. Item two forty is um yeah, item two forty is the next one. That is the uh it's a JAD item on community engagement. If JAD could walk us through it. Yeah, and Dr. Uh, Correa? Yes, hi. Hey there. I, I was asking earlier if you could give us, um, I'm not sure how exhaustive the list is of, um, of these um, uh, approaches uh, to community engagement programs. Um, that uh, and to mitigate non appearances, what what do those programs look like? Of course, first of all, thank you all for all of the work that you all do, and um, it's a pleasure to be able to speak with all of you um, and team. the The community engagement grant RFP is actually a way that the Justice Administration Department has decided to maximize its current resources. And to Mr. Berry's point that it's gonna take all of us to identify solutions, this is an example of that. So what we've done with this particular RFP is we've been able to merge the pre-existing community engagement effort that this court had approved before uh, to make sure that we provide services and we provide support to groups that are addressing violence, uh, you know, groups that are supporting survivors of crime and also include a, a, an additional factor, which is um, in terms of the appearance. So some of these include allowing these grants to support groups that are providing services like transportation and ch um, child care and housing and anything that has to do with the potential barriers that individuals would have to court appearances. So um, this particular RFP, again, includes the approach that this court has had already previously approved through the, um, through the safety and justice grant, uh, but also utilized funds that had already been allocated for O'Donnell. So it's a merger of both of them hmm. that would expand who can qualify for these grants. So you're putting out an RFP to find out how to do this. Is that that? How, is, is we are, we're putting out an RFP uh, that would yes to better understand how to go ahead and do this and some and the the objectives. Uh, you know, are very much in line with increasing public safety as well as the um, the other pieces, um, I, which includes the um, the O'Donnell uh, appearance rate implementation. Um, I, I'm I'm going to ask that uh, you keep an eye on what helps victims show up for court as well. Uh, yes, I, I, I won't I won't be able to see pain for child care for. Uh, someone who has been charged uh, if we're not doing the same for a victim. So, yes, and, uh, sorry, and, and I, part I of, well, most definitely, and part of like the, in the, the part of the, the groups that are very much eligible for this grant also includes uh, support systems for survivors of crime. All right, so it Thank includes you. individuals that are, that are focusing on preventing uh, of violence uh, it includes individuals that it includes groups that could that are there to support survivors of crime. Uh, it includes groups that are focusing on healing communities through restorative justice. And the additional piece is it includes groups that have supportive um, services for looking at non appearances. And it is part of the O'Donnell. Um, it is part of the O'Donnell mandate requiring that uh, that they, we provide assistance to supporting to individuals. So it captures the whole scope, right? It it 
It captures the survivors of crime and it also complies with O'Donnell that is asking for adding additional assistance uh, in supporting indigent misdemeanors, arrestees making court appearances. And, so it's and, just an addition, it's an addition to the previous work that we have done to include community uh, in these in these grants. So uh, Dr. Creel, this is Rod Dale. So this is just the RFP process. We'll get an opportunity to decide whether or not we will do it once you see what's out there. So this Correct. is cast in the net to see what comes in. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I'll move it. Commissioner Sorry. Kim. Thank you, Judge. Four quick points. Uh, the first is the first one of which is is that um, it's O'Donnell, and so I'll be voting negative there. Number two, though, Judge, uh, comes to the RFP slash grant. Do we have an idea of how much is going to be spent on this? Uh, I know that you won't know your details until you get your RFP in, but we generally know what the grant should be uh, or what the overall costs are. Number three. The total would be 80,000 from the safety and justice challenge and 250 from O'Donnell. And both, both of those would total 330. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, next one was addressed in part by Commissioner Garcia, which deals with the victims. One of the biggest problems, if you are a victim, you are also a witness. And many times if you have cases that can that the defendant chooses not to show, the victim shows. They go through a traumatization, a re-traumatization. And then if there's a no-show, they spend all day there waiting, and then the case gets reset. Finally, the person gets caught again, uh, and you get a new date, and you have a new date, and the victim has to come in, and they go through that whole process a second time or a third time. Ultimately, the victim, victim doesn't even show anymore who is the witness, and the defendant gets to walk. And so part of a system needs to make sure that when we are making sure that we have appearances and we make it easy for the defendants to come in, that those who are the primary witnesses, who are the victims, who are also, that we don't re-traumatize our victims, uh, especially in cases of uh, violent crime like rape and robbery and whatnot, to where they go through a whole new re-traumatization. So I'm very, very concerned. Commissioner Garcia picked up on part of that. I think in his days as HPD, he saw the abuses that sometimes happen to your witnesses who are also your victims mm -hmm. and to make sure that we don't have, have that problem. The third thing is, is that maybe it's just the rice guy. I mean, maybe because it's 640 in the afternoon, evening, but innovative and promising, but also evidence-based, those aren't necessarily consistent. If it's evident, if it's evidence-based, it won't necessarily be innovative because evidence-based means it's already done. I just, uh, I just, that's a very minor point. I was just seeing how the words were all playing out there. Commissioner Ellis. Commissioner Kiko, and we are 100% committed to making sure that survivors of crime receive the resources necessary to begin the healing. And we, we are 100% uh, committed to that. So uh, the, this particular grant, community engagement grants, the, the groups that can qualify for receiving very much fall in line of the constituencies that you are talking about. Um, and, uh, and because this is part of the O'Donnell case, the, it is a mandate uh, to be able to provide these services to, to the communities um, to to individuals that cannot afford, that is that's a reason why they have also been incorporated here. But it encompasses the constituencies that we're talking about and that we all so clearly care about and want to support one hundred percent. Yeah, judge. Yes. Did you have a question? Tom? No. Yeah. I just want to stress that it is part of a settlement. Uh, the settlement that we were sued over. Now, I think we ought to put all of the resources that we're willing to pay for uh, in the victim services. What we're gonna pay for, we had that broad discussion earlier this morning, but this is part uh, of a settlement. I think it would be good, and I'll try to work up some language, ask Jed to help me, to 
to maybe have the uh, dad department or have uh, the office of the uh, commissioner's court analyst look at what do we currently fund and how do we fund victim services? Uh, and I guess in the past, we were putting no money in there trying to help with these appearance rates. It would be good to go and review what we put in victim services and where does it come from uh, and, and review how that is spent. Uh, so if you would, Dr. Perry, if you just work with my staff to work it up, I'll, I'll put in a request, you know, whether it's item on the agenda, what but it'd be good to look at what is done, who does it, and how effective they have been. But as I said, we do have to pay for it. This, this is just part of a settlement. And was a total dollar amount. You mentioned the RFP, but was there a dollar amount in the settlement or what we would put into this type of service? RFP part was 300. Were you counting the, the programmatic phases and the RFP for the 300,000? Was it 80 and the 200, sir? It's um, 80 from the safety and justice grant and the rest is for O'Donnell. And that would be the total amount that these groups could, uh, you know, they have to be divided up, right? So that's the right. total. So the total is 280. I'll move it. I'll move it. Yeah. Okay, so there's a motion by Commissioner Ellis. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Garcia. And it's simply an RFP, right? Yes. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Right. Opposed? No. no. I'm in favor. Thank you, Dr. Motion carries three to two. Thank you, Doc. My pleasure. Item 319, Commissioner Garcia. This is uh, the Prompt Payments app item. Oh, yes. Thank, thank you, Judge. 319. Yeah, 319. Um, the Office of uh, Economic Equity and Opportunity has began to set goals on contracts and have uh, been adding uh, contracts with subcontractors into our B2G uh, now system. And uh, so I'm asking for uh, this uh, analyst for their office right, to determine if vendors are getting paid. Actually, this, I, I, I apologize uh, this, now that I read my motion here uh, entirely. This is a motion to the commissioner's court analyst office and auditor's office to assess uh, Harris County compliance with the Prompt Payment Act and assess uh, payments processing times to vendors over the last five years. So um, I'm asking for the analyst office and the auditor's office uh, to determine uh, if vendors are getting paid in a timely fashion uh, this may or may not have an impact on any subcontractors and consultants on any of our current projects. And uh, the reason for this is, is because as um, you know, we're all talking about the economy and, uh, and making sure that, that uh, we're creating performance. The same thing goes to the way government uh, pays its vendors. It has historically been very, very slow. And uh, since we're not yet tracking all subcontractors in our respective uh, businesses, I, I, I just made me, remi it reminded me when I first came into the office, how many times I was getting letters of demand from attorneys of subcontractors who had not been paid. I mean, I was getting stacks literally on a daily basis. And so uh, thanks to my staff, they worked on this. But I, I've left uh, I've left it alone since I'm not getting the letters anymore, which is a good thing. But needless to say, um, we always ask, you know, how's Harris County doing? And what I've been told in the past is that we're better than the city of Houston. Well, when you're better than the city of Houston, that's not a good threshold uh, to be measured against because the city of Houston isn't great at all. So I want to make sure that we are in full compliance of the Prompt Payment uh, Act. And I want to, uh, I've been meaning to ask for a study on this. So this is a motion uh, to the court analyst office and auditor's office to assess uh, the Harris County uh, compliance with the Prompt Payments Act and assess payments processing times to vendors over the last five years. Second. That'll be my motion, thank you. Yep, Commissioner Ramsey. Quick comment. This is a really, really good, good point, uh, Commissioner. 
uh, the numbers of small businesses that this impacts. Because remember, this is paying the prime. And all these primes have MWBEs, DBEs. They don't get paid till the prime gets paid. That's correct. If these end up getting delayed 60 days or 90 days, it ends up being a big problem. So it's this is a this is a huge deal, particularly uh, this time. Thank you. So there's a motion by Commissioner Garcia, yes, second by Commissioner Ellis. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia. Thank you. It's important. Commissioner Ramsey, uh, 327. Just want to go over, there's been a lot of discussion. I'm not going to read everything here, but there were some things, at least, uh, I was not aware of in the original uh, review of this when it was brought before in June. And I think this would be instructive as we go forward in terms of, of how we how we communicate, how we do these things. Um, so just quickly going down, I wasn't aware of the amount of contract. That wasn't discussed at table. Now, maybe it was in a document, but it wasn't something we discussed uh, at the table in terms of the amount of the contract. Just like we, we talked uh, today about an RFP and it was going to be about this much, but... Uh, that was not, at least that, that was not mentioned uh, when this was brought. Obviously, ET Health uh, uh, was, went through an evaluation. Uh, there was a two-step process, I think we should clearly uh, define, two-step process. UTL came in first on the first step. Then there was an interview. And then during the interview, uh, it was determined that uh, they would not be selected. In fact, they were dequeued. So I'm questioned why it would be, well, if they were dequeued, why were they allowed to submit in the first place? And then uh, uh, the, the, the difference between the bid, I think UC Health was roughly uh, 7.5 million. Uh, Elevate was roughly uh, 20 million. That's quite a that's quite a spread. I've done a lot of proposals through the years. Uh, some of them, most of them, qualifications based. Some of them with head qualifications. That just seemed like a big uh, a big stretch in terms of going from uh, twenty million down to seven. Uh, there's this issue on financial requirements. Uh, uh, we can define, as I understand now, why what those financial requirements are. I will tell you that some firms have reached out to me that have done outreach, uh, similar type work in in Harris County, MWB Easy. Uh, they said, had we known, we would have submitted. That's one point. The other point is, well, they had financial requirements for them on any of their contracts. Of course, different contracts, different requirements, but I don't necessarily think uh, financial requirements is a bad thing. It's probably uh, it's probably a good thing. So that kind of speaks to the advertisement as we look at these things going forward. Uh, being sure that we get as many people uh, involved as as possible. Uh, this was uh, I know you sent out to a number of people, fourteen or plus, and we had four submitted. But there were a lot of people that obviously this has been discussed much that would have said, well, we know how to do that. We could have done that, would have submitted on it. We just didn't know about it. So at least there was some number of people that would have submitted had they uh, had they known about it. And then it's in the subcontractors and who they were and when they are. Usually uh, if those are key factors, I know uh, Typically, as I submit, I remember doing these uh, submittals to government agencies. I'm very proud to list my subs, and we would have that whole conversation. It was about who was doing the project. It was prime, it was a sub, so it was a big, uh, big discussion. That really wasn't uh, that really wasn't known to me, at least in the uh, original uh, discussion. And finally, we were told, and I think Mr. Ellison and I both said, you know, when you get it all done, negotiated, bring it back, 
we'll have another look at it. Uh, it was never brought back for that next look at it when we got the numbers negotiated. So those are the, I think when we look at this, obviously item 372 uh, is a recommendation to um, cancel. But I think it's instructive that when we look at this, uh, going forward, at least as an example, uh, I think these are some things I think we should look at. Uh, Dwight or Dave, do you want, you guys want to take these questions? Sure. I, um, Judge, I can take a few of these. My apologies if I look a little dark. Um, I still don't have power, so I'm working with uh, a generator. So if you can't hear me, I'll just let me know. Um, I hear you. So, Commissioner uh, Ramsey, I appreciate the point you brought up. And I'll, like I said, a lot of these we've discussed. Um, as far as the contract amount, uh, the reason why we put it in the documentation that we do in the backup and not at court is because this is an RFP, which is a request for proposal, of course, as you know. And we can't divulge those numbers at court until those jobs are awarded to uh, preserve the competitive bid process with the RFP. So that's why I send those to you guys um, early on with the backup as a confidential document that's just shared with the court members. So um, I'll be sure just to make sure your staff is aware of what's coming out. And if we need to add details of those backups, we can. Um, as far as the firm rankings, um, we are, there's always room for improvement, I agree, and unfortunately in this situation, um, my senior staff member that was handling this one um, could have done a little better to job documenting it, but it is a two-step process. Uh, within those two steps, the first process is to pre-qualify the vendors and then to shortlist them and do presentations. Um, I am not able to uh, recuse anyone from submitting a bid. Uh, commissioner, regardless if their past performance was bad or not, uh, we've had that in the past. So we have to allow everyone to submit a bid and evaluate their proposals. Um, but at that point, then they can determine if they're qualified to do the work or not. Um, and depending on their scope, you know, how they're graded out. Um, and as far as the dollar amount, uh, the original scope that uh, was put together by Elevate was a higher scope as far as deliverables than what UT had originally presented. Um, and during the presentation, I know that was discussed and some of those uh, additives that Elevate put in, they did remove to bring the number back down to around 11 million. And of course, since UT did not score as high for presentations uh, when they did their interviews, uh, they did not provide a best and final, which may have raised their number or not. Um, so therefore that number was lowered, um, with those dollar figures. Um, the, the big question I know everyone's talked about is the financial requirements. Um, and to be quite frank, a majority of RFPs don't require financial requirements unless they are tied to some type of banking contract or something of that nature. Um, in this specific one, um, we did request that upon request by the county, we had the option to pull financials. It did not state there was a requirement within there. Um, and the reason why the financials, um, we can, we can probably create something we want for every project if you guys want or the court feels that that's a good policy to have. My concern is, is we got to be careful how we pull these financials and where we stipulate what's a good financial, how much you're allowing on those financials because of the small businesses, like you said, that are going to submit. So um, in this instance, um, we when the negotiations took place, uh, we made it clear to the vendor we weren't paying any dollars up front. Therefore, there was no risk to the county. Um, because the vendor did request some payments up front for services before render. We, we refused to do that because the county doesn't pay beforehand. Therefore, those risks were removed. Um, and we were considering a payment bond, picking, getting a payment bond to ensure that the subcontractors were going to be um, covered in case they weren't paid on time. Um, the advertisement, uh, I know that everyone's been asking about the commodity codes, who picks the commodity codes when we set them up in our system. It's a requirement by our office to pick them. We don't allow departments, committees, or anyone to pick those. Uh, we do our best based on the description of what's in the system to match. But as you and I and everyone knows, um, that list of commodities is tremendous. So um, I've already tasked my staff and I to look at ways of reducing that list down to maybe a three-digit code where it would cover a lot more of the items that vendors sign up for. That way, there's no option for them to miss a procurement. Um, we do put language in our, our webpage and everyone that states that it's up to their 
for the vendor's responsible to ensure that they check our website Fridays for postings because, again, that's a tool that we offer to the county and to the uh, vendors to notify them in case they're not aware of something's posting. But I always encourage folks when I do small business outreach or anything to check on Fridays for our postings and make sure they don't miss something. Um, but we are in the process of reviewing that commissioner and taking that advice to try to reduce those codes for individuals. Um, the other issues I think when it came to um, the subcontractors, um, we can provide that information to your staff. Um, if you guys so choose, I don't discuss it at court just because like I said, we're still negotiating, but if that's something that staff sees that, that an RFP that looks like it's of interest, we can discuss that with your staff or any court member prior to um, this coming to court. If we need to add that information as a backup, we can in the, uh, the documentation that comes back to uh, the court members before court as a confidential document. Yeah, Dwight, I I would just like, I, I think it's it's worth the effort. I, I will certainly, it'll be me meeting with you and lessons learned, if you will, and then yes, you sir. can do what you're doing here, but we could probably have a more even in-depth in conversation than this. Uh, and maybe the lessons learned be part of what I learned. But, yes, sir. I'll, but I'll again, I would like to have that conversation. Yes, sir. I'll set up some time with you. And I, if there's any other items you want me to address here, I'll be glad to address them if you like. And I think in light of this, in order to uh, communicate uh, and document, I think an audit is worth. I mean, w once you cancel a contract, which it sounds like we're about to do, I think it's worth uh, a simple audit to say, this is what we got, this is what we paid, and close it out just to, as a matter of, of protocol and business. Yes, sir. That's the plan. I think Dave and Jay agree that we talk about that's, a, that's the next steps. Public Health and, and County Attorney's Office does that on all contracts we terminate um, or cancel. Um, we'll do our final audit work with the Auditor's Office as well. Dwight, you went through some of the questions. Can you go through the rest? So sure. So, including the rest. as far as the committee composition, um, Commissioner, I know that folks have asked that question. Um, it's been simple practice in the county, and this has been over many years, that the departments that usually initiate the, uh, the RFP or the, uh, the, if you will, the um, scope of service they're looking to put out, that they work with our office to create that committee. It's not necessarily an all or none when it comes to court members. Um, I know because each court member has their own uh, precincts and they have their own initiative that they do as well. So in the past, we've worked with each group when they came to us and said, hey, we'd like to do a procurement, no matter if it's a court member, elected official, or a department, we work with them to create those committees that best represents, you know, who's who's overseeing that process. Um, I have had conversations with the uh, county attorney and Jay's, uh, Dave's office about looking at ways to uh, maybe do a better way of creating those committees, and we're working on that. But that's been the practice for many years, as long as I've been here. Um, and as far as the agreement that was voted on, um, I think the discussion did take place at court originally about where we're going to bring the agreement back or not. And the language that I'd stated in the, agree in the letter that stated that um, we were requesting authorization to approve it and have the judge execute it. And I think the court, if I'm not mistaken, agreed. And maybe it was just y'all voted on and some of you disagreed to not bring it back because of the time essence of it. But I, I have to go back and listen to court. But the way I wrote the letter um, was authorizing the judge in the court's office, the commissioner's court, to approve the agreement of the letter and the award and have the judge executed upon completion of negotiations with the county attorney. Um, and this has happened in the past in other contracts. We try to get the agreements to you early, but if it's time sensitive or if it's something going on, it's immediate need, then we, uh, we do our best to submit it ahead of time and then work with the county attorney to finalize negotiations. Um, as far as the budget transfers, I'd have to let Dave refer to that. And, and in the course of termination costs, uh, we're going to work with public health, the auditor's office, and the county attorney to finalize that as we did the one for Holloway uh, recently and the other terminations that we've completed. So I think that's all the questions, Judge, unless I'm missing uh, one other, any other aspects of this. I don't think so. Commissioner Ellis? Yeah, th thank you, Dwight. J Judge, I, I want to say, first of all, I, I applaud you for thinking outside the box in the health department, because I think trying to get folks uh, to get vaccinated is, in a lot of ways, 
going to require some out of the box thinking, as was the case to get people to sign up for the census. Uh, this is something that had been done before. Uh, and obviously, there are challenges along the way. Uh, you get a lot of bricks thrown at you, but I applaud you for doing it. Uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm proud of you for doing it. Uh, Dwight, I think what I heard you say is there's nothing different in this process from many of the contracts that we voted on on this agenda out of 172 items today. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And if we're going to change the composition of committees, why don't we look at these contracts that come out of the commissioner's offices, by the way, for picking engineering? I don't know what kind of committees. I, I was, I've never been asked to serve on any committees. What items on here from three, four, two? You know, it's just kind of a unilateral decision for what? You got me? So if we're going to change that, let's change it all. Uh, but I, I, I just think that sometimes there's a tendency when somebody can get a few political points to go throw a few bricks out there. But it'll be good to go and review that process. We can make that a lot more transparent. Have you ever been asked for some recommendations on a committee to review engineering contracts coming out of precinct offices? You no, sir, I don't have Sorry, I don't handle those. It goes through engineering or the other precincts. Oh, you yeah, hadn't been asked. I just wanted to say if we want right. to, I may have some proposals on that. That'd be real interesting. Thank you. Um, did you have any other questions, Commissioner Murphy? Okay. I did go back and look at the transcript, and I'd encourage you guys to review it as far as the, there's a quote, the scope and the order and the magnitude of the dollars I looked at, referring to the contract that was brought up, that's coming out of your, your mouth, Commissioner Ramsey. So you discussed the magnitude of the contract as well as the identity of the firm. So I would just check. I mean, I think we've heard, we went through all the questions. One thing that's clear is this absolutely nothing done here that was in any way deviating from the most adequate protocols and what is said and we heard some of it from the speakers and i know we're going to get to the other item is but judge i just say this there's certainly far more in writing on this than there has been on many of the other items that are on this agenda today and every other week that comes from recent ones. Well, and it's just so sad that that the COVID response is is being politicized. You know, first it was the politicization of masks. Then it was the politicization of parameters in schools where suddenly you're not required to report if your kid was in contact with a kid who had COVID. Then there was the outreach contract. So I am not I did not ask to cancel this because anything was done wrong. This has been run down ad nauseum, ad nauseum. Well, that's but it. it's yeah. just a Judge, are we moving to cancel it or are we not? No, we're going to cancel it and at appropriate time I'll make a motion. So okay. that's this side. If, if, that's if that's what we're item. doing. Is that this item? I'll make a motion. No, this was the item asking, okay. asking the various questions that we've gone through and um, Clarified ad nauseum. Okay. There's another item. For item yeah. 327, the one we're on. Is there any action on that one? Any action? Thank you. Then there is, since we're discussing this, I think we ought to take the related item, which is the cancellation. I'll make the motion. And that is item 372 on page 40. That's a request by purchasing to terminate this agreement. Judge, uh, I'll yeah. simply make the motion and uh, uh, if there's a second. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Any additional comments? Thank you. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Judge, I just say to you, it's best, obviously. I yes. just say to you, don't be uh, cautious or reluctant to come up with additional innovative ideas. You know, yeah. I, I was just so pleased. I thought Judge Whitley was calling me up to chew me out about a disagreement we had many years ago. He's calling to ask for information. 
on, on your program for outreach in terms of paying folks to get their shots. So just keep up what you're doing. Yeah, Thank so you. the motion carries, I'm in favor unanimously and uh, it just breaks my heart to see another casualty. It's lives, it's the COVID-19 crisis. And, and that is a casualty of the political forces that started with President Trump politicizing the pandemic. So this is not the first outreach contract in the country that has been politicized. So well, let the record is, reflect my eyes are rolling. Okay. We'll, we'll say that to everybody who's died or gone sick. Just keep working as you do have more ideas. I will. You have support. Yeah. Judge, when you're, when you're casting the broad band that when there's a disagreement, it's all political. That's just not fair. Yeah, I, I do think the situation is quite unfair. It, it, it does break my side. All right, next item. So we'll go back up a little bit because we skipped down to the cancellation. So the next item is 365. 365, those are the rules that we've been talking about for three years, and they're finally here. So, and yes. So Jess, I just, the, the, a couple of just simple questions. So came up earlier today on the speakers. Um, when we are out of COVID, um, will people still be able to call in? Now, now that, that we are here, will people still be able to call in under these rules? Uh, to dial in as opposed to come into the room and will they get to speak? We have 372 items on the agenda. Can somebody, if we have more than 25 speakers as I read it, does, did he get to speak one minute on each one? I just want to know what's the understanding under, under these rules. Um, County Attorney, do we have that in here? Now I'm, I'm thinking, I don't remember seeing it, Commissioner Ellis. I wonder if we so, missed yeah, that. Yeah, when I saw it, it was on. It, it didn't make it clear, and I was just wondering. And I want to hear all we can from the public. Uh, but at uh, my age, with all of my and uh, in, in all of my challenges and all, I just want to know if I have to go to my office and watch you all on video myself. So Jay, do you know? If you yes, yes. So, so as so, two things. One, um, the rules that the county judge's office has uh, uh, has has put together, and our office assisted. Uh, in it is a, is a, for the most part, uh, a strong uh, reflection of what the current practices of the court is, with with two real exceptions. On the on, because of the large number of speakers we often get, the idea was is that if you have more than twenty five speakers uh, on uh, speaking before the court, that the the time of three minutes would be reduced for all speakers. To one minute, because we we did not want to have a situation where you know, sort of the twenty six speaker got number one uh, got one minute, but the previous twenty five got three. So everyone would get one minute. What we did not do, I think, is is that for in, in character and in, in, in deal with were individuals who spoke on multiple items. Um, and so I, I I do think there's probably. Do you think room. he's asking about the speakers being able to call in virtually? So really oh yes, yes. I, I, I'm sorry, Judge. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, the current practice um, has been uh, to allow people to do both to come to both uh, speak uh, live, but also speak um, virtually or through the phone. Um, that was something um, that the. But the court, the judge in particular, I thought wanted uh, that that level of transparency and public engagement, um, and was something that um, that we we continued to carry over. Um, if that's something that the court wants to to move away from, that's certainly something they can do. No, I think we just want to make sure that it, that it, that that's possible within the rules, right? So yeah, I just really yeah. both I'm asking about. So first, first one would be yes. I guess you're saying people will be able to come in person or they'll be able to, to dial in. Yes, they can do both right now and they'll be, continue to be able to do both. And they'll be able to sign up for one minute on all 272 items. Right now they can do that. that based on the rules, that's been what our current practice is. So this is just a suggestion from right and no one else. And whatever the court decides, I'm certainly going to live with it. But I want to know because I'm not going to be in here. So uh, can I go to my office and watch it virtually as well? 
I'll uh, hear it. Yes, but I'd like, I'd like if if, if uh, my cousin Harry is sitting up at home in his pajamas <laughs> and giving me his thoughts, I'd like to sit in my office and hear his thoughts so I can take copious notes and remember all of those thoughts. Sure. I mean, Commissioner, if you if you want to, um, I mean, the current rules are three people have to be in there for a quorum to exist. I can well certainly be there virtually. Just, well, I mean, just so um, we know, that's just for this old man. So you can make, let the record reflect on an ongoing basis. This old man will listen and take copious notes, but I'm going to do it virtually. So, so I don't want to have to request for every meeting, but if old Harry sitting up at, at home in his pajamas can just call in here and give his thoughts on all 272 items, Rodney wants to listen and take copious notes, but I'll do it virtually. I don't want sure. to ask you to record. Just let the record reflect. I'll be listening and taking copious notes virtually, if that's what you all well, want. Well, I've already signed up for one in October, so I've got dibs on one in October. Well, that two of us can begin. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I'll be here for the rest sure. of it. But when sure. Harry's I'm talking, gonna, I'm going to listen to I'm going to take off take Commissioner notes. Ellis's humorous point and just make a motion that for anybody who is speaking, that they get one minute and they can talk about whatever they want to. They get to talk about it. Um, you know, so then you're going to have many, Josh up here. If you have more than 25. Joshua. But I do think that it's very important <laughs> that we we give notice to those who sign up to speak that if there are less than 25 speakers, they will be given three minutes. If there are more than 25 speakers, they will be given one minute and that we post a per item. Period. I'm going to second that motion. Period. As much as it pains me, Kevin, I'm going to suck it because I'd hate for you all to be in. I'm telling you, I won't be in here. Yeah. One, well, you, you get three minutes, period, if there's less than 25. Now, look, and you get one minute. They can submit a statement, right? Period. They can still submit a statement. They can, call, they can still they can submit a letter. Yeah. They could write us, email us, snail mail us. I don't, um, I don't want anybody to think that we don't want to get the input. Telegram. I, I made it for 26 years in Austin, passed 700 bills, but, but I don't have to have everybody say the same thing somebody else said. I, I hear it pretty good. Commissioner? So, so, so my, my, my point would be, I've, I think I've got a motion in a second. It is three minutes per person on whatever subjects they want to talk about. No matter how many they signed up for. As long as it's under 25 people. If it's more than 25 people, it is one minute per person. But when they sign up, we have it both posted in the place they sign up, and then we give them a notice of some kind, like an email confirmation that says, you're responsible of keeping track of how many people it's going to be. Judge will announce at the beginning of the court, we're going to have more than 25 speakers today, so everybody will get a minute so that no one gets blindsided and they prepare a three-minute speech and then they get one minute. Thousand, That's not fair. A thousand people show up to have a minute each. Yeah. Well, if it's 26, they get a minute each. Um, so I'm fine with the 25 cutoff and then it's going to be a minute for everybody, but the, but the rules need to be clearly posted. They need to be given to the individuals who are signing up and they um, also need to have the email address to where they can submit written comments if they want to attach. I will third that. He seconded sure. it. <laughs> yes, Jay. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, um, uh, Judge. Um, yeah, we can certainly do that and make sure that uh, Lucinda and the agenda office and the uh, county administrator will make those changes so that's clearly posted on the website. It, but just for clarification purposes, this is a, it, it's, it, we're essentially what we're saying then is that speakers allotted either three minutes total on whatever the, the items are or one minute, depending on if there's more or less than 25. Um, and so, so that is a change, but that's, that's something we can, we can certainly do. Yeah. So we and, and, and it's a change from what we've been doing for the last three years, but Correct, yeah. previous to that, we used to limit 15 minutes per subject. And if you had more than, than five people, we'd send them in the hallway and say, y'all work it out amongst yourselves. Otherwise we're taking the first three of you or four of you and alternate. So this is a nice little compromise, I think, that gives everybody a chance to talk as opposed to just limiting it to time. TxDOT limits their comments to, I think, an hour. 
uh, total. And if you're past that one hour, you're, you're done for. So I think this is a nice compromise that everybody wants to talk it to say something. But when it's more than 25, it's a minute apiece. If I might, I'd like to ask, uh, Jay, did you all look at what other entities in Texas are doing, commissioners' courts in particular, or city halls? Because we are letting people dial in now. I just know when I was in Austin, you know, look, I get it sometimes when you want to pack the room. You know, I've been the victim of packing, and I've done some packing. I've seen <laughs> you packing. Every time. And, uh, yeah. yeah, so, but my point is, you know, obviously it's more effective if somebody's in the room. I get it during COVID, but when this is over, so I'm, I'm just letting you know, I, I want to know what other people are doing. Well, when COVID is over with. Well, you need I'm, to I'm, ask and decide that now, because I'm saying, granted, I want them to be safe, but obviously there's a tendency for more people, and some to be a little less, it's a diplomatic phrase. Yeah. Um, a little less diplomatic when they when they just sitting up at home and can dial in. Electronic courage is what you're referring to. Yeah, you got me. I, uh, yeah. So, but what are others doing? What what's sure. they doing in Bear County in that respect? Or at City Hall. Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, Commissioner Ellis, um, I, I can say this without any, I think, any qualification that no commissioner's court has been as open and transparent in terms of access to the public as this one has, at least over the last two and a half years. Um, and it's, I think it's been, a, it's a testament to wanting to have public input. Now, how you want to limit that is really up to the up to this court. What we tried to do in, in working with the judge's office is to reiterate that the, um, we wanted to maintain, I think that high level of transparency and accurately reflect kind of what you currently do. Um, Again, if the court wants to make you know limit that, I get that. Uh, Let me make this point, if I might. You can. Let yes, me sir. make this point. We've been this since ten o'clock this morning. We've honored everybody who's done a great job, and there are many. Now, in in Austin, we set up a separate time so we can honor many people, and that's important. But then, when we get to the issues that really do, oftentimes impact the quality of somebody's life, or whether or not they live or die. Then we're in a hurry, you know, because it's only twice a month, the five of us to control the purse springs coming in meet. Now, I used to be an advocate of uh, meeting two days a week, then I kind of changed my attitude because then sometimes, sometimes people get worried. But look, no matter how frustrated I may get, there's nothing more important than five of us do than deliberate and make a decision on how we're going to spend that money. So it's real nice and it sounds good to say we want to be transparent, we want openness, openness, and then we're sick and tired of one another and don't want to talk. I, I after think you heard, heard from all Are people. you pointing those glasses at me, Commissioner Ellis? No, I'm doing it because I, I can't see. I think you're making, you're making a really good point. And Jay, this is worth looking into further, that Just it's 7.30 tonight, and I'm not sure how many people are still with us. So even if we limited by, and your text says you got an hour, maybe that's too restrictive, but we want more people involved with these kind of discussions we're having now, rather than by, you know, being four hours here uh, with a lot of folks that are sitting at home, as, as Mr. Ellis said, with nothing, uh, a lot of times just sharing, sharing their opinion. So I, I think there's a balance there, but in transparency is, I think we want people to participate with us on these big agenda items, but it appears that because we're trying so hard to get as many people in here in as many different ways as we can, I think we're sacrificing some transparency on the big items like you're talking about for the sake of some other ones. So, so, I'm saying that, but I'm also saying, Commissioner, when it's eight o'clock at night, and we've been there till one in the morning. And then we are making decisions. You talked about something that was not discussed at the table on uh, contract earlier. With 272 items meeting twice a month. I mean, it's pretty, it's much different from what I had to go through being, being in Austin twice a month. So the options are, if you want all the transparency, that's good. But we need to meet more. But what we do is we're exhausted. 
but we making decisions on really big items. I mean, I grant it, the input is important, but sometimes when all that input comes in, it's going right on. Can, can, I, uh, can I propose something? So I think we can add a line that says, each speaker is allowed either three minutes total if if there are under thirty five under twenty five speakers, or one minute total if there are over twenty five speakers, irrespective of how many items they sign up for. That covers uh, Commissioner Ellis's first point, and I and I think I take Commissioner Cagle's point, or whoever brought it up, that we ought to post this online and and here at the court because you guys see people will speak and then they get excited they decide now they want to talk about something else. And so maybe we we put it up, people know. Um, Commissioner Ellis, your second point on whether we should continue to allow virtual participation, I think that's a question we can answer once we get past COVID. So I don't think that's something, I, I, I think for as long as there's COVID or it's this serious, you know, folks aren't comfortable coming down here. So we ought to keep it and we can read. I agree with that. I just want to make sure when it's over with. <laughs> yeah, you all get in, but it's all right. Whatever three one is fine. Well, we can, I'm gonna we watch it personally on too. this one. Judge, maybe we say something along the lines of when uh, when we're at level yellow or below, we require in person. But see, I I think the virtuals will afford it. Can we just punt on that one and see if I we can, can punt on it for now? But, okay. but I do think it's valuable to have people come. But and then and, that's good. and they could be I get they could be changed at, at any time. Anybody can put something on that and do it. I wouldn't do it because I don't want anybody to think I'm rude. I'm going to watch it and I'll be there and be taking copious notes. And I'm hoping that y'all will set it up so it'll be in the minutes. So in case my notes are wrong, I can say, well, let me pull the minutes. On the point about the, how long it takes, I will just offer that today we had two hours worth of speakers and a lot of them didn't have power. And so we really only had, I don't know, one hour worth of speakers and one hour worth of resolutions. And we started at 10 and it's seven. So yeah. we it'll talk, work. it's okay. not just speakers. So if we, if we extend the, you know, we, if we, I'm good with it. I'm good with it. Cause even when I pack it, I'm just going to watch it virtually. But at least I told you. Okay. okay. So, so can we add that line Jay and then, and then pass it. And then after COVID we can relitigate this, the, the virtual conversation yes ma'am absolutely okay so so james so the item it's a motion to approve the the rules as presented with an an, an addition of the line i read which i'm happy to reread yes ma'am if you don't mind reading yeah. the line each speaker is allowed either three minutes total if there are under 25 speakers registered or one minute total if there are over 25 speakers registered irrespective of how many items the speaker registers for. Is there a motion? Second. Or move. Second. Okay, motion by Commissioner Garcia, second by Commissioner Ramsey. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. My staff is also getting delirious. Yeah. And we're just and we're just instructing everybody to post copiously and often. Yeah. So that everybody knows what the rules are and no one feels blindsided by them. Motion carries unanimously. I'm in favor. Okay. Uh, next is uh, Commissioner Ellis. Oh, this is the third report of the independent monitor regarding O'Donnell. Judge, if they on the phone, I just think it's it's important. I don't want you all to be tired, uh, but have them walk through it. Do we have if the monitor? Brandon Garrett, you're unmuted. Hey, hello. Um, thank you again for having us. Um, my colleague, Sandy Guerra Thompson, I think is having tech issues, and so I don't think she's on with me. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to share with the court our, our third report and our work. We wanted to make three brief points. I just heard the discussion about keeping conversation online uh, brief. Uh, we want to first emphasize our role, since it is an unusual role to be presenting to you from. You know, as, as many of you know, you know, our sole role is to report to the federal judge, Chief Judge Rosenthal, uh, about our work of observing progress under the misdemeanor consent decree in O'Donnell. We we're appointed because the prior system of misdemeanor bail was found unconstitutional after years of litigation, which we ourselves took no part in. Uh, the party settled the O'Donnell case and constructed the, the terms of the consent decree. 
And our, our work pertains only to misdemeanor cases, not, not felony cases. We don't represent any party to that case. We are neutral, independent, and aim to report to the federal judge and to the public in as complete a form as possible. Uh, second, on the implementation of this consent decree, uh, people often mean different things by even a simple term like bail, and certainly the phrase bail reform. Uh, Harris County under O'Donnell is in implementing a quite comprehensive model of bail reform. This consent decree is about much more than just decisions whether to release someone pretrial or detain them, although the consent decree absolutely governs that in misdemeanor cases. You know, at the point of arrest under this consent decree, as you know, there are general order bond releases of certain low-level misdemeanors. At bail hearings, the process has changed and there's a increased procedural due process protection. There is a public defense representation and discovery and additional due process protections, making making these misdemeanor bail hearings far more robust. Electronic discovery was implemented for these bail hearings earlier this year, which is noteworthy. I'm not sure any other place in the country provides electronic discovery before bail hearings. Uh, most misdemeanants are low risk and a few are detained, but we need to assure for those that are out on release or bond or other conditions, that they appear in court over time with sound rules and supports, which the consent decree also provides for, to help people comply with their legal obligations. The new court appearance rules have been in place this year, but it's still fairly new. The system of electronic court notifications, which we think will make a huge difference, will be implemented by November 1st, thanks to some incredibly hard work by Universal Services and others in the county. Uh, sound holistic defense. Uh, during the misdemeanor merits process is, is also one of the targets of the consent decree. And there's a major report produced this summer on that topic. So we want to emphasize that this is a seven-year project. We're a year and a half in, but it may not be another year before we really start to see the impacts of many of these improvements. Third, on the patterns in the data that we've observed, uh, we describe in our report very positive trends overall. But of course, we also report some negative trends. And our job is to report what we find, warts and all. We certainly see, and this is just the, a big picture finding, that there are fewer misdemeanor arrests in Harris County each year. And that has been a steady trend dating to before this consent decree was entered. We also see fewer people rearrested uh, who had been earlier arrested for misdemeanors in each year. So it's, on the question, did this rule change, the adoption of Rule 9 in this consent decree, cause some kind of a crisis of some kind? Is there more criminality as a result of these multi-level misdemeanor bail reforms? So far, no. The level is not higher, it's lower. We see fewer misdemeanor arrests and fewer misdemeanor rearrests. We do note that if you focus only on people who are on bond, it gives the impression that criminality is up, which is not true. And the reason why is that before the Rule 9 change in February uh, 2019, very few people were out on bond. Almost everyone, uh, was denied unsecured bond, and uh, most couldn't afford cash bond, and they pleaded guilty and were released after a few days, having concluded their case by pleading guilty. We just want to emphasize that we should take a long view. We'll know a lot more about the new court appearance rules, the new electronic notifications, and their impacts on how cases progress when they're put into place. We plan to report on more detailed information about vulnerable populations. We highlighted in our last report that homeless and severely mentally ill-flagged people were twice as likely to be rearrested, and uh, that maybe reflect social needs that nothing in bail hearings or the court system can address when people like that keep cycling in and out of the misdemeanor system. Uh, and we, we hope to be able to tell you more about that in future reports. But that, that's our, the big picture of our work. A lot of implementation is in place, but some major pillars will be implemented later this fall. And we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have now or later. Commissioner Ellis. Thank you, uh, uh, Doctor. Can you just uh, remind us who is who's on your team? Oh, of course. Apologies. So my name is uh, Professor Brandon Garrett. Uh, just a lawyer, not a doctor. I teach at Duke University School of Law, so I'm I'm out of state in North Carolina. Commissioner and I are fond of pointing out it is a Juris doctorate. <laughs> uh, and my uh, deputy monitor and close colleague and friend is Sandy Guerra Thompson, uh, who teaches at Houston Law. And uh, also part of our team are some, some of the world's leading social scientists, including Dottie, Dr. Dari Carmichael, who is a doctor, and a couple of other doctors in her team at Texas A&M at their Public Policy Research Institute, 
they've particularly taken the lead on an ongoing study of the costs and benefits and savings of of the misdemeanor bail system in Harris County. We also have Dr. Songmin Kang, an economist, a tenured professor at Hengang University in Korea who's assisting, as well as some of, of my research colleagues at, at Duke who have assisted with some of the analyses and providing advice on behavioral health issues, in particular with my colleagues at the medical school at Duke. We also have a large community working group with stakeholders throughout you know, Harris County, ranging from you know, the Business Improvement Association to folks who help to run shelters for battered women and victims groups, uh, sort of a range of different impacted groups who give us advice and meet with us and hear about our work. We meet with our community working group monthly. We also meet with, you know, stakeholders in the county monthly. We meet with magistrates, judges. Uh, we regularly meet with both the district attorney's office and the public defender's office, who are not parties to this, but they're important stakeholders in the system. And uh, that, you know, I don't know, it, it, maybe that the one silver lining of the pandemic is that it's been possible to fit in a lot of virtual meetings as part of our work uh, over this last year and a half. Just a couple of more, uh, Professor. Is, is it true that the county's practices were found to have a disparate a racial and ethnic impact? Well, we haven't seen changes over time in the racial makeup of who gets booked for misdemeanors or who comes back into the system. Um, but we have seen steady state that more than twice as many black persons are arrested for misdemeanors as their representation in the population. Uh, we've seen a very slight increase in Latinx arrestees and we have been able to make some progress in just better identifying ethnicity because there isn't great data on that. It looks like you know that ethnicity and the Latinx representation has crept up only slightly over time, but largely represents uh, population of Harris County. But not so with Black defendants. You know, the arrest rate is double. Um, and then I also mentioned we, we would like to look more at vulnerable populations. We see that homeless people and people flagged as having severe mental illness are especially rearrested um, at twice the rate of others. And there are uncertainties about the, those data. People, you know, cycle in and out of homelessness, for example. People's psychiatric conditions change. But, but from what we know so far, there is certainly overrepresentation. Somebody else on the line might have their might need to view. So what I was referring to was, I know in, in the court proceedings, that was a, two, a 2011 study that found that in Harris County, 70% of the white misdemeanor defendants obtained early pretrial release from detention, when only 52% of the Latino misdemeanor defendants and 45% of African American misdemeanor defendants do so. Uh, will you all be looking at that? Will you be tracking? Yes. Yes. But uh, no info on that yet. And let me pull up what we did, what we have so far. Um, I don't think we broke out release decisions based on race in our current report, but we, we can do that. And my recollection is that, um, that in general, you know, since the vast majority of people are released under the, under these rules, we don't see the same disparities in terms of the, the, that the cash bond system created because, you know, by definition, the old cash bond system resulted in people who are poor and people who are disproportionately minorities uh, unable to get out because they couldn't afford cash bond under the schedule. And they would often plead guilty as the only way that they could get out. And with that system gone, I suspect that disparities have been greatly reduced. And I'll have to double check with uh, my colleagues who are doctors uh, what, what we can present to you on that. And What's the process when you all present to Judge Rosenthal? Is that in a hearing you submit the reports? I know she's very thorough. She reads everything. Yes, we, we, we submit the reports every six months. That's one of the requirements of the consent decree, that every six months we, we present these detailed reports. They're a whole set of criteria in terms of what we need to be reporting on uh, during each time period. Certainly, if the judge ever asked us for something additional, we would supply something additional. Um, and... Uh, 
And there may be times where we get information that provides an important update to something we had done before we where we would plan to supplement. So far, we haven't had a reason to do that. We've been able to get the data that we sort of needed next on time. I think I recall her saying one reason why it was important to have the these reports and independent monitors was that if there was a need to make some changes in her ruling or rulings, she could make that decision based on what is submitted. Has there been anything submitted so far in your judgment that would uh, lead to uh, making the case that somehow her ruling should be changed? No, no. so far compliance and uh, has been excellent. You know, we we really applaud all the stakeholders in the county for the hard work they've done to implement and and do so basically on schedule, despite all the demands that the pandemic has placed. And, uh, you know, there have been some delays here and there, and we've, you know, parties have notified the judge of certain missed deadlines, but they've been sort of routine issues of just approving a vendor uh, you know, over a little bit more time than you than was, you know, originally thought. Uh, so there've been some small routine delays, but incredibly hard work to, to do some, some really challenging technical work. Uh, and some things that went above and beyond, actually, you know, what what, the, what what was called for by the consent decree. For example, not just providing discovery to public defenders before bail hearings, but setting up a really sound and efficient system of electronic discovery. Uh, we also think that, you know, one, one thing that, one item that's still in progress that I didn't mention that we, we hope will be, well, we should be getting a timeline from the county soon uh, for people to be able to interact with these data themselves and observe the trends themselves, the consent decree calls for an interactive public dashboard, which we think may be more sort of intuitive for people to look at than our than our long paper reports. And so we, we and hope you, that that's you completed soon. Out. So you all will come up with some dashboard so the public can look and see what uh, the county the county will be hosting it. For the county will yeah. Do it. yeah yeah. Okay, that's good. All right, thank you, and thanks for being so patient. I hope you have been on the line since 10 o'clock. <laughs> no, no. Uh, no you, you, all, all of your staff were wonderful about letting us know when the time was right. And thank you again for, for allowing us the chance to share with you. Thank you for your good work. Oh, uh, yes, Commissioner Cable. Counselor, um, I'm, I'm curious. I know that you're keeping a lot of the data related to um, the... Uh, the accused and the system, and you were talking about disparities in the system earlier with regard to those who were arrested. Um, we know that with regard to those who are on a bond or bail, that there are some 130 something that have been uh, murdered, and there the the victims of the murder are significantly disparate. Um, I think that the number was almost 80% were people of color who were those who were the victims in that instance. In your record keeping, do you all have any records of, of who and what the demographic makeups are of the victims of the alleged crimes while you are tracking the disparities as they were with regard to the accused? Are, are you all... Do you have access to that data? Are you even trying to keep track of that data? We don't. It's not normally contained in court data. Now, many of the, you know, obviously it's been of great public concern that there's an increase in homicides in Harris County, like in many counties around the country. Even in a much smaller place like Durham County, where I live, there was a startling rise in shootings during the, during the pandemic. And in general, nationwide, what we often see is that most homicides, as with other violent crimes, are within race. And so um, there are, you know, are well-known and troubling racial dynamics. Um, it may be that some of the data that HPD reports to the FBI would contain that victim information as part of their UCR reporting, and they've, they've expressed um, great willingness to cooperate and share data that they have. And so we, we are exploring the possibility of being able to bring in some of that data I, I should note that, you know, as you know, you know, many shootings are not solved uh, of the ones that are solved. You know, many of them have involved cash bond or people out on felonies. And those are outside the scope of our role. You know, we're, we're only focused on misdemeanors, which, you know, have largely involved people who 
you know, were arrested for low-level offenses. And if they came back into the system, it was for, you know, another low-level offense. And so, you know, much of our work is, is outside this debate about um, how best to, to handle felony matters. Another point that was sort of implied in your question, which is another useful one and an important one, is that, you know, particularly in these low-level cases, um, unlike in a, you know, a, a, a homicide where someone committed a crime, we know that, or at least someone died, we know something very serious happened, which there must be a community response to, and it's a great public safety concern. In many misdemeanor cases, it may be less clear what happened. And unfortunately, you know, in the court system, what happened and whether someone should be found guilty may not be resolved. You know, we highlight in our report that about 68% of these misdemeanor cases currently are dismissed. Uh, so in the past, many, many people pleaded guilty in misdemeanor cases and the rate of guilty pleas has, has declined quite a bit. Now, uh, before bond reform, many people pleaded guilty because they couldn't afford cash bond and they were in the jail. That There's no longer that pressure to plead guilty, including due to other pressures. You know, the the Hurricane Harvey, the pandemic, all that, you know, created backlogs in the courts. And so the, we, we note in the NAP report that came out this summer noted that there have been growing delays in the misdemeanor dockets and, and perhaps some combination of, of, of you know, the work that the lawyers do in the cases or just delays has led to most of these cases being dismissed. And so it may be that a person comes back into the system more than once in a given year and they're arrested once and later on they're arrested again for a misdemeanor, but both times those cases may be dismissed. And that's typically what would happen. The, uh, Commissioner um, Ellis has a question, but I do want to clarify, there's nothing about 130 murders being caused by misdemeanor. Can you can you dig into that and, and just clear the record there? I don't want to let no, judge. Case. I was not trying to imply misdemeanor was causing that. I'm saying that the, the point is, is the disparity of of the people who have been murdered for those that are out on bond, not misdemeanor bond, but all bond as a general rule, violent criminals that are out there. Um, please forgive me if you interpreted that as being saying that misdemeanor folks were causing the murders. Oh, I just wanted to make sure. Thank, thank you for saying it because thank that you. has been a lot of scapegoating because we have only had misdemeanor bail reform here. So, I, but the judge has a valid point. I just want to make sure that he can elaborate on it too. Do you agree with the point? In no way can anybody uh, claim that the rise in crime is because of misdemeanor bail reform, Professor. You agree with that comment? Well, and you know, what we've seen is yeah, actually, yeah, yes. And you know, we've seen declining crime in the context of misdemeanors. I mean, there. There, there are certainly other crime trends that are important to look at, uh, but in general, misdemeanor arrests have been declining every year for, for several years now, um, which is not to say that there aren't, you know, important public safety related trends within misdemeanors. You know, there are, for example, more domestic violence uh, misdemeanor arrests in recent years. That's a trend that's been ongoing for some time, although those cases are a little hard to identify in the data. Uh, but in, in general, we see fewer misdemeanors uh, arrest each year and, and fewer people rearrested in misdemeanors, which is, which is positive. And, and, and again, we want to be watching these trends long-term um, and, and also focusing on who are the people who are arrested and rearrested. Are, are these, you know, disproportionately people who are, will look into racial minorities, but also vulnerable populations and whether other things outside the court system could provide more support. Commissioner Kegel. Yep. Um, the number is 135, um, which was the the number with regard to that. So the question still, though, is a even in the context of misdemeanor, allowing people to continue to commit if they are re repeat offenders or if they graduate to their felonies uh, is a regressive tax because a poor mother, um, single mom trying to raise her kids if she is robbed and her rent money is taken from her, that's going to have a lot more major impact than, than if it was Commissioner Ramsey who had the same amount of money that was taken from him. He can, you know, he can make do. He's got a savings account. It might be a traumatic event, but, but he's not going to be disadvantaged. His kids aren't going to go hungry. Um, he's going to be able to make his, his payments of his house or his car. Um, but if you are a poor single mom and you are robbed, um, 
that is going to have a significant economic impact on you. And so even in the context of misdemeanor crime, it is regressive tax on those if you are a victim of crime and you are a person of, uh, of less econo uh, you know, economic status. And so I just think it's important for us to keep track of who are the victims and to make sure that we don't have pockets of people um, who are the least able to take care of themselves that are ended up having uh, additional difficulties because they can't afford to recover as well as others can. And we need to make sure that we're paying attention to that. Well, and of course, and, and make, keeping track of the data. Yeah, and when you make the argument about uh, economic disparity, clearly, if you and Commissioner Ramsey are charged with a crime, and one of you has money, a misdemeanor, one of you has money, you post bail and get out. The other one does not have money and has to stay in jail. That is where the constitutional issue comes in on misdemeanor bail. And that's Just one of the things that you and I've been in agreement on in the very beginning, is that I've always felt that bail should be based upon a risk assessment and not upon whether you could buy your way out or swear your way out, that it should be based upon a risk assessment. Well, of course, that, that's not what was happening in Harris County. Well, we've begun the Arnold tool. Um, we began that Once process we before we the lawsuit. Yes, yeah, since we had to make sure we had enough time for everybody to sign up and speak to that, I want to 8 o'clock tonight get into it. But it was easy to say that. But the reason this court ruling came about the way it did is because we were just saying it, but we were violating the Constitution. Well, it was already implemented. And if you'll go well, back and look we at the saying, record, she shortened the time period from when she came in, but it was something that was already in the works and processing. And if we want to talk about it, we could talk about the Fifth Circuit, two opinions. I mean, but it is 10 minutes to eight. I'm just getting my energy back. All right. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay. Not a good thing. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for that update. Thank, thank you. you so much for the work you're doing. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It's an honor to get a chance to share with you. All right. Take care. Yes. Is there any action on this item? No. No. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Garcia, item 368 on the jail population. Yes, Judge. Thank you. <clears throat> and um, as, I, as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, as we were talking uh, with Mr. Barry about the uh, the backlog, um, and you know, look, uh, I want to uh, again give my appreciation to all of law enforcement for their incredible work during this pandemic. Um, now, I especially want to thank Sheriff Gonzalez uh, for his work and leadership. Um, he has been everywhere, taking care of everything. It's, he's just impressive to watch work, but I know that he doesn't do it alone. And he does it uh, with the work of so many phenomenal people. But um, no sheriff in a major county like Harris County um, during this pandemic is without challenges in running a county jail. And in his case, he's running the largest county jail in the state of Texas and the third largest in America. My staff is exhausted from the work that I have asked them to do on, be on behalf of citizens. Uh, food drives, food distribution, food, uh, 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 hot meals to seniors, uh, trying to get our community centers up and running, a million two hundred thousand linear feet of drainage maintenance, another million two hundred thousand feet of, of drainage maintenance. Uh, this year, back to back years, uh, response to explosions, chemical leaks, you name it. Uh, my staff has been all over it. Sheriff Gonzalez, uh, his staff has been dealing with the county jail where inmates are being infected with COVID. As a consequence, his staff is being uh, infected with COVID. The county jail is not the uh, most place, pleasant place to work. Uh, it's the hardest place to keep dedicated um, employees 
working at a high level and working at a high level without error. Uh, the county jail is um, overseen by the state jail commission, uh, state, uh, state commission on jail standards. Um, and let me point out this, whenever we've had uh, weather events like winter storm Uri, um, Hurricane Harvey, Ike, the governor is quick to suspend regulations. The governor has not suspended the regulations of the state jail commission on county jails across Texas. And so the sheriff has been working tirelessly uh, to keep his operations running while he has been bleeding staff. No one has to stay an employee of the county jail and many have left. They've either left to greener pastures, or they can go become patrol deputies um, or to other careers. To that end, um, we have been talking about a system. The backlog in the courts is a direct contribution to the problems in the county jail. Uh, he is at near maximum uh, capacity, if not already at maximum capacity. And, um, and his staff is exhausted. And for those who have endured this pandemic at the sheriff's office, at the county jail, I want to say thank you. The sheriff recognizes your work. He talks about you on a regular basis. He is working and advocating uh, for resources. And um, the budget office and Mr. Barry and I have had conversations about this. The county jail is one of the most complicated areas of operation uh, that this county and any county oversees. You got promotions that you got to do by the Civil Service Commission. And, uh, and if you don't adhere to those rules, you get dinged by the Civil Service Commission. If you don't maintain a 1 to 48 supervision radio, uh, ratio with your inmates, you can ding by the state jail commission. Uh, so you're literally in a no win situation. And if one of your inmates happens to escape, you get dinged again. Um, so a lot of challenges there. I bring all this up because I am uh, imploring our county, our, our judges to get the courts up and running. And uh, Mr. Berry, um, I've got some questions here that I need someone to help me answer. The jail uh, capacity, uh, in fact, I, I, when I said I thought it was uh, over capacity, it's actually maxed out as of last week, Thursday. And let me just remind folks, I inherited a county jail that um, county jail capacity is at 9,000 some odd. I inherited a county jail uh, population of 12,000, of which Commissioner's Court was sending to the state of Louisiana at a tune of 20 million a year. There are no more private jails available to outsource to. I worked to fill those contracts because I just couldn't stomach sending our taxpayers' money to the state of Louisiana, and I created contracts with Texas sheriffs. There are no more Texas County jails that can take our population. And, um, and so he's, he's uh, only a hundred, and, and this is good, but this is the same problem. When I was sheriff, um, we were transporting a thousand inmates a day, Monday through Friday to go see the judges of which about 400 ever got to, in front of a judge to a certain, to any degree. And that is key because that has all kinds of other ramifications towards jail population. But we, we used to transport a thousand. The sheriff is now transporting a, a 300 and that's not all he can transport or should. And it's all, it's not all that he should, it's all that he can under the circumstances. This is to court. To court. 300. You, you were doing a thousand. A thousand a day. 
when the courts were fully operational. And at that time, 400 got adjudicated to some degree. Today, he is transporting 300 to court every day, of only which 50%, 150, are seeing uh, uh, magistrates. And so, um, yet the, um, the JPC has two courtrooms for magistrates, but only one is being utilized, Mr. Berry. We have heard that the judges have issues with space, and I get it, but why, why are we not using this courtroom if there are those issues? Can the district courts use the additional courtroom in the JPC? I know we talked about this in, in uh, our small work group meeting, but we really need to challenge uh, this process uh, and, and challenge how we get it done. Uh, the, the district attorney has been clear that her DAs can't be in two places at the same time, but we are facing major challenges in the county jail and the sheriff is just the conveyor of bodies that the entire system brings them. And uh, he cannot tell chiefs of police to tell their officers to stop arresting people. They are out there working and those inmates continue to come. And, um, and so we need to have some options, uh, Mr. Berry. The, um, I understand that now the, the, the CJC is al almost fully operational, but there is, I understand, I'm not sure if this is accurate, but I understand that there is uh, a floor that has courtroom space that is not being fully utilized. So um, I just, I need like quick work on this matter because um, I don't know how the sheriff and his staff have done it, but they are at wit's end. And I know that your concern, my concern, our concern is that that jail is literally bleeding money with overtime, um, COVID expenses, but we have to make sure that we recognize the challenges that he's facing are two, two fun, two things. Number one, it is a, it is a, he is under a COVID operation. He's, he is running a COVID operation. Secondly, he's running a county jail. And so, um, we can, we, we've got to be clear that his budget challenges are not being put under the same, uh, that, that his full operations aren't being put under one umbrella with the COVID uh, issues that he's got. Ben Taub and LBJ can't take COVID positive inmates right now. So he's dealing with them at the county jail. Um, I believe we just approved an item to send, to, to give them a capacity to a hospital that's gonna help them to a certain degree, but this is not yet enough. So my ask is to direct the county administrator to find him the usable, practical uh, space for the judges to fully utilize and number one, to parse out COVID expenses, those will be reimbursed. Those should not be under the budget block circumstance that he might be facing. And then secondly, <clears throat> because of all the things that I laid out, he cannot, you know, unless someone here can suspend state jail commission standards or can suspend civil service standards, He's got to be allowed to do his promotions and uh, and he has got to be allowed in a planned way, obviously, and, I, and I, I'm willing to try to broker this because I understand this. I've went through the same problems. He's got to be able to plan a way to keep detention staff that have an eye to career in law enforcement out on the street, a timely way to anticipate a shot at that opportunity. Um, uh, 
And, and then we need to think about how to make sure that he can hire detention staff because he has, under the circumstances, he has an inordinate uh, attrition rate that is beyond normal times. Uh, I'm trying to recall what my attrition rate was in just in the jail, but it by far was larger than it was in my law enforcement operations because of all the circumstances that they're under. So I, I don't know whether anybody uh, from the county from the sheriff's office is on the line, but I I'll just simply say that this needs urgent and immediate attention. The governor has not suspended regulations over the jail. He continued the jail standard. Uh, the commission on jail standards continues to bear down on him. Uh, Civil service commission, no one here, and I don't know whether we have the authority to suspend civil service uh, commission rules and obligations. Um, but until something like that can happen, then we need to, number one, get the courts moving. We have a, a confirmed that we have available courtroom space, work with the DA, work with the clerk's office uh, to make sure that those courtrooms can be fully utilized and let's get them and let's get them put into the mix. But if if there is space in those courtrooms or if we have courtrooms that are available to be used, then it's a disservice to the sheriff for us not using them and moving that 300 inmate a day uh, transfer closer to 500. So hopefully that they can still hit that 50% mark, which was far better than what I used to get. So this is just a point of frustration, uh, Judge, because uh, there are real issues over at the uh, county jail. I applaud the sheriff and his staff for uh, keeping uh, a hand on it, but there is only so much that can be done and we need to make sure that, and that's why I was uh, had a bit of, of uh, impatience with a second uh, a second uh, portal or website for the courts. Um, so we need a full accounting of what courtroom space is available. We need to figure out what the staffing is. Let's get those things up and running. But there, the next problem this court's gonna face is a lawsuit by families of inmates. I do not support a mass release because we have not fully done everything on every other side that we can do. And it would just be an embarrassment if we decide to open up the county jail and release people uh, as the simplest thing to do. So I'm not supportive of that at all until we are fully maximized on every other side of the operation that impacts the county jail population. So uh, I'm, uh, again, I don't know whether, whether anybody uh, from the sheriff's office is on the line um, uh, but if they are anything you'd like to if, correct me if I'm wrong. Judge, if I may help him suspend. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on the line. Oh. Sheriff? Do you have is, anything to add, Sheriff? Is it? Hey, uh, Judge Commissioners, uh, I am on the line just to add any context. Uh, so I don't want to speak out of line. I'll let the other commissioners ask questions or, or whatever they have. I, I'm just here to give some additional context. Thank you, Sheriff. Good, Commissioner Kale. I want to add belt and suspenders to what was raised by Commissioner Garcia. The problem is, is we've got to have trials, get the cases moving. Um, we talked earlier about some of the solutions to try to do that. I was not made aware of the courtroom problem um, until you just mentioned it, I've not heard that that's the excuse, but I know that we've got several models in uh, our experience to help with the courtrooms. First model, City of Houston, with regard to their, uh, uh, their misdemeanor, they do a morning court, an afternoon court, and I think a night court. I think they run three dockets. And if you have trial courtrooms set up and then you have docket courtrooms, people don't necessarily need a docket for eight hours. Their dockets can normally get done in about four to six hours. And so we can have folks, and I know that when I was a judge, um, and I know this because our second model is, is after 
the bad rainstorm we had in 2001. Was that Allison? Um, were you born, Judge? Yes, I okay. was 10, okay? You and I are the two, you and I are two, the two youngest members of court. So we're the two youngest, we're the two youngest members of court. Um, but in Allison, we went for a long period of time with, with folks sharing their courtroom. My courtroom, we did in the mornings, and then I had another judge that came in and did trials in the afternoon. And by having afternoon trials and morning trials, we were able to get everybody done and covered. There's a way when you have a shortage of courtrooms that, you know, granted, you're going to have the trials that are going to take all day, which are your, some of your bigger juries, but most of your trial work, you can work your dockets in a six-hour segment, separate them out, share the space, and, and knock the cases out because we have done it before. We did it after Allison because the, uh, uh, the Family Law Center, the Criminal Justice Center over there, the, the county had saved $250,000 by not putting in storm doors in that building. And then we got the water in through the thing and that $250,000 savings and cost ended up costing us millions. Uh, was that penny poor? I mean, penny wise, dollar poor. Um, but we've done that. And so while they're doing their studies, if folks are saying the reason why they're not getting stuff done is because there's no space, we can have space. But they've been saying that. I, 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 Commissioner Ellis, you have a point, but let me just make the point that I, I've been caught in the middle of that argument at the beginning of COVID and the judges would say there's no space and the engineering would say there is space and then it's, you know, and in the end, and then they weren't working the full day, you know, so it just goes back to... Anyway, Commissioner Allen. That's why the, the second, the second, yeah, the, the, second the second thing is you talked about the standards. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've already used your Barney Fife bullet with somebody else, but if not, call me and maybe we can try to work together on some common sense things that may be needed to assist with the standards. Um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to get. Open Meetings Act is very important, but but if you've not used your binary five bullet, uh, we may be able to work on that. And then on the space thing, someone needs ideas. I'm not very sympathetic to people saying, oh, we can't do it because we don't have enough space. We have done it before, and we can do it again. And the city of Houston does it every day. First, I want to say that our department heads on the line, you might want to check and make sure your phone is muted. So you don't slip and say something there. Somebody's it does sound unmuted. Like I have something. a little background noise. I would unmute it. So look, I, I was just gonna say it would be interesting if JMI, those were old recommendations. The first one you made reference to, you're not ready to just open the doors, but mm -hmm. it said all violent all, all violent felony backlog cases should be moved to a group of judges, uh, uh i.e a felony backlog track who will be responsible for guiding them towards disposition. Who decides that? Is the presiding judge or do they all have to decide? Process new felony cases under written case guidelines that include scheduling orders and time standards, i.e. new caseload track. All specialty courts could be, would be suspended until the court system is more efficient. So you don't get to specialize until we got it efficient again and continue to expand the offenses which people would be eligible for either police uh, prosecutor diversion. But so it might be interesting to pull JMI in and maybe the presiding judge, we don't have to worry about the Barney Fife bullet and just have a discussion, not pointing an accusative finger on what can be done instead of us talking. They may be at home now watching, but usually when we meet, they're in court. Maybe we ought to schedule a night meeting. Well, and I think the, the two, and I, I would welcome Get your that. Phone, I, be careful. I, I would welcome that. But so we they, are in a night meeting. With, I would welcome that with the exception that time is of essence. We don't have time for a study. Um, and, and, and the second thing is, I'd like to start that conversation with a inventory of available courtrooms that are not being utilized. Uh, so I, I just want to, I just want to uh, make the point in Mr. Iyer a, a, a question to you if if we're sued and we're not fully using our resources available our courtrooms that we have and we're found to have eight courtrooms that are uh vacant and not used and we're sued for all kinds of 
you know, problems that over jail population can can create. Are we, you know, does that create a, a, a greater sense of liability for this county? I mean, it's certainly something we can look at, uh, Commissioner. I mean, I, I know there's a lot of issues around ways to sort of deal with this this problem and um and, and we'll we'll certainly look at it we'll um we can do that analysis for you thank you if somebody sued us they get that chuck it go um can i to... yeah i know Commissioner he has a comment too yeah quick comment sheriff it's it's good to see you uh uh Mr. Thank Thank you. has laid it out uh clearly uh uh i'm interested in your your thoughts as we tackle this? I mean, this comes up about every few months. If we can get some kind of uh, uh, weekly focus on how to help you get out of this mess. So uh, you're, you're hearing a full support uh, on this end. What, take us through what, what should we do tomorrow to try to help get this thing under control? Yes, Thank you very much, and thank you all. I've heard some great comments uh, around the, the, the table just now, and I'm very happy to hear that, and thank you all for your commitment to, to public safety. Um, you know, with the increase in attention uh, to public safety in our community, I think it's important for us to also be paying close attention to make sure that the entire criminal justice system is working as effectively as possible, and I would argue that since 20 you know, since Harvey, for the most part, it really hasn't, in my opinion. I think that justice in Harris County really smooth, moves at Snell's, uh, at Snell's pace uh, for a number of reasons. And I think that we feel the pinch the greatest in Harris County Jail, and I'll explain that in a little bit. But it's difficult and unsettling for my team when going into Labor Day weekend, we only have 21 available beds going into a weekend. And anybody in the North policing and corrections know that we're going into our busy time. At the time, the to slow down around the holiday for whatever reasons. That's pretty concerning coming into the fall season when we do have a lot of different holidays and extended periods of time off where the, the courts are likely to, to slow down even further. My biggest concern at this point is just it's no longer sustainable for us to continue to ask our frontline correction staff to continue to carry the weight. Because day in, day out, through weather events like last night, through winter storms, uh, just through pandemics and everything, they're always basic in front of it. And, and they're only human at some point, uh, there's a breaking point, and we see that that's why resignations are burned out. There were, we, we had to transition our shifts last just to be able to keep up with uh, the, the impacts of COVID. Uh, but now, even 12-hour shifts isn't enough. So over time, and at some point, there's a tipping point where, yes, the money may be good, but they're just simply burned out. They just need that mental break. They need to spend time with family. Uh, and I think historically, what's, what, what's ha happened in the world times is we've always tried to kind of determine staffing needs for based on um, on um, uh, minimum jail standards. We, we have to meet, we're mandated to meet a certain rate. That if somebody calls in city, they can't just say, oh, well, that, that spot goes vacated. No, we have to fill it either with overtime or redeploying someone. And so th that that's a huge burden. We have to do millions of, of, of rounds every year uh, that we're within 30 minutes minutes each, we have to be checking people to make sure that we're compliant. We're serving over 27,000 meals a day. Uh, we went from being able to stage 800 to 1,000 people per day to go to court every day down to the low hundreds. And sometimes those aren't even real effective hearings. They're just uh, more, more uh, uh, non-critical uh, hearings or settings that they're going to do. It becomes very difficult when the entire system isn't working in sync. And I know that you all, as the overseers of the entire system, want to make sure that we have an effective criminal justice system for the residents. Yes, we have to be tough on crime, but we also have to make sure that the wheels of justice are turning so that the victims can have uh, justice 
that if it merits justice or uh, can can be able to return back to to some semblance of a normal life if, if their case has been disposed of. And a lot of times those things are delayed for extremely long period of time. I'll give you an example of something low hanging fruit and we are working with Judge Johnson that's been very helpful, Kelly Johnson, but we need all judges to really step up. If we agree on resetting the reset dates to be more frequent, we had one in February of this year, uh, several actually, that have been reset till 2022. 2022 while that person's staying in jail. We have one judge without calling anyone out. I'm just making statements of the impacts that has over 570 people incarcerated on their docket on, on a pretrial basis. Aren't guilty in pretrial? That's typically more than double what some of the other judges have. So things get bogged down. The, the jail gets gets full. We're at full capacity right now. And as uh, Commissioner Garcia stated, there is no more wiggle room for even if, if we frown upon outsourcing that we could outsource, we can't do that anymore. Uh, we have many people that are on surveillance for and that takes up a lot of space. And another thing that's very, very concerning to me when it comes to our staff is that we should have 25% of our job to be um, a maximum classification offenders. I'm talking about capital murder suspects, uh, 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 assaultive individuals and what have you. Right now, it's at 75% that are serious offenders based on their profile. Uh, that they require extra care. So, so we're seeing an uptick in assaultive behavior inmate to inmate because tight quarters. You know, they you know there's not a lot of liberty. Obviously, nobody wants to be locked up. And then all, also assaultive behavior towards their staff. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to give our staff breaks, and we've really just reached the point. And y'all um, know I don't ever come to court or address you unless it's something extremely serious that I think is our attention. One of the quick things that we need to do is right now we only have the ability uh, to hire 56 jailers. Attrition and all that, even if we could get them in the pipeline very quickly with the proper screening, uh, it, it, I don't know, just 56 through attrition, we're not even keeping up. So, At the same time, once they get soon, they realize, oh, this isn't for me. So they end up leaving us. Sure, we could raise that, that we could raise that staffing level higher. Uh, we we have engaged with uh, Mr. Barry, uh, having productive discussions. We've agreed to sit down and make sure we can come up with a plan that, that makes sense, that's efficient and effective. Um, and, and we feel that we could come up with a way to not only reduce overtime, but give people a break. Uh, I don't anticipate that the jail population, unfortunately, is going to get any lower. On the contrary, I think now with the change in state law, um, we're going to be staying in jail. Um, and, 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 and so we have to make sure that we're running an effective state operation, not only for the people that are under our care, but also for the people that work for us. And when I say us, I mean the county, you all as well. Uh, because bad decisions happen when people don't have breaks, when they're burned out, and we definitely have a high burnout rate, we definitely have a high attrition rate. And, and so we need to make sure that we're really paying close attention because at a breaking point, um, I don't know what we, we will do at some point if we just are simply at capacity. So let me let me yeah. just stop you for, yeah. just for a second, just yeah. because I got a message from Judge Finch, who is a presiding judge over in the oh yes midst of, uh, the county criminal courts, and it's the it's just the oddest thing because I will get a message from a judge and they'll say that's not accurate, and then I will call you know whomever from the county and they'll sit down, and what I'll hear is the meeting was not productive. Then I will speak with the judge and they'll tell me one thing. Then I'll go to a different judge. Like Judge A will tell me they have this working group. Judge B will tell me, no, it's their working group. So, I mean, it is just a mess. And everybody thinks they're right and everybody's operating in good faith. That's why I was looking at you. I'm just trying to break this gridlock. And the, I mean, I think, Dave, that's where you come in. I don't see another one. I mean, I think. Yeah, Judge. You, yeah, just, just let me finish my thought real quick. And, and I think, you know, Dave is working with the sheriff on 
And I did ask Judge Finch if she wanted to speak, you know, to call me. So she may call. She says that some of what we were talking about the courts was not accurate. So we'll, you know, but that that's not always, you know, it, it's always contradictory stories. So um, if Dave can work with the sheriff on, you know, whatever he needs for his for his jail staff, that's one thing. But as far as the courts, I mean, I think part of it is just identifying who you know, who are the people that need to come to the table? So even if we have to take it step by step, better to start now. So Dave, you could say, you know, I have identified that these are the, the judges, the presiding judges of the different groups. These, you know, I sent an email to all the judges, they all agreed. These are the people that are gonna represent them. And these are the questions we're gonna tackle and we're gonna have the meeting on this day. And so we can, at least we know something is moving, but I, I just don't want to walk away with another vague commitment of, yes, yeah, someone will talk to some the, judges, and we've been talking to yeah. the judges. And, and, and Judge, if I, if I could. Judge, can I? Yeah. Uh, real quickly, Sheriff, let, if I could. If I, could. Judge, I, I just want to say real quick, I don't know, uh, Judge, perspective, uh, we did have a, a good conversation the other day, and, and I definitely, I, I want to be very clear, that's not my lane per se, that's why I said earlier, it's a, it's a broad, you know, uh, criminal justice system. But what I'm saying is, but what's undeniable is what our jail population is mm -hmm. and what the pretrial uh, population is because we have a public dashboard. Anybody can go look it up every day, you can see what make it looks like. You can see how many pregnant females are in there. You can see how many people over 75 years old. You can tell uh, how many are there on violent charges. All that's for the public. We, we I think we're, we're the only uh, sheriff's office in the nation that does that. And we take pride in having done that a couple years back. But our population is what it is. So regardless of what ends up happening, it's not going down. On the contrary, population has been going up. And, 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 and so we're just at a point, and that's my, my uh, focus today, is just saying that we are working with Mr. Barry. We're going to need more staffing and all these other issues. So my intent is that want part of the system and to pretend that I have the answers. We look at process flow. Uh, one of the things that uh, on our meeting recently, uh, part of more, uh, we could increase the volume of people seeing magistrates in a quicker, with a quicker, I think uh, maybe uh, Commissioner Cagle spoke about this, because I'll give you an example. It's not uncommon that at 2 p.m. in the afternoon that an inmate has completed everything they need to do uh, Whatever, whatever they had to do to to go on to the next step in the process, but not see a magistrate till 1 a.m. till mm. 1 a.m. They have to sit in our JPC, keeping a seat in a COVID environment under watch from 2 p.m. till at least 1 a.m. instead of trying to find a more efficient way to make sure that that person could get before a magistrate quicker. And I'm not saying it's going to impact jail, but we should all care about procedural justice and making sure that the system's moving effectively and that no part of the system's bogged down. So again, I, I'm not commenting about judges in particular. I'm not going to name any of them. It is what it is. But what I'm saying is I look at our jail population and we're going to need more staffing to be able to sustain this in an effective way going Court and working with Mr. Barry, and we hope that very soon, uh, by the next court, we could bring up some semblance of a staffing plan that we could either scale up to or work with uh, that could have some 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 of the proper measures so that we can run effective operation. Thank you. Right. Well, it, it, we need money for that, but also there's there's the someone needs to take the reign of this, and 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 Dave, maybe you need to bring on someone on a, on contract. I mean, I don't know, but. Some, like someone has got to own this and provide consistent reports to and, us. And, and Judge, if I, if yeah. I may, um, Mr. Barry, I think if we work this backwards, so I think we need to know what is available courtroom space, just on an eight to five basis. And, eight to 10. or eight to 10. And then figure out um, what the staffing requirements for those those uh, courts are, and then take that and, and we have some presumption of what the movement 
of those of a of a court is, um, and then get with the judges and say, we have confirmed that there are six, eight, twelve courtrooms currently offline that can go online, and we're ready to fund those. What will it take to get judges to use them? And so I think if we work this backwards, we'll get to a, I, I think we'll start touching nerve tissue to figure out what is working and what isn't working. And I just want to mention that phrase you had, we're willing to fund them. But when we're having this discussion, I hear the sheriff saying he's going to need more resources mm -hmm. to do this. If you got a courtroom, you got to have assistant DAs, you got to have public defenders, you got to have security. And all, have juries. and all and all this is a COVID environment, so we can use ARPA dollars for this. Um, and but but I but what I'm saying is that if unless we want to pay, unless we want to wait for damage to happen, and then pay a settlement on that damage, then we can wait. We can do nothing. But that is the liability that we have: is that either we pay out. A settlement and we're going to pay it out i think in labor costs and we're going to pay it out in civil rights violations and we're going to pay it out in another decree uh so if we want to go that route then let's sit back and do nothing and ignore this but right now this is real um and the uh and my my concern is that half the system is i shouldn't say half but a portion of our system is offline and that needs to be confirmed or not so one way or the other. How can we tackle this? Because like, it's just a it, deja vu. We've had this conversation before, y'all. What, how can you help us, Dave? You've heard this from us already about five times. You're the Supreme okay. Bureau, Dave. All those departments work for you. Fix it. Well, no, to be clear, Commissioner Cagle, judges don't work for me, nor does the sheriff, nor do most of the key actors in the criminal justice system. So I, I, I both understand that my office has a vital role to play here, and um, there are limits to the changes we can push. I mean, what I can say is that um, there is a clear issue about the availability of magistrate judges at the jail, which is... Uh, has one component facilities and one component staffing. Um, my team is in touch with the Office of Court Management uh, as well as the Sheriff's Office, and this is something we absolutely should fix. I, I cannot compel people to do it, but we, we absolutely should because it's inexcusable if that's increasing the jail population when it is at near, near capacity, and that's totally agreed. The, so, um, so, so, Mr. Barry, I just, I just want to add that um, because you are dealing with independently elected officials, and I get it, I'm one of them, um, I, 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 I really believe that if you can bring light to what resources are underutilized, then it becomes a independently elected official's decision to step up. I know you can't, you can't force them, but then it becomes a very clear discussion as to what resources are not being fully utilized to deal with this problem. So I, I, I would really uh, urge you to start with simply getting to a clear answer. And if you and I need to walk over and look at courtrooms, I'm willing to do it, but we need to get to a solid place and not listen to anybody else that cannot verify it so that we don't get to these different answers. But I think we need to walk over, find out what courtrooms are available, find out what the staffing levels to those courtrooms are, make a decision by this body, and then turn it over to elected officials to see if they step up and make good use of them. So I just want to make this suggestion oh, this late at night, obviously. Judge Fitch texts me as well. So I'd just like to suggest that in a room, Commissioner Garcia, I just would suggest you and I 
so don't shoot the bullet somewhere else. And then Mr. Barry, the head of the Office of Court Administration, the presiding judges, I guess that's Judge Kelly Johnson, maybe for the state ones, must be Judge Fitch for the county ones, or whoever else should be in there. Maybe somebody from JMI, Justice Administration, wanted the DA there as well. Smaller group than the large criminal justice coordinator council. So at least they get the, I, I get the messages, they'll text me, they'll call, and they'll say, well, I will disappoint with something that will say, well, which part? <laughs> I mean, it started 10 in the morning, ended at midnight, which part? So at least we hear them out to, to see if we can find some plan we can work on together. Maybe some of the JMI stuff, I'll read it because it's there. That was an old report, but who decides that? You got me? And then if not, all we can do is do the dashboard that's the best we can. Yeah, and Sheriff, real quick, uh, if you're still online, Sheriff. I, I'm online. Okay, uh, quick question. You're, uh, the notes that I read is that you're transporting um, uh, 500 folks a day uh, to be um, to be arraigned and, uh, and a hunt of, or, or 300 and 150 of them are being arraigned. Um, if you if you had a, a broader arraignment system, would you be able to transport more than 300 a day? Um, yes, uh, one of the challenges that we, we, we uh, that impacted us, as you know, is, is back, uh, with the previous layout, we, we could stage up to, I think about 100 people at any given time now you know to accommodate for restroom breaks and small quarters and things like that it, it, it's not as feasible uh you know obviously um you know also i mean it, it's just important for us to be able to uh, ideally not just get people to go to court on on non-essential settings i mean we know that they're going to happen but 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 the more we could avoid a lot of that movement especially during COVID, it, it, it's very helpful um, you know, we have the opportunity to do a lot of stuff virtually as well. That was set up during uh, COVID last year by our IT team and other uh, partners. And so we're just trying to see how we could get things moving. I think the um, uh, average length of stay for, for um, um, someone in, in, a, in, in a county jail on any uh, is about 60 plus days. Our right. average holding time for somebody in, in our jail, I think, is at around 225 days. Now, uh, that number may be a little bit dated. You know, I'm just speaking off memory on that. But from 65 days, which is the average for, for most other counties in Texas, and we're at 225 days. Uh, and, and so, of course, we have scale, we have size, but, but that places a tremendous burden on all the operation. And keep in mind, too, as you know, Sheriff, I mean, sorry, Sheriff, Commissioner, that when you were sheriff, that, that our buildings were already dated. Our, our, our mm -hmm. buildings were never really designed properly yeah. uh, to be a modern jail with the exception of JPC. So, yeah. uh, the, the, it, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's it, not conducive for women in, in jail. They're not conducive, uh, you know, for, for a lot of different things. And so it, there's a lot of wear and tear. Intercoms sometimes can break and the parts aren't easily replaceable, things like that. So when, when, when you're at max capacity uh, then it really it's just it's just you know it's just everything just falls on top of everything else you know and uh, we're just want to see how we could find solutions to, to get some things moving I'm, I'm hopeful and optimistic that those emergency docket uh, case uh, uh, project that's coming online those three courts that 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 somehow uh, somehow they're aligned with also having uh, moving cases that uh, maybe people that have been in, in jail for a long time and get those folks moved out, you know, and again, if, if the evidence supports it, they're guilty, fine, adjudicate them, find them guilty, but get them out. And the J county jail was never meant to be a long staying facility. Yep. Uh, long it, it's short term, term. you know, and, and it's, let's get so, so, the state yeah. system. Sure. If you really want to be tough on crime, let's get them where they belong. Let's get them into the state system, not leave them stuck in a county jail system. That doesn't help anyone. And again, I'm strongly, strongly advocating for our personnel, especially our detention officers are simply burned out and we can't yeah. keep asking them to show up and, 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 and make the right decisions and, 
and to continue to stay with us at, at this pace. So Sheriff, um, I, I'm gonna circle back around to you, but I'm gonna work with, with Mr. Barry. Um, and uh, if you could send someone over uh, to me that can, um, that can work through what is the potential of uh, the practical, I should say, the practical uh, level of inmate transfers you could do in a day. And then um, I'll work to find what the, what the courtroom space is. And then the commissioner and I will visit with the judges and the DA and see how we, what we can do to make sure that that whole system is as fully utilized as possible. And, uh, and maybe, maybe we'll, maybe I'll find out that I'm completely wrong on all this, but the reality is your jail is maxed out. You have a lot of pretrial uh, uh, inmates in your custody. That means they haven't seen a judge. You're only transferring over 300 a day down from a thousand of what we used to do. You're only seeing 150. And yet you receive, I forgot to mention the, the other factor. You receive 300 inmates a day uh, on average. Is that is that accurate? Yes, that, that's accurate. And, and releases so, aren't keeping pace with that as well on the back end. Okay. So again, yep. It, yep. when the when the uh, got, when you're bringing it. in more, yeah, yep. you know. Uh, Move on. Yeah, we'll yeah. All of executive so, yeah. So, uh, so again, I just wanted to bring this up, make sure that we understand it for exactly uh, what it brings as in terms of challenges. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, uh, Commissioners and Judge. And, and again, I'll work with Mr. Barry and his team so we can right size the staffing to meet the moment. Um, and, and I think we could also uh, work on the overtime issue by decreasing that. And then happy to contribute on, on, on how else we could be part of a solution, be solutions oriented, uh, you know, so we could try to find a way to just make sure that it is an efficient and effective criminal justice system all around. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. And I, and I guess in terms of the uh, action on this item, um, I won't turn it into a motion, but Mr. Barry, yeah, you've heard my discussion. We need to find what is the available uh, courtroom space and then work this uh, backwards. So uh, no action on this item, Judge. Thank you. Thank you. Item 369, Commissioner Ramsey. Thank you, Judge. We'll just continue this conversation on important issues, I think. Uh, certainly the constables are. My, uh, my item here relates to a reference in the PFM report. I was briefed a few weeks ago uh, that uh, PFM uh, had indicated that uh, maybe we need to consider reducing the number of con constable positions in the county. Uh, this is very simple in terms of I, I, I would like an update at some point. Uh, Mr. Barry, I don't know if that's your shop or someone else, but an update <laughs> on uh, PFM and uh, when, when these reports are going to be delivered. We've got some preliminary reports out there. We've got the constables spend a lot of time and money submitting reports that, as I understand, are essentially rejected or ignored. And at, at this point, just an affirmation that having eight constables and 16 pre, uh, JPs is important to Harris County. That's an important part of our law enforcement relationships and that that uh, that foundation, I think, uh, to make things happen in Harris County is important. And, and I would uh, make that as a motion that I believe having eight uh, constables and uh, 16 JPs is important uh, to our law enforcement. And that allows, I think, PFM to understand uh, that is an important part of what we do. I'll, I'll second that, Commissioner Ramsey, and and if I if I could just add quickly add, you know, my my consternation with this part. Look, there's a lot of good recommendations, especially where it lays out uh, coordination of, of victim services. Uh, but the problem that I have is that uh, there are some recommendations that may not be uh, possible under the new laws. 
Um, and so I'm disappointed that PFM didn't take the time to uh, understand the, uh, the statues involved. And, um, and, uh, uh, and for that reason, I, I cannot accept this report. So I will second your motion. What's the motion? Motion to affirm that having eight uh, constables and 16 JPs is an integral part of our law enforcement uh, program here in Harris County. We have a motion uh, by Commissioner Ramsey and a second by Commissioner Garcia. Any other comments? All in favor? Jed, I was going to quickly comment. I'll just say an aye. All right. And um, we previously passed a resolution that was unanimous in support of our constables about two years ago, pre-pandemic. And BFM chose not to include that in their study either, knowing that that was something that we had already addressed and crossed that bridge. Uh, so we have a motion by Commissioner Ramsey and a second by Commissioner Garcia. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Um, motion carries unanimously. Great executive session. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it is. It is uh, eight forty three p.m. We're going to executive session on items three fifty five, three fifty six, three fifty eight, and one ninety two. This is a personnel issue, um, and three issues in which to consult with our attorneys. We'll meet in executive session. No, no, no. Okay, it's 9.53 and Commissioner's Court is back in session. So item 355 on page 38, uh, uh, we need a motion to appoint Rita Trevino as alternate delegate to Judge Lena Hidalgo on Second. the HGAC TPC for a term ending December 31st, 2021. Motion by Commissioner Garcia, second by Commissioner Ellis. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Assuming he's going to accept. Oh, yes. Please, and thank you, Mr. Trevi. Item 356 is no action. No, I, I hear something. Go ahead. I heard someone speaking. It may just be feedback. Okay, thank oh, okay. you. Item 356 on the NHHIP, that's no action. Item 358 on the Texas General Land Office, no action, correct, Dave? GLO? All right. And then item 192, no action. That is on the early voting and election day polling locations. Uh, James, did you get everything? I got everything. And Dave is good to go. Tiffany, good. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. Yeah, to adjourn. It's 954 right. and Commissioner's Court is now adjourned. Thank you, Judge. Thank the you, Judge. Astros are losing eight oh. Oh, hey, oh, we didn't miss it. This meeting is no longer being recorded.